Gaza. An Inquest into Its Martyrdom by Norman G. Finkelstein Audiobook presented by the Learner's Library Contents Part 4 Operation Protective Edge Chapter 10 Stalled Juggernaut Chapter 11 Israel Has the Right to Defend Itself Chapter 12 Betrayal I, Amnesty International Chapter 13 Betrayal 2, UN Human Rights Council Part 4 Operation Protective Edge Chapter 10 Stalled Juggernaut On November 14, 2012, Israel launched Operation Pillar of Defense. It lasted only eight days and inflicted much less death and destruction than Operation Cast Lead, 2008-9 or Operation Protective Edge, 2014. Its modus operandi and outcome pointed up constraints on Israel's freedom to launch deadly military operations. The official Israeli account followed a familiar storyline, it only reacted after stoically absorbing hundreds of Hamas rockets. Israel does not want war, Defense Minister Ehud Barak declaimed. But Hamas's incessant rounds of artillery rockets and mortars forced our hand into acting. The facts, however, suggested otherwise. From January 1 until November 11, 2012, one Israeli had been killed as a result of attacks from Gaza, whereas 78 Gazans had been killed by Israeli strikes. If Israel's objective was to restore calm on its southern border, why did it trigger the new round of violence by assassinating Hamas military chief Ahmed Jabari, who was Israel's principal interlocutor in Gaza, or, as Haaretz's security analyst put it, the U.S. subcontractor, in charge of maintaining Israel's security in Gaza? The precise timing of the assassination was yet more incriminating. Jabari was in the process of advancing a permanent ceasefire agreement, when Israel liquidated him. Although it was alleged that Hamas had been itching for a fight when Israel launched Pillar of Defense, in fact, the Islamic government had mostly avoided armed confrontations with Israel. It did, however, recoil at becoming a clone of the Palestinian Authority, PA, by engaging in security cooperation with Israel. Hence, it could turn a blind eye or join in, if only to prevent an escalation, when Israeli provocations triggered retaliatory strikes by Hamas's militarized rivals. The rationale behind Hamas's pursuit of a long-term ceasefire was straightforward. It had been on a roll prior to the outbreak of hostilities. Its ideological bedfellow, the Muslim Brotherhood, had won Egypt's first democratic election in June 2012. The Emir of Qatar had journeyed to Gaza in October 2012 carrying the promise of $400 million in aid, while Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan was scheduled to arrive soon. In the meantime, Gaza had witnessed an enormous building boom, it boasted a stunning 23% GDP growth rate in 2011 alone, unemployment fell rapidly and Saudi Arabia had promised to double its investment in Gaza. On still another front, Gaza's Islamic University had pulled off a diplomatic coup of its own in October 2012, as it convened an academic conference attended by renowned linguist Noam Chomsky. Hamas's star was slowly but surely on the rise, at the expense of the hapless PA. The very last thing it needed was an armed confrontation with Israel that undercut these hard-won, steadily accruing gains. A clutch of skeptical Israeli pundits speculated that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu launched Pillar of Defense to boost his prospects in the upcoming election. As a general rule, however, Israeli leaders have not undertaken major military operations or jeopardized critical state interests, for the sake of partisan electoral gain. 
It was also purported that Israel's governing coalition felt compelled to appease popular indignation at the Hamas projectiles, but they had barely registered on Israel's political radar. Public opinion was focused on the Islamic Republic of Iran and sundry domestic issues. Why, then, did Israel attack? At one level, Israel was transparent in its motive. It kept repeating that it wanted to restore its deterrence capacity. The puzzle was the nature of the threat it hoped to quash, or exactly what it sought to deter. Israel's decision to launch Pillar of Defense emerged out of a succession of foreign policy setbacks. Netanyahu had endeavored to rally the international community around an attack on Iran. He ended up looking the fool, however, as he held up to the UN General Assembly in September 2012 a cartoonish depiction of the Iranian bomb. A couple of weeks later, Hezbollah boasted that a drone launched by it had penetrated Israeli airspace and passed over sensitive sites. Meanwhile, its terrorist, twin upstart in Gaza was entrenching its own credibility as regional powers thumbed their collective nose at Israel on its doorstep. The ultimate outrage was that Hamas refused to carry on like a terrorist organization and, instead, acquitted itself as a responsible legitimate sovereign power. A long-term ceasefire would only enhance its bona fides. It was time to remind the natives who was in charge. Put otherwise, and in Israel's preferred metaphor, it was time to mow the lawn again in Gaza. At the heart of Operation Pillar of Defense, the crisis group shrewdly observed, lay an effort to demonstrate that Hamas's newfound confidence was altogether premature and that, the Islamist awakening notwithstanding, changes in the Middle East would not change much at all. Still, Israel needed an alibi to justify yet another murderous Gaza invasion. When Israel needed a pretext to launch cast lead, it broke the ceasefire, by killing six militants, in order to provoke a retaliatory attack by Hamas. For years later, it killed the ceasefire maker to provoke Hamas. The actual operation, however, differed in kind from its precursor. Pillar of Defense was qualitatively less destructive than cast lead. The pundit class postulated that Israel had mastered the art of avoiding civilian casualties. The IDF used precision weaponry during the operation, while the lessons of cast lead slash the Goldstone report had been learned and internalized. But 99% of its airstrikes during cast lead had hit targets accurately, while Israel's manifest objective had been to punish, humiliate and terrorize, Gaza's civilian population. Goldstone Report. If cast lead had proved so murderous, it was not due to errors in planning or execution, and if pillar of defense proved less lethal, it was not because Israel was careful to avoid such errors. Indeed, when the constellation of political forces realigned in Israel's favor in 2014 as it unleashed protective edge, the IDF reflexively discarded all the lessons it had supposedly learned. Israel's decision to ratchet down its violent force in 2012 traced back to the unique political matrix, in which pillar of defense unfolded. First, Turkey and Egypt had made abundantly clear that they would not sit idly by if Israel launched a repeat performance of cast lead, and they explicitly drew a red line at an Israeli ground assault. In an unprecedented display of solidarity, the Egyptian Prime Minister and Turkish Foreign Minister journeyed to Gaza amid the Israeli assault. Cairo also recalled its ambassador to Israel. Put on notice by these regional power brokers, the White House counseled Israel not to invade. Second, the prospect of a mega goldstone hung over Israel. After cast lead, Israeli officials had just barely managed to elude legal accountability. But if it committed yet another massacre, and if Cairo, where Hamas's progenitor currently held power, and Ankara, 
still smarting from the Mavai Marmara attack, pressed Gaza's case in the international arena. Israel might not again be so fortunate. Third, Gaza was swarming with foreign journalists. Israel had sealed Gaza off from the outside world in collaboration with Hosni Mubarak's Egypt before cast lead. In the initial phase of that operation, Israel had enjoyed a near-total monopoly on media coverage. But this time around, journalists could freely enter Gaza via Egypt, Israel didn't bother to block entry from its side, and credibly report Israeli atrocities in real time. On account of this trio of factors, Israel mostly targeted legitimate sites during Pillar of Defense. At the same time, the death and destruction inflicted by Israel, although on a diminished scale, received in-death graphic news coverage. When Israel tested the limits of the laws of war, trouble loomed. After it flattened civilian governmental structures in Gaza, the headline on the New York Times website read, Israel targets civilian buildings. A few hours later, it metamorphosed into government buildings, presumably after a complaint filed by Israel's minions. But the writing was on the wall, Israeli conduct was being scrutinized abroad, so it had better tread carefully. True, some 100 Gazan civilians were killed, including 35 children, and Israel did in fact commit multiple war crimes, 126 homes were completely destroyed, but in the court of public opinion they could plausibly be chalked up to collateral damage. The precipitous escalation of attacks on civilians coincided with the start of diplomatic negotiations. As the hostilities wound to a close, Israel reverted to its standard operating procedure of targeting, or indiscriminately firing on civilians in order to extract the best possible terms in a final agreement. For times as many Gazan civilians were killed in the last four days as in the first four days of the assault. Israel also targeted journalists in the last four days to block transmission of these terror attacks and, preemptively, in the event talks broke down and the IDF had after all to embark on a murderous ground invasion. Hamas, too, stood accused of committing war crimes, such as launching hundreds of rockets toward population centers in Israel. For Israeli civilians were killed. In addition, Human Rights Watch reported damage to civilian Israeli property, for example, a rocket tore the roof off a school. The armed resistance Hamas put up during the eight-day Israeli assault was largely nominal. The lopsidedness of the war was suggested by Defense Minister Barak, as he boasted that, Hamas only succeeded in hitting Israeli targets with a single ton of explosives, while targets in Gaza were hit with a thousand tons. On the other hand, although Israel celebrated its deployment of Iron Dome, the anti-missile defense system did not save countless Israeli lives and perhaps did not save any lives. Compare civilian casualties before and after Israel's anti-missile defense system became operative, see Table 3. The bottom line was, Iron Dome effectively made no difference. It was unlikely that in the main and allowing for the occasional aberration, Hamas used more sophisticated projectiles during Pillar of Defense. Through its army of informers and state-of-the-art aerial surveillance, Israel would have been privy to any large quantities of technically sophisticated Hamas weapons, and would have destroyed these stashes before or at the start of the attack. Israel announced on the first day of the operation that the IDF seriously damaged Hamas long-range missile capabilities. 40 kilometers per 25 miles range, and underground weapons storage facilities, and on the third day that, the IDF has destroyed a significant portion of the Hamas FAR-5 arsenal, many of them in underground launch sites. It was also improbable that Netanyahu would have risked an attack just on the eve of an election if Hamas possessed weapons, capable of inflicting heavy casualties. 
A handful of Hamas projectiles did reach deeper inside Israel than previously, but these lacked explosives. An Israeli official derisively dismissed them as pipes, basically. If Israel hailed Iron Dome, it was because it sought to salvage something redemptive from its otherwise failed operation. Shortly after Pillar of Defense ended, MIT missile defense expert Theodore Postel voiced doubts. Initially, I drank the Kool-Aid on Iron Dome, he admitted. I'm skeptical, now. I suspect it is not working as well as the Israelis are saying. A senior Israeli rocket scientist subsequently rated the claims made for Iron Dome exaggerated, at best. The denouement of Pillar of Defense set in as Israel hit up against a tactical cul-de-sac. It had struck all pre-planned military targets in Gaza and couldn't resort to sustained terror bombing, yet Hamas, adapting Hezbollah's strategy, kept up its projectile volleys into Israel. The psychological upshot was that Netanyahu wasn't able to declare victory, forcing on him the prospect of a ground invasion to stop the projectile attacks. However, he could avoid heavy combatant losses only if the IDF blasted everyone and everything in, and out of, sight as it cleared a path into Gaza. But in the novel political context of Pillar of Defense, powerful regional actors dead set against an Israeli invasion, the threat of a Goldstone Redux, a foreign press corps embedded not in the Israeli troops but among the people of Gaza. Israel recoiled at launching a murderous cast-lead, style ground assault. The Israeli prime minister was caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. He couldn't subdue Hamas without a ground invasion, but he couldn't unleash a ground invasion without incurring either a domestically unacceptable cost, that is, too many combatant casualties on the Israeli side, or a diplomatically unacceptable cost, that is, too many civilian casualties on the Palestinian side. It was possible to pinpoint the exact moment when Pillar of Defense collapsed. At a November 19 press conference, Hamas leader Khalid Mishal in effect told Netanyahu, go ahead, invade. If you wanted to launch it, he taunted, you would have done it. The Israeli prime minister panicked, his bluff had been called. What happened next was a repeat of Israel's 2006 assault on Lebanon. Unable to stop the Hezbollah rocket attacks, yet fearful of a full-blown ground invasion entailing hand-to-hand -hand combat, Israel had called in U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice to negotiate a ceasefire. This time around, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was hauled in to bail Israel out. Even a November 21st bomb attack on a Tel Aviv bus, injuring 28 civilians, which normally would have triggered a negotiating freeze and massive Israeli retaliation, did not shake Netanyahu from his resolve to end pillar of defense post-haste, before Hamas resumed its verbal digs. The armed resistance Hamas put up during the eight-day Israeli assault was largely nominal. The lopsidedness of the war was suggested by Defense Minister Barak, as he boasted that, Hamas only succeeded in hitting Israeli targets with a single ton of explosives, while targets in Gaza were hit with a thousand tons. On the other hand, although Israel celebrated its deployment of Iron Dome, the anti-missile defense system did not save countless Israeli lives and perhaps did not save any lives. Compare civilian casualties before and after Israel's anti-missile defense system became operative, see Table 3. The bottom line was, Iron Dome effectively made no difference. It was unlikely that in the main and allowing for the occasional aberration, Hamas used more sophisticated projectiles during Pillar of Defense. Through its army of informers and state-of-the-art aerial surveillance, Israel would have been privy to any large quantities of technically sophisticated Hamas weapons, and would have destroyed these stashes before or at the start of the attack. 
Israel announced on the first day of the operation that the IDF seriously damaged Hamas long-range missile capabilities, 40 km per 25 miles range, and underground weapons storage facilities, and on the third day that the IDF has destroyed a significant portion of the Hamas FAR-5 arsenal, many of them in underground launch sites. It was also improbable that Netanyahu would have risked an attack just on the eve of an election if Hamas possessed weapons, capable of inflicting heavy casualties. A handful of Hamas projectiles did reach deeper inside Israel than previously, but these lacked explosives. An Israeli official derisively dismissed them as pipes, basically. If Israel hailed Iron Dome, it was because it sought to salvage something redemptive from its otherwise failed operation. Shortly after Pillar of Defense ended, MIT missile defense expert Theodore Postal voiced doubts. Initially, I drank the Kool Aid on Iron Dome, he admitted. I'm skeptical, now. I suspect it is not working as well as the Israelis are saying. A senior Israeli rocket scientist subsequently rated the claims made for Iron Dome exaggerated, at best. The denouement of Pillar of Defense set in as Israel hit up against a tactical cul-de-sac. It had struck all pre-planned military targets in Gaza and couldn't resort to sustained terror bombing, yet Hamas adapting Hezbollah's strategy, kept up its projectile volleys into Israel. The psychological upshot was that Netanyahu wasn't able to declare victory, forcing on him the prospect of a ground invasion to stop the projectile attacks. However, he could avoid heavy combatant losses only if the IDF blasted everyone and everything in, and out of, sight as it cleared a path into Gaza. But in the novel political context of Pillar of Defense, powerful regional actors dead set against an Israeli invasion, the threat of a Goldstone Redux, a foreign press corps embedded not in the Israeli troops but among the people of Gaza, Israel recoiled at launching a murderous cast lead, style ground assault. The Israeli Prime Minister was caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. He couldn't subdue Hamas without a ground invasion, but he couldn't unleash a ground invasion without incurring either a domestically unacceptable cost, that is, too many combatant casualties on the Israeli side, or a diplomatically unacceptable cost, that is, too many civilian casualties on the Palestinian side. It was possible to pinpoint the exact moment when Pillar of Defense collapsed. At a November 19 press conference, Hamas leader Khalid Mishal in effect told Netanyahu, Go ahead, invade. If you wanted to launch it, he taunted, you would have done it. The Israeli prime minister panicked, his bluff had been called. What happened next was a repeat of Israel's 2006 assault on Lebanon. Unable to stop the Hezbollah rocket attacks, yet fearful of a full-blown ground invasion entailing hand-to-hand -hand combat, Israel had called in U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice to negotiate a ceasefire. This time around, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was hauled in to bail Israel out. Even a November 21st bomb attack on a Tel Aviv bus, injuring 28 civilians which normally would have triggered a negotiating freeze and massive Israeli retaliation, did not shake Netanyahu from his resolve to end pillar of defense post-haste, before Hamas resumed its verbal digs. The formal terms of the agreement ending pillar of defense marked a stunning reversal for Israel. It called for a mutual ceasefire, not one, as Israel demanded, unilaterally imposed on Hamas. It also incorporated language implying that the siege of Gaza would be lifted, and notably omitted the precondition that Hamas must terminate its smuggling or manufacture of weapons. The reason why was not hard to find. Under international law, peoples resisting foreign occupation are not debarred from using armed force. Egypt, which brokered the ceasefire, 
was not about to barter away Hamas's legal prerogative. Israel undoubtedly anticipated that Washington would use its political muscle to extract better ceasefire terms from Cairo. Throughout the attack, the United States had lent Israel unstinting public support. But President Obama, hoping to bring the new Egypt under the U.S.'s wing, backed away from lording it over the Muslim Brotherhood and brought all his weight to bear on Israel. If any doubt remained as to who won and who lost the latest round, it was quickly dispelled. Israel launched Pillar of Defense to restore Gaza's fear of it. But after the ceasefire and its terms were announced, Palestinians flooded the streets of Gaza in a celebratory mood as if at a wedding party. In a CNN interview with Christian Amanpour, Hamas's Mishal cut the figure and exuded the confidence of a world leader. Meanwhile, at the Israeli press conference announcing the ceasefire, the ruling triumvirate, Netanyahu, Barak, and Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman, resembled grade schoolers called down to the principal's office, counting the seconds until the humiliation was over. Loyal Israeli pundits tried to spin Pillar of Defense as a swift military success, an impressive success, or, more cautiously, successful, up to a point, but only the willfully gullible would swallow it. Still, it could already be safely predicted back then that Israel wouldn't fulfill the terms of the final agreement to lift the siege of Gaza, during Israeli cabinet deliberations on whether or not to accept the ceasefire. Defense Minister Barak cynically dismissed the fine print, scoffing, a day after the ceasefire, no one will remember what is written in that draft. The distance Egypt and Turkey would be willing to go in support of Gaza was also exaggerated. Many Palestinians inferred from the resounding setback Israel suffered that only armed resistance could and would end the Israeli occupation. In fact, Hamas's resistance operated for the most part only at the level of perceptions. The projectiles heading toward Tel Aviv did unsettle the city's residents. There was precious little evidence, however, that Palestinians could ever muster sufficient military might to compel a full Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories, but Gaza's steadfastness until the final hour of Operation Pillar of Defense did demonstrate the indomitable will of the people of Palestine. If this potential force could be harnessed in a campaign of mass civil resistance, and supporters of Palestinian rights abroad in tandem mobilized international public opinion, then Israel might be coerced into ending the occupation, while fewer Palestinian lives would be lost than in, futile, armed resistance. Chapter 11 Israel has the right to defend itself. On July 8, 2014, Israel launched Operation Protective Edge. It marked the longest and most destructive of Israel's recent attacks on Gaza, indeed, it was, the most devastating round of hostilities in Gaza since the beginning of the Israeli occupation in 1967. Operation Cast Lead, 2008-9, lasted 22 days, whereas Protective Edge lasted fully 51 days. It ended on August 26. Some 350 children were killed and 6,000 homes destroyed during cast lead, whereas fully 550 children were killed and 18,000 homes destroyed during protective edge. Israel left behind 600,000 tons of rubble in cast lead, whereas it left behind 2.5 million tons of rubble in protective edge. What's more, protective edge, impacted an already paralyzed economy at a time when socio-economic conditions were at their lowest since 1967. This operation therefore had a more severe impact on socio-economic conditions compared to the previous two military operations, in 2008 and 2012. But in contrast to Cast Lead and the 2006 Lebanon War, Protective Edge was not preplanned long in advance. The decision to attack resulted from contingent factors. 
Israeli officialdom also thought twice during protective edge before making those brazen incriminating statements that got it in legal hot water in the past. Sobered by this brush with the law, Livni sang a different tune as Minister of Justice after Protective Edge, when the fire stops, the legal fire directed at Israel, its leaders, its soldiers, and its commanders will begin. I intend to stand at the front lines in this battle, and will give each soldier and each commander in the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, a legal bulletproof vest. Still, many of Israel's tactics, provocations, massive force, conformed to a decades-old pattern. Protective Edge also ended on a familiar note, Israel was unable to claim decisive military victory, while Hamas was unable to extract concrete political gain. Protective Edge traced back to yet another reckless display of Hamas pragmatism. At the end of April 2014, the Islamic movement and its secular Palestinian rival Fatah formed a consensus government. The United States and the European Union did not suspend engagement but instead, cautiously welcomed the Palestinian initiative, adopting a wait-and-see approach. It was evidently payback time, as Israel had aborted the 2013-14 peace initiative of U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. If only through a back door, Hamas had won unprecedented legitimacy, but it also made an unprecedented concession. The United States and the European Union had long predicated diplomatic engagement with Palestinian leaders, on a trio of preconditions, recognition of Israel, renunciation of violence, and recognition of past agreements. Hamas did not object when Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, speaking on behalf of the new unity government, reiterated his support for the preconditions. As these developments unfolded, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu erupted in a rage. The prospect of Palestinian unity was a red line for Netanyahu and Israeli leaders in general, so he reflexively sought to sabotage it. In the event that the Palestinian consensus held, he could no longer invoke standard Israeli alibis. Abbas represented only one Palestinian faction. Hamas was a terrorist organization bent on Israel's destruction to evade a settlement of the conflict. The Prime Minister's ire was yet more aroused as the United States and the European Union had already ignored his premonition that Iran was intending to visit a second holocaust on Israel. Instead, they had entered into diplomatic talks with Tehran to obtain an agreement on its nuclear weapons program. In June 2014, a gift dropped into Netanyahu's lap. A rogue Hamas cell abducted and killed three Israeli teenagers in the West Bank. Netanyahu was aware early on that the teenagers had been killed, not captured for a future prisoner swap, and that Hamas's leadership wasn't responsible. The government had known almost from the beginning that the boys were dead, J. J. Goldberg, the former editor-in-chief of the Jewish Forward, observed. There was no doubt. But never one to pass up an exploitable moment, Netanyahu parleyed this macabre boon to break up the Palestinian unity government. Feigning a rescue mission, Israel launched Operation Brothers Keeper in mid-June. At least five West Bank Palestinians were killed, homes were demolished and businesses ransacked, and 700 Palestinians, mostly Hamas members, were arrested, including many who had been released in a 2011 prisoner exchange. The rampage was patently tailored to elicit a violent response from Hamas, so as to approve it was a terrorist organization. Netanyahu could then, and in fact later did, rebuke Washington to never second-guess me again. Hamas at first resisted the Israeli provocations, although other Gaza factions did fire projectiles. But in the ensuing tit-for-tat, 
Hamas entered the fray and the violence spun out of control. Once hostilities broke out, Israel faced a now familiar dilemma. Short-range projectiles of the kind Hamas possessed couldn't be disabled from the air, they had to be taken out at ground level. But a ground invasion would cost Netanyahu either too much domestically, if many Israeli soldiers were killed fighting Hamas street by street, or too much internationally, if Israeli soldiers immunized themselves from attack by indiscriminately targeting the civilian population and infrastructure, as they advanced. Unable to carve out a safe path through the thicket of political unknowns, Netanyahu initially held back from launching a ground invasion. But then two more gifts dropped into his lap. First, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair apparently contrived, while Egyptian strongman Abdel Fattah el-Sisi formally presented, a ceasefire deal, on July 14 according to which Hamas would stop firing projectiles into Israel and Israel would ease the blockade of Gaza when the security situation stabilizes. The prior ceasefire agreements Hamas had entered into with Israel did not contain such a security caveat. Insofar as Israel designated Hamas a terrorist organization, the security situation in Gaza could stabilize only when Hamas either was defeated or disarmed itself, in the absence of which the siege would continue. It surely didn't come as a shock when Hamas rejected these ceasefire terms. Whereas LCC's proposal did not bring a halt to armed hostilities, it did hand Israel a credible pretext for a brutal ground invasion. What choice did it have, Israel could protest in the face of Hamas's intransigence. Second, on July 17, a Malaysian airliner flying over Ukraine was downed. The politically charged incident instantly displaced Gaza as the headline news story. Ever the consummate and cynical politician, Netanyahu seized on this golden opportunity. Shortly after the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, Netanyahu reportedly declared that Israel had committed a major blunder when it didn't expel a 5, 50 or 500 Palestinian insiders of the first intifada while the media was riveted on China. The downed Malaysian airliner was Netanyahu's Utiananmen moment. Freed up by the diversion to unleash a no-holds-barred attack, Netanyahu launched the ground invasion hours later on the night of that very day. The new regional constellation, as the Arab Spring degenerated into the Arab Winter, further emboldened him. Hamas was left out in the cold, without any states willing to go to bat for it and many rooting for its defeat. Fate had lined up Netanyahu's ducks, the perfect pretext, the perfect decoy, the perfect alignment of earthly bodies politic. He could finally settle scores with Hamas and, incidentally, exact sweet revenge for the humiliation he suffered in Operation Pillar of Defense, 2012. As ground troops crossed into the Strip, Israel let loose with abandon its explosive arsenal. Gaza's civilian population and infrastructure, homes and businesses, schools and mosques, hospitals and ambulances power stations and sewage plants, civilian shelters and civilians fleeing in panic, came under relentless, indiscriminate, disproportionate, and deliberate attack. Israel reportedly fired 20,000 high-explosive artillery shells, 14,500 tank shells, 6,000 missiles, and 3,500 naval shells into the enclave. This breakdown did not yet include bomb tonnage, over 101 ton bombs were dropped on the Shuja'aya neighborhood alone. More than 1,500 Gazan civilians were killed during Protective Edge. In Israel, six civilians were killed. In a 2014 global ranking of the number of civilian casualties resulting from explosive weapons, Tiny Gaza placed third below Iraq and Syria, but ahead of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Ukraine. Large swaths of Gaza were reduced to rubble.
Gaza's economy effectively collapsed, while recovery was expected to take decades. The overwhelming violent force Israel unleashed was designed to limit IDF combat casualties by blasting everything and everyone within sight of the invading army, and to subvert Gaza's will to resist by terrorizing the civilian population and pulverizing the civilian infrastructure. But it also indexed the sadism and brutalized indifference permeating the ranks of the IDF. The Goldstone Report had concluded that the Israeli objective in caste lead was to punish, humiliate and terrorize a civilian population. Protective Edge was a repeat Israeli performance but on a vastly greater scale. Peter Maurer, president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, observed after touring the ravaged strip, I've never seen such massive destruction ever before while the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process observed, no human being who visits can remain untouched by the terrible devastation that one sees. It was a wild war of revenge, Haaretz journalist Z. Barel recalled, that returned the entire Gaza population into an infrastructure to be destroyed. In the 30 years that I have spent researching and writing about Gaza and her people, Sarah Roy of Harvard University reflected after Protective Edge, I can say without hesitation that I have never seen the kind of human, physical, and psychological destruction that I see there today. Even UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who habitually took his cues from Washington, was moved, or felt compelled, to tell the UN General Assembly during the operation, the massive death and destruction in Gaza have shocked and shamed the world. While a few months later he told a press conference after visiting Gaza, the destruction I have seen coming here is beyond description. Meanwhile, the consensus opinion inside Israel was that Protective Edge constituted a limited military operation. To extenuate Gaza's civilian death toll, Israel, per usual, accused Hamas of using civilians as human shields. But reputable human rights organizations and journalists, per usual, found no evidence to sustain Israel's allegation. In a comprehensive defense of its conduct during Protective Edge, Israel professed that the IDF sought to achieve the goals set by the government of Israel while adhering to the law of armed conflict, and in certain respects, the IDF went beyond its legal obligations. As if reading from the official Israeli script, an international high-level military group, sponsored and selected by the Friends of Israel Initiative, and including perennial Israel pom-pom Colonel Richard Kemp, proclaimed, the IDF not only met its obligations under the law of armed conflict, but often exceeded them. Indeed, it purported that the IDF showed significant restraint, and that a life-preserving ethos is propagated throughout its ranks. It even went so far as to express strong concerns that the actions and practices of the IDF to prevent collateral damage were so extensive that they would curtail the effectiveness of our own militaries, were they to become constraining norms of warfare enacted in customary law. The credibility of these attestations, however, crashed up against the testimonies of Israeli soldiers who actually saw combat during Protective Edge. In contrast, the assessment of the high-level military group largely consisted of a stenographic transcription of what senior Israeli officials told it. The IDF eyewitness accounts were compiled by breaking the silence an Israeli non-governmental organization comprising former Israeli soldiers. None of the hundreds of testimonies collected by this organization over more than a decade has ever been proven false, and all of them were approved for publication by the IDF censor. The politics of breaking the silence were not aberrantly leftist, it did not support the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, and opposed criminal prosecution of Israeli officers, while most of the soldier witnesses did not even appear contrite. 
The criminal dimensions of protective edge could be gleaned from these IDF eyewitness accounts, see Table 4. Although Israel flinches at juxtapositions of its own conduct with that of the Nazis, one of the breaking the silence testimonies, number 83, breached this taboo. There's that famous photo that they always show on trips to Poland, in which Israeli youths visit Holocaust memorial sites. That shows Warsaw before the war and Warsaw after the Second World War. The photo shows the heart of Warsaw and it's this classy European city, and then they show it at the end of the war. They show the exact same neighborhood, only it has just one house left standing, and the rest is just ruins. That's what it looked like. To avoid mind-numbing redundancy, Table 4 omits the succession of combatants who testified that the IDF's modus operandi during the operation was shoot to kill anything that moves, often on explicit orders but also because it was a cool. If the high-level military group peremptorily dismissed all these combatant testimonies, it was because a senior, Israeli, commanders as well as those leading the fight on the ground, contradicted them. Who could quarrel with such disinterested authority? The last testimony, number 111, in the Breaking the Silence collection provided insight into the society that nurtured the most moral army in the world. You leave the Gaza Strip, and the most obvious question is, did you kill anybody, an IDF infantry sergeant rude? Even if you meet the most left-wing girl in the world, eventually she'll start thinking, did you ever kill somebody, or not? And what can you do about it? Most people in our society consider that to be a badge of honor. So everyone wants to come out of there with that feeling of satisfaction. Israel fared both better and worse than it could have predicted going into the operation. On one side of the ledger, Despite the murder and mayhem that Israel was daily inflicting on Gaza, the White House signaled it the green light to proceed. Human rights organizations reported from fairly early on that Israel was probably targeting or firing indiscriminately at civilians and civilian infrastructure. But notwithstanding some behind-the-scenes friction, the United States did not publicly pressure Israel to desist. On the contrary, President Barack Obama or his spokespersons dutifully invoked Israel's right to self-defense, while turning a blind eye to IDF atrocities and a deaf ear to Gaza's whales. The inescapable fact was that Obama did not just facilitate this latest Israeli massacre in Gaza, he was its enabler-in-chief. It might be wondered why he supported the assault if he had earlier supported negotiations with the Hamas Fatah unity government. The simple answer was that once Hamas projectiles started flying over Israel, and Israel's domestic lobby lined up wall-to-wall -wall congressional support, it would have required spine, which Obama conspicuously lacked, to defy it. Still, did Realpolitik compel him to reaffirm Israel's right to defend itself a day in and day out, even as human rights organizations documented Israeli atrocities? In addition, Israel hugely profited and Gaza hugely lost from a dramatic regional reconfiguration. Both Egypt and Saudi Arabia openly longed for Hamas's eviction from power, while the Arab League, in its sole meeting on Gaza, backed LCC's cynical ceasefire ultimatum. Only Iran, Turkey, and Qatar among Middle Eastern powers opposed the Israeli onslaught. If Israel showed relative restraint during Operation Pillar of Defense, this was because of the red lines drawn by Egypt and Turkey in support of Hamas. But after the July 2013 coup, Egypt turned on Hamas with a vengeance while Turkey was preoccupied with and bogged down in Syria. Convulsed by its own internal conflicts and humanitarian crises, the so-called street across large swaths of the Arab world fell mute during protective edge. Arab despots accordingly paid no domestic price for egging on Israel. Meanwhile, 
The European Union also gave Israel a free pass as it dreaded militant Islam, which was spreading like wildfire under the ISIS banner, and to which Hamas was reflexively assimilated. The redemptive global exception was the Latin American bloc. In an exemplary display of selfless solidarity with beleaguered Gaza, the governments of Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela registered disgust at Israeli actions. Nonetheless, amid the slaughter, Gaza was effectively on its own, alone and abandoned. On the opposite side of the ledger, Israel was taken off guard by the robust and ramified network of tunnels that Hamas had constructed. Adopting and adapting Hezbollah's strategy during the 2006 Lebanon War, Hamas used projectiles to lure Israel into a ground invasion. It then emerged from tunnels that withstood Israeli aerial bombardment and inflicted an exceptional number of combatant casualties. Only 10 Israeli soldiers had been killed in cast lead, for by friendly fire. Many Israeli soldiers had testified to not having even seen a Hamas fighter. This time around, however, fully 62 Israeli soldiers were killed by militants. In the face of this surprisingly stiff resistance, the IDF marked time once having crossed into Gaza, not venturing more than 2 to 3 kilometers beyond the border. As it launched the ground invasion, Israel abruptly recalibrated its mission from destroying Hamas's rockets to destroying Hamas's cross-border terror tunnels. Yet, of the 32 tunnels Israel reportedly discovered and detonated, only 12 to 14 actually passed under the border. It was cause for perplexity why Israel couldn't have sealed them from its side. Just as Egypt after the July 2013 coup sealed some 1,500 commercial tunnels passing from Gaza into the Sinai. Later, when Egypt flooded the still extant tunnels, allegedly to preempt weapons smuggling, Israeli Energy Minister Yuval Steinitz praised it as a, a good solution. Why was it a, a good solution for Egypt but not a, a good solution for Israel? Perhaps Israel couldn't on technical grounds duplicate Egypt's modus operandi. Still, the question was not even posed why Israel was ravaging Gaza to eliminate terror tunnels, if it seemingly had less destructive options at hand. Once the IDF breached Gaza's border and met fierce resistance, it sought to destroy the tunnel network inside Gaza so that Hamas couldn't inflict heavy casualties when Israel next set out to mow the lawn. If Israel asserted a right to destroy the tunnels, a prerogative endorsed by much of official public opinion around the world, it was declaring that Gaza had no right to defend itself against Israel's periodic massacres. Even were it true that Israel sought to destroy only the cross-border tunnels, it would still be hard to figure out why this was a legitimate preemptive goal. Inveterate Israel propagandist Colonel Richard Kemp compared these tunnels to no less than Auschwitz. The purpose of both of those things was to kill Jews. Samantha Power, U.S. representative at the United Nations, scolded the Security Council for saying nothing of the resources diverted from helping Gaza's residents to dig tunnels into Israeli territory so that terrorists can attack Israelis in their homes. But these cross-border catacombs were only used to conduct attacks directed at IDF positions in Israel in the vicinity of the Green Line, which are legitimate military targets. Do the laws of war prescribe that planes, artillery shells, and tanks get to breach Gaza's border at Israel's will and whim, but Hamas tunnels targeting combatants must not transgress Israel's sacred space? Israel misrepresented not only the threat posed by Hamas u terror tunnels. It also inflated the performance of its anti-missile defense system and the threat posed by Hamas rockets. Hamas reportedly fired 5,000 rockets and 2,000 mortar shells at Israel during the operation. 
to reconcile the vast discrepancy between the many thousands of projectiles Hamas unleashed, on the one hand, and the minimal death and destruction they inflicted, on the other, Israel motioned to its wondrous Iron Dome anti-missile defense system. A leading Israeli military correspondent posited that were it not for Iron Dome, the Israeli casualty count would have been infinitely higher, while an Israeli diplomat purported that Iron Dome prevented thousands of potential Israeli civilian casualties. But this explanation does not persuade. Whereas Israel alleged that Iron Dome intercepted 740 rockets, the UN Department of Safety and Security put the number at closer to 240. However, the most skeptical reckoning came from one of the world's leading authorities on anti-missile defense, Theodore Postel of MIT. Postel had previously debunked claims hyping the Patriot anti-missile defense system in the 1991 Gulf War. He concluded that Iron Dome successfully intercepted 5% of incoming Hamas rockets, or, on the basis of Israel's raw data, an underwhelming 40 of them. Even accepting, for argument's sake, the official Israeli tally of 740 successful interceptions, it still perplexed why the thousands of Hamas projectiles that Iron Dome did not intercept caused so little damage. Indeed, even before Israel first deployed Iron Dome, during Pillar of Defense in 2012, the material consequences of Hamas projectiles barely registered. Consider these figures. Whereas Hamas fired some 13,000 rockets and mortar shells at Israel between 2001 and 2012, a total of 23 Israeli civilians were killed, or one civilian killed per 500 projectiles fired. In the course of cast lead, Israel's most violent confrontation with Gaza prior to Protective Edge and before Iron Dome was deployed. Hamas fired some 900 projectiles, yet a total of only three civilians were killed. Even during Protective Edge, fully 2,800 Hamas projectiles, or 40% of the total number, landed in Israel's border region where Iron Dome was not deployed, yet only one Israeli civilian was killed by a rocket. Postal ascribed the fewness of Israeli civilian casualties in protective edge primarily, but not exclusively, to Israel's early warning slash shelter system, which had been significantly upgraded in recent years. But that still couldn't fully account for the fewness of civilian casualties before Israel overhauled its civil defense system. What's yet more telling, it couldn't account for the minimal Israeli property damage during Protective Edge. The Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs website tracked on a daily basis the damage caused by Hamas rockets to civilian infrastructure. Table 5 summarizes its entries. The official Israeli postmortem on Protective Edge alleged that several residential communities on the border with the Gaza Strip were battered by rocket and mortar fire. Yet, even allowing that a certain percentage landed in open areas, how could the thousands upon thousands of Hamas rockets have inflicted so little damage? How could only one Israeli house have been destroyed and 11 others hit or damaged by a mega barrage of rockets? The obvious and most plausible answer was that the preponderance of these so-called rockets amounted to enhanced fireworks or bottle rockets. The triad of media takeaways from Protective Edge, Hamas rockets, terror tunnels, and Iron Dome, in actuality constituted metaprops in Israel's Hasbara, propaganda, campaign. Israel initially inflated the threat posed by Hamas's projectiles to justify its insane, and, crazy, assault on Gaza's civilian population and infrastructure. However, the pretext backfired as the projectiles kept coming and Israel's tourism industry took a big hit. When a Hamas projectile landed in the vicinity of Ben Gurion Airport, prompting international airlines to suspend flights destined for Israel, 
Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg obligingly flew over in order to reassure prospective travelers. But if tranquility reigned in the promised land, then why was Israel pulverizing Gaza? Not missing a beat, Israel conjured a new rationale, quickly aped by credulous journalists, Hamas u terror tunnels, which have the sole purpose of annihilating our citizens and killing our children, Netanyahu. This newly minted alibi also backfired, however, as Israeli evacuees recoiled at the prospect of returning to their border communities. It was then widely conceded in Israel that Hamas fighters infiltrating via tunnels targeted the IDF, not civilians. In a retrospective marking the first anniversary of Protective Edge, a senior Israeli military correspondent flatly stated, These tunnels allowed Hamas to move commando forces under the border and into Israel without warning, to carry out attacks on soldiers. Israel touted the technical wizardry of Iron Dome after pillar of defense in order to compensate for the operation's meager returns. It hyped it again during Protective Edge in order to soothe the jittery nerves of both its indoctrinated domestic population and would-be tourists. Israel's flourishing arms trade also stood to reap rich dividends from the Iron Dome fanfare. But in its official postmort, but in its official postmortem on Protective Edge, Israel reversed itself in order to rationalize the death and destruction it wreaked in Gaza. It downplayed Iron Dome's efficacy and instead magnified the vulnerability of Israel's home front. Spewing forth one lie after another, Israel kept catching itself in the tangled web of its deceits. If its misrepresentations and contradictions went unnoticed, it was testament to the competence of Israeli Hasbara, on the one hand, and the bias of Western media, on the other. When Israel hit civilians who took refuge in UN schools, leaving scores dead and hundreds wounded, it crossed a red line. A UN Board of Inquiry later found that Israel had in its possession up-to-date GPS coordinates of all the UN shelters it targeted, and that it used indiscriminate weapons, such as artillery, in densely populated areas where these shelters were situated, as well as precision weapons, such as guided missiles. The board did not credit Israel's various justifications for these attacks. As the international community reacted in shock, the diplomatic dominoes began to fall in Israel's direction. Feeling the heat from inside the UN bureaucracy, Ban Ki-moon denounced on August 3 one of these atrocities as a moral outrage and criminal act. Left isolated on the world stage, and unwilling to bear the onus of this latest string of Israeli atrocities, the White House joined on August 3 in the chorus of condemnation, while Israel's cheerleaders in the U.S. Congress fell silent. Once the United States declared that it was appalled by Israel's disgraceful, lethal shelling in proximity to a U.N. shelter, it sunk in on Israel that it was time to wind down the operation. On August 2, Netanyahu had nipped in the bud rumors of an impending Israeli troop withdrawal. We will take as much time as necessary, and will exert as much force as is needed. But disabled by his chief enabler in the White House, Netanyahu announced on that same August 3 that Israeli troops were withdrawing. To cover up for its failure to destroy Hamas's catacombs, Israel entered the discreet qualifier that it had detonated nearly all of Hamas's known tunnels. The operation dragged on for another three weeks, however, as Israel sought to extract the best possible terms in the final diplomatic phase, and still harbored hopes of inflicting a decisive military defeat on Hamas by attrition. It resorted to indiscriminate aerial bombardments, killing and wounding many civilians, and assassinated senior Hamas military leaders. After the beheading of an American journalist on August 19, media attention shifted to ISIS, and the Gaza massacre entered the ho-hum, 
more of the same phase of the news cycle. Israel was able to resume the precision terror strikes with unprecedented abandon, flattening high-rise apartment buildings, as if playing a video game and with barely a pretense that they constituted legitimate military objectives. But the Hamas projectiles and mortar shells kept coming, causing Israeli civilian casualties to mount. On August 26, a ceasefire agreement went into effect. Its essential terms stipulated that Israel and Egypt would ease the blockade of Gaza, while the Palestinian Authority, PA, would administer the border crossings, coordinate the international reconstruction effort, and prevent weapons from entering Gaza. The agreement deferred to future talks other points of contention, such as a prisoner release and construction of an airport and seaport in Gaza. At a news conference after the ceasefire was reached, Netanyahu boasted of Israel's great military and political achievement. But Israel did not attain its avowed goals. Initially, Netanyahu hoped to fracture the Palestinian unity government by provoking a violent reaction from Hamas, and then re-demonizing it as a terrorist organization. But the unity government held together, even as President Abbas probably longed for Israel to deliver Hamas a death blow. If Israel hoped to show that Hamas was an unreconstructed terrorist organization, it ended up persuading many more people that Israel was an unrepentant terrorist state. If Israel hoped to convince the United States and European Union not to negotiate with a unity government that included Hamas, it ended up itself negotiating with the unity government and indirectly with Hamas. Effectively, an influential Israeli columnist observed, Israel has recognized Hamas. If the unity government ultimately yielded no fruit, it was because of factional infighting, not protective edge. Once hostilities escalated, Netanyahu's avowed objective was to destroy Hamas rockets and a terror tunnels. But both these aims proved beyond his reach. Hamas kept firing projectiles, killing two Israelis in the last hour before the ceasefire, while an unknown number of tunnels remained intact. Israel's larger goal of inflicting a comprehensive military and political defeat on Hamas also went unfulfilled. Although Israel had made any concessions contingent on Hamas's disarmament, the ceasefire agreement did not oblige the Islamic resistance to lay down its weapons, and only a vague promise was extracted from the PA to stem the flow of arms into Gaza. The ceasefire's terms it didn't include any statement, not even a hint, regarding Israel's security demands, an Israeli diplomatic correspondent groused. There was nothing about the demilitarization of the Strip, the rearming, or the issue of the tunnels. Although it was the regional powerhouse, Israel, failed to impose its will on an isolated enemy operating in a besieged territory without advanced weaponry. The chief beneficiary of this latest Gaza massacre was Lebanon. After its military fiasco, Israel would think twice before attacking Hezbollah as it possessed a formidable arsenal of real, sophisticated rockets, reducing Iron Dome's potential efficacy quotient from single-digit percentages to near zero. It also possessed a tunnel network dug deep inside mountains. In a replay of the last act, last scene of Pillar of Defense, the Israeli Prime Minister, Defense Minister, and chief of staff cut sorry figures at the news conference proclaiming Israel's victory in protective edge. Still, Netanyahu could exult in a pair of complimentary triumphs. He satiated the bloodlust of Israeli society that he himself had whipped up. It could now savor the prospect of Gazan's confronting, once the suit had settled, the massive death and destruction Israel had visited on them. The latest military operation, a comprehensive UN report found, has effectively eliminated what was left of the middle class, 
sending almost all of the population into destitution and dependence on international humanitarian aid. Israel had, concomitantly, battered if not yet completely broken the spirits of the people of Gaza. The ever-escalating violence, the wreckage left in its wake, the futureless future had finally taken a toll. Nine months after Protective Edge, not a single totally destroyed home had been rebuilt. Fully half of Gazans pulled after Protective Edge expressed a desire to leave. In extreme but still indicative instances, they boarded rickety vessels to escape, hundreds drowned, crossed into Israel illegally in search of work or the comfort of a jail cell, and, in unprecedented numbers, committed suicide. If Israel's tacit goal in its recent major operations had been to punish, humiliate, and terrorize Gaza's civilian population, Goldstone report, then this time around it could take pride in a job well done. It also put the lie to the bromide that violence doesn't work. It does, and did. Hamas also flourished the V sign for victory. Indeed, its popularity among Palestinians surged after fighting Israel to a stalemate. But the uptick proved ephemeral. When armed hostilities broke out, Hamas's primary goal was to end the blockade of Gaza. Whereas the original Egyptian ceasefire proposal stipulated that the siege would be lifted only after the security situation stabilizes in Gaza, the final ceasefire agreement omitted this precondition. However, it called only for the blockade to be eased, not lifted, and did not include an external enforcement mechanism, which Hamas had earlier demanded. In effect, it reinstated the ceasefire term's ending pillar of defense, which Israel had back then proceeded to scrap. Hamas settled for less than its bottom line because of Israel's relentless bombardment. Our demands were just, Hamas leader Khalid Mishal told a news conference, but in the end we had the Palestinian demands, on the one hand, and the pain of Gaza's civilian population, on the other. We agreed to the ceasefire, Mishal continued, in the knowledge that the siege will be lifted. But it was already clear at the time that this was wishful thinking until and unless Hamas disarmed. Two years after Protective Edge, Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman still maintained that only if Hamas stops digging tunnels, rearming and firing rockets, we will lift the blockade. As the Islamic movement wouldn't capitulate, the siege showed no signs of abating. The virtual ban on exports from Gaza has not been lifted while at the volume of truck traffic Israel allowed, it would take 174 years to return Gaza to where it was in May 2014. If Gazans flocked into the streets after the ceasefire was declared, it was to proclaim, firstly to themselves and then to the world, that however enormous the toll, however bottomless the sacrifice, the people of Palestine still lived. We were, we are, we will be. An official consensus crystallized during Protective Edge according to which Israel had the right to defend itself, even though it had initiated the armed hostilities, and Hamas would have to disarm, even though it had acted in self-defense. In July 2014, the European Union called on Hamas to immediately put an end to these acts and to renounce violence. All terrorist groups in Gaza must disarm. At the same time, it recognized Israel's legitimate right to defend itself against any attacks, with the throwaway caveat that the Israeli military operation must be proportionate and in line with international humanitarian law. This allocation of rights and obligations did not just contradict the circumstantial facts of the operation. It also contradicted the overarching legal framework of the occupation. Whereas international law prohibits an occupying power from using force to suppress a struggle for self-determination, it does not debar a people struggling for self-determination from using force. 
Israel consequently has no legal mandate to use force against the Palestinian self-determination struggle. It might be argued that insofar as this self-determination struggle has been unfolding within the framework of a belligerent occupation, Israel has the legal right, as the occupying power, to enforce the occupation so long as it endures. But the International Court of Justice, ICJ, ruled in 1971 that since South Africa had refused to carry out good-faith negotiations to terminate its occupation of Namibia, the occupation had eventually become illegal. In light of the Namibia precedent, Israel's failure to carry out good-faith negotiations based on international law has delegitimized its occupation as well. If Israel can lay title to any a right, it is, in the exhortation of the United States at the time of the Namibia debate, to withdraw its administration, immediately and thus put an end to its occupation. Whereas it proclaims the right of self-defense against Hamas projectiles, Israel is in effect promulgating a right to use force to perpetuate the occupation. Were Israel to cease its violent repression, the occupation would end and, ideally, the projectile attacks would also stop as Palestinians went about the business of consolidating their own independent state. The right to self-defense could justly be invoked by Israel only if the attacks continued regardless. On the one hand, Israel cannot pretend to a right of self-defense if the exercise of this right traces back to the wrong of an illegal occupation, slash denial of self-determination, ex injuria non orator jus. On the other hand, Israel would not need to invoke the right if it ceased inflicting the wrong. In 2016, the European Union issued a statement calling for all parties to produce a fundamental change to the situation in the Gaza Strip, including the end of the closure and a full opening of the crossing points, while addressing Israel's legitimate security concerns. But Israel cannot lay claim to legitimate security concerns, vis a vis Gaza, so long as the force it deploys there is designed to entrench an illegitimate regime. The legally correct position was enunciated by the UN Human Rights Council Mission on Protective Edge, which called on Israel to lift, immediately and unconditionally, the blockade on Gaza. The refrain that Israel has a right to defend itself is a red herring. The real question is, does Israel have the right to use force to perpetuate an illegal occupation? The answer is no. But, it might be contended, even granting that unlike Israel, Palestinians can legally resort to force. Doesn't Hamas's use of indiscriminate projectiles and its targeting of Israeli civilians still constitute war crimes? The situation is more equivocal than is often acknowledged. First, what constitutes an indiscriminate weapon isn't clear, while the implicit standard isn't just. A class of weapons apparently passes legal muster if its probability of hitting a target is relatively high. This legal threshold is keyed to and correlates with cutting-edge technology. The couplets advanced slash primitive and discriminate slash indiscriminate overlap, a high-tech weapon can, whereas a low-tech weapon cannot, discriminate between targets. But then, only a people sufficiently endowed to purchase high-tech weaponry can defend itself against a high-tech aerial assault. If it lacks material resources, if compelled by circumstance to use rudimentary weapons, a people engaging in a war of self-defense or a struggle for self-determination cannot prevail except by breaching the laws of war. If it obeys the laws of war, it will almost certainly suffer defeat. If this be the law, it is a most peculiar law, for it negates a raison d'etre of law, the substitution of might by right, as it enshrines might, or the rich and powerful, above right. Second, it was asserted that even if the civilian population of one party to a conflict comes under relentless attack, it does not have the legal right to carry out belligerent reprisals, that is, 
to deliberately target civilians of the opposing party until that party desists from its initial illegal attacks. Regardless of who started this latest round, attacks targeting civilians violate basic humanitarian norms, Human Rights Watch stated right after Protective Edge began. All attacks, including reprisal attacks, that target or indiscriminately harm civilians are prohibited under the laws of war, period. But was that true? In fact, international law does not, at any rate, not yet, prohibit belligerent reprisals. The United States and United Kingdom have even defended the right to deploy nuclear weapons in belligerent reprisals. The people of Gaza surely, then, had the right to use makeshift projectiles to end an illegal, merciless seven-year-long Israeli blockade targeting a civilian population, and to end Israel's criminal bombardment of a civilian population. Indeed, in its landmark 1996 advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons, the ICJ stated that international law was not settled on the right of a state to use nuclear weapons when it's a survival was in jeopardy. But if that elusive abstraction called a state might legally use nuclear weapons when its survival is at stake, then a people surely has the right to use makeshift projectiles when its survival is at stake. The political prudence of Hamas's strategy could be legitimately questioned. But the law is not unambiguously against it, while the scales of morality tilt in its favor. Israel has imposed a brutal siege on Gaza that halved its already de-developed GDP. As a result of the blockade and recurrent military assaults, Gaza's population has been denied a human standard of living, while some 95% of its water is unfit for human consumption. Innocent human beings, most of them young, Sarah Roy bewailed, are slowly being poisoned by the water they drink. They were not only consigned but also literally confined to a slow death. When a place becomes unlivable, people move, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency has observed. This is the case for environmental disasters such as droughts, or for conflicts, such as in Syria. Yet this last resort is denied to the people in Gaza. They cannot move beyond their 365 square kilometers territory. They cannot escape, neither the devastating poverty nor the fear of another conflict. Its highly educated youth do not have the option to travel, to seek education outside Gaza, or to find work, anywhere else beyond the perimeter fence and the two tightly controlled border checkpoints in the north and south of the Gaza Strip. With the Rafah crossing between Egypt and Gaza almost entirely closed except for a few days per year, and with Israel often denying exit even for severe humanitarian cases or staff of international organizations, the vast majority of the people have no chance of getting one of the highly sought-after permits. They can also not leave across the sea without the risk of being arrested or shot at by the Israeli or Egyptian navies and they cannot climb over the heavily guarded perimeter fence between Israel and Gaza without the same risks. The people of Palestine embraced Hamas as it launched belligerent reprisals against Israel. In the climacteric of their martyrdom, Gazans chose to die resisting rather than to live expiring under an inhuman blockade. The resistance was mostly notional, as the rudimentary projectiles caused little damage. So the ultimate question is, do Palestinians have the right to symbolically resist slow death punctuated by periodic massacres, or is it incumbent upon them to lie down and die? Chapter 12 Betrayal 1 Amnesty International Although, Operation Protective Edge, 2014, proved to be the most destructive of Israel's recent assaults on Gaza. It elicited a muted response from human rights organizations. It would be only a slight exaggeration to say that they sat it out. In the aftermath of Operation Cast Lead, 
2008-9, as many as 300 human rights reports were issued. Human Rights Watch, HRW, alone released five substantial studies. But HRW just barely issued one report on Protective Edge. The outlier appeared to be Amnesty International, which published a series of reports. Yet, far from being the exception that proved the rule, Amnesty actually constituted a variant of the rule. Instead of falling silent on Israeli crimes during Protective Edge, Amnesty whitewashed them. In particular, its comprehensive indictment of Hamas, unlawful and deadly, rocket and mortar attacks by Palestinian armed groups during the 2014 Gaza-Israel conflict, amounted to an abdication of its professional mandate and a betrayal of the people of Gaza. A human rights assessment of protective edge necessarily begins with the civilian death and destruction it entailed. Table summarizes the raw data. On both sides, Amnesty observed an unlawful and deadly. Civilians once again bore the brunt of the third full-scale war in less than six years. Although arguably true, this assessment obscured the yawning gap separating the magnitude of suffering inflicted on Gazan as compared to Israeli civilians. It would be hard to come up with a more palpable instance of a quantitative difference turning into a qualitative one than the single Israeli child versus the 550 Gazan children killed. And it doesn't diminish the sanctity of every human life to take note that if the death of one Israeli child was terrible, then on the same calculus the child deaths in Gaza were 550 times as terrible. An international medical fact-finding mission, assembled by the Israeli branch of Physicians for Human Rights and composed of eminent medical practitioners, concluded its report on Protective Edge with this caveat, while not wishing to devalue in any way the traumatic effects of the war on Israeli civilians. These pale in comparison with the consequences of the massive destruction wreaked on Gaza. Even UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who disgraced his office with apologetic on Israel's behalf, carefully discriminated between Israel's lethal attacks on UN facilities during Protective Edge, which I deplore, and Hamas's misuse of UN facilities, about which I am dismayed. One searched unlawful and deadly in vain for comparable acknowledgement or nuance by Amnesty. In keeping with its pretense to even-handedness, Amnesty conveyed the impression that Israel and Hamas were equally guilty of breaching the laws of war. During a crucial period when it could still inflict public policy, Amnesty issued a pair of reports documenting Israel's crimes and a pair of reports documenting Hamas's crimes for altogether, while, amazingly, it devoted, all told, many more pages to indicting Hamas, 107, than Israel, 78. It was not so wide of the mark in the past. In Operation a Cast Lead, Israel bore the brunt of Amnesty's indictment, its space allocations, 60 pages to Israeli crimes versus 13 pages to Hamas crimes, were more, if still far from fully commensurate with the relative death and destruction inflicted by each side. The introduction to each of Amnesty's four reports on protective edge cautiously balanced the distribution of guilt. As if that weren't problematic enough, unlawful and deadly detailed the death of the single Israeli child killed by a Hamas attack across more than two pages. Were it truly committed to affecting, as against affecting, balance, shouldn't Amnesty have devoted 1,100 pages to the 550 children in Gaza who were killed? Amnesty even intimated that Hamas was the more manifestly culpable party to the conflict. Thus, unlawful and deadly's conclusion unequivocally deplored Hamas's flagrant disregard for international humanitarian law, whereas one of Amnesty's reciprocal reports families under the rubble, Israeli attacks on inhabited homes, gingerly concluded that the havoc wrought, 18,000 Gazan homes were destroyed or rendered uninhabitable, 
and 110,000 people were left homeless, raises difficult questions for the Israeli government which they have so far failed to answer. It is of course conceivable that Hamas committed as many war crimes as Israel, if not more, during Protective Edge, but prima facie that would be a most anomalous conclusion. In both absolute and relative terms, the scales of guilt appeared to tilt heavily to the Israeli side. Hamas killed 73 Israelis of whom only 8% were civilians, whereas Israel killed 2,200 Gazans of whom fully 70% were civilians. The damage inflicted on Gaza's civilian infrastructure, $4 billion, exceeded by a factor of 70 the damage inflicted on Israel's infrastructure, $55 million while the ratio of civilian dwellings destroyed by Israel versus Hamas stood at 18, 000 to 1. The intriguing question is, how did Amnesty manage to turn this wildly imbalanced balance sheet into a, a balanced indictment of both parties to the conflict? To justify the massive violence it unleashed on Gaza, Israel harped on the arsenal of deadly rockets Hamas had allegedly amassed. Echoing Israeli Hasbara propaganda, unlawful and deadly reported that as far back as 2001, Hamas had been stockpiling short-range rockets, that it then, developed longer-range Qassam rockets, that, in more recent years, armed groups in Gaza have produced, upgraded or smuggled in thousands of BM-21 Grad rockets of different types, with ranges varying from 20 kilometers to 48 kilometers and acquired or produced smaller numbers of medium and long-range rockets, including the Iranian FAR-5 and locally produced M-75, both with a range of 75 km, and the locally produced J-80 rockets with a range of 80 km. The majority of Israel's 8.3 million people, and all 2.8 million Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, Amnesty ominously concluded, are now within range of at least some of the rockets held by Palestinian armed groups in the Gaza Strip. T. E. Circle of Fear has widened. Although Amnesty didn't cite the basis for these data, they almost certainly emanated from official Israeli sources, and it is hard not to be skeptical of them. Israel's official post-mortem on Protective Edge alleged that on the eve of Operation Pillar of Defense, 2012, Hamas had stockpiled over 7,000 rockets and mortars, while on the eve of Protective Edge it had acquired more than 10,000 rockets and mortars. It also provided a precise breakdown of these projectiles, 6,700 rockets with a range of up to 20 kilometers. 2,300 rockets with a range of up to 40 kilometers, etc. It is anyone's guess how Israel came by such detailed information and why, if possessing it, Israel didn't militarily preempt Hamas's use of this terrifying weaponry. If it could ascertain the quantity and quality of these projectiles, it must also have been privy to where Hamas stockpiled them. While Israel has never shied away from launching a preemptive attack to nip in the bud an existential a threat, real or contrived. If it didn't launch such an attack, it was almost certainly because either Hamas didn't possess such an arsenal or, if it did, Israel was in the dark about it. In either case, Israel must have plucked its published data, on which Amnesty, and others, leaned, from thin air. If Hamas had indeed amassed a humongous arsenal of lethal weapons, the wonder would be that it inflicted so little death and destruction. Stealing another page from Israeli Hasbara, Amnesty ascribed this miracle to Israel's anti-missile batteries. Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system helped limit civilian casualties in many areas, and was used to protect civilian areas from projectiles launched from the Gaza Strip. In fact, it was perfectly obvious from public sources that Hamas's stockpile consisted of enhanced fireworks or bottle rockets, while Iron Dome saved few if any Israeli lives.
In its hyperbolic inventory of Hamas's arsenal, Amnesty also cited the Israeli allegation that it had intercepted a vessel carrying Iranian rockets bound for Gaza. It omitted the widely reported finding of a UN expert panel that the Iranian weapons were bound not for Gaza but the Sudan. By adopting Israel's storyline of a lethal Hamas rocket arsenal, Amnesty became, wittingly or not, a purveyor of state propaganda. Its depiction of the Hamas catacombs was no less tendentious. Amnesty repeated the official Israeli allegation that the ground invasion was launched to destroy the tunnel system. Particularly those with shafts discovered near residential areas located in Israel, and that Israeli troops repeatedly preempted Hamas infiltrators from targeting civilian communities. It ignored evidence from unimpeachable Israeli sources that Hamas fighters exiting the tunnels targeted Israeli soldiers, not civilians. Even as Israel's official post-mortem on Protective Edge portentously reported that Hamas tunnels exited, in or close to residential communities, its actual breakdown, too, showed that every instance of Hamas infiltration climaxed not in a headlong assault on civilians but instead in an armed engagement with Israeli combatants. The upshot of Amnesty's reliance on official Israeli sources was that it magnified Hamas's and diminished Israel's criminal culpability. This distortion resulted in part from another of Amnesty's strategic balancing acts. Israel barred Amnesty and other human rights organizations, from entering Gaza during and after Protective Edge. Consequently, except for at most a couple of its field workers based in Gaza, Amnesty had to carry out its research from the outside. As a practical matter, this Israeli-imposed constraint repeatedly prevented Amnesty from assessing the veracity of official Israeli exculpations. How did Amnesty resolve this forensic challenge? It typically reported the allegation of an Israeli war crime, then the Israeli denial, and then, neutrally, proceeded to call for a proper on-the-ground investigation, an investigation that as Amnesty knew full well Israel would never allow. The reader was thus left in perfect and permanent limbo as to where the truth lay. When assessing allegations that Hamas violated international law during Protective Edge, Amnesty gestured to prior Hamas misconduct as corroborative evidence of its guilt. Shouldn't Amnesty also have contextualized Israeli denials of guilt with the caveat that prior Israeli denials regularly proved on inspection to be flagrant falsehoods? Indeed, the UN Board of Inquiry Investigation of Israeli Attacks on UN Facilities During Protective Edge repeatedly put the lie to Israel's pleas of innocence. In its press release deploring Israel's refusal to grant it entry, Human Rights Watch pointedly observed, if Israel is confident in its claim that Hamas is responsible for civilian deaths in Gaza, it shouldn't be blocking human rights organizations from carrying out on-site investigations. Amnesty itself observed that, governments who wish to hide their violations of human rights from the outside world have frequently banned Amnesty International from accessing the places in which they have been committed. So if Israel blocked access to Gaza after Protective Edge, Shouldn't Amnesty's working assumption have been that Israel's counterclaims would not withstand an on-site investigation? If a suspect denies eminently impartial investigators access to a crime scene, then the inexorable inference is that he or she has something to hide. True, to justify its refusal Israel has repeatedly alleged that Amnesty is biased against it. But it would be odd indeed if Amnesty itself credited this accusation as compelling grounds for it to suspend judgment. The relevant principle at play is not whether Israel is innocent until proven guilty. It's whether Israel's plea of not guilty should carry probative weight even as it refuses to prove its innocence, before a nonpartisan third party, in the face of credible charges based on a mass of incriminating evidence. 
Ultimately, Amnesty's neutrality incentivized Israeli non-cooperation. For if granting human rights groups entry into Gaza would enable them to document Israeli crimes, then prudent state policy would be to bar these organizations altogether and settle for an agnostic verdict. In the event, that's what Israel did and that's the verdict Amnesty delivered. Finally, one egregious lacuna as Amnesty pretended to balance deserves special notice. It cited in abundance the junk claims of Israeli Hasbara, but not once did it report the pertinent findings of Gaza's respected human rights organizations, such as the al mezin Center for Human Rights and the Palestinian Center for Human Rights. The methodology section of Unlawful and Deadly stated, Amnesty International studied relevant documentation produced by UN agencies, the Israeli military and Israeli governmental bodies, Israeli and Palestinian NGOs, Palestinian armed groups, and media reports, amongst other sources, and consulted with relevant experts and practitioners before writing the report. Amnesty International would like to thank the Israeli NGOs and other Israeli bodies that provided assistance to its researchers, whereas the report amply represented the claims of Israeli military and governmental bodies, it did not contain a single reference to any Palestinian NGO. Amnesty's problematic evidentiary standards in unlawful and deadly subtly shifted to Hamas a portion of culpability for Israel's most egregious crimes during Protective Edge. Consider these examples. Hospitals Israel destroyed or damaged 17 hospitals and 56 primary healthcare centers during Protective Edge. Unlawful and deadly pointed to Hamas's alleged misuse of three of these facilities. Al-Wafa Israel repeatedly attacked and then reduced to rubble Al-Wafa Hospital, the sole rehabilitation facility in Gaza. It wasn't the first time Israel targeted the hospital. During cast lead, Al-Wafa sustained direct hits from eight tank shells, two missiles, and thousands of bullets, even as Israel publicly avowed that it did not target a terrorists who launched attacks in the vicinity of a hospital. This time around, Amnesty cited the Israeli allegation that Al-Wafa was a command center. It could have noted that command center was Israel's default alibi for targeting civilian objects during Protective Edge, and that in other contexts Amnesty itself treated this allegation as baseless. Displaying an aerial photograph, the Israeli military alleged that Hamas fired a rocket from Al-Wafa's immediate vicinity. Amnesty found, however, that, the image tweeted by the Israeli military does not match satellite images of the Al-Wafa hospital, and appears to depict a different location. This finding seemed to dispose of Israel's pretext, except that, ever so even-handedly, Amnesty concluded that it, has not been able to verify Israeli assertions that the hospital was used to launch rockets, and that the Israeli claim should be independently investigated. In other words, even if the single piece of evidence adduced by Israel was demonstrably false, it still remained an open question whether or not the alibi was true. On this evidentiary standard, Amnesty couldn't find that Israel had committed a war crime unless and until Israel acknowledged its commission. As it happened, Israel itself eventually dropped the rocket allegation. Amnesty further noted that, according to media reports, an anti-tank missile was fired from Al-Wafa. The media reports, cited by Amnesty turn out to be little more than an official Israeli press handout dutifully reprinted by the Jerusalem Post. It's as instructive what Amnesty elected not to cite. If it adduced Israeli Hasbara as credible evidence, shouldn't it also have cited Al-Wafa's director, who told Haaretz that Israeli claims were false and misleading, or the representative of the World Health Organization in Gaza, 
who forthrightly acknowledged the probable presence of a rocket launching site in the vicinity of al Wafa, but contended that it was more than 200 meters away from the hospital. Israeli forces contest having directly and intentionally targeted al Wafa hospital, claiming that they sought to neutralize rocket fire originating in the vicinity of the hospital. An International Federation for Human Rights, FIDH, delegation observed after entering Gaza and sifting through the evidence. However, various elements indicate that the hospital was in fact the target of a direct and intentional attack on the part of Israeli armed forces. Opting instead to quell doubts of Israel's innocence, Amnesty reported. An internal investigation by the Israeli military into its attacks on al Wafa found that the attacks had been carried out in accordance with international law. Shouldn't it also have mentioned that all major human rights organizations, Amnesty included, have dismissed the results of Israeli internal investigations as worthless? al Shifa on the basis of credible evidence that Hamas fired a rocket from behind al Shifa hospital, Amnesty called for an independent investigation. It then proceeded to call for an investigation of other reports and claims that Hamas leaders and security forces used facilities within the hospital for military purposes and interrogations during the hostilities. Israel leveled cognate allegations during cast lead but the evidence it adduced in support of them was razor-thin. This time around, Amnesty cited many sources of varying quality. What it flagrantly did not do, however, was cite sources that disputed the allegation. It ignored the compelling and nuanced testimony of two respected Norwegian surgeons who volunteered in al Shifa during Protective Edge, although able to roam freely at the hospital they came across no indication that it was a command center for Hamas. At this author's request, one of the world's leading academic specialists on Gaza, Sarah Roy of Harvard University, consulted a clutch of her own Gaza-based sources, whose personal and professional integrity she attested to. The consensus among them was that although rockets had been fired in the vicinity of al Shifa, but not from hospital grounds, it was highly improbable that Hamas made military use of the hospital building. Amnesty either chose to ignore or didn't bother to solicit such contrary opinions from impeccable, easily accessible sources. It also reported the supposedly incriminating tidbit that a Palestinian journalist was interrogated by officers from Hamas internal security in an abandoned section of the hospital. Al Shifa was filled to the brim with as many as 13,000 homeless people during Protective Edge. Because it enabled access to satellite news gathering equipment, the hospital also served as a hub for the media, political spokespeople, UN officials, human rights organizations, and other NGOs. It is cause for wonder why Amnesty would consider it sinister, or even noteworthy. If a besieged party fending off a murderous foreign invasion questioned, not physically abused or intimidated, just questioned, someone in a facility packed with a throng of random people, some among them presumably spies, saboteurs, and provocateurs. Was Gaza's governing body not even allowed to carry out routine security functions? In its report, Strangling Necks, Abductions, torture and summary killings of Palestinians by Hamas forces during the 2014 Gaza-Israel conflict. Amnesty flatly stated, Hamas forces used the abandoned areas of al Shifa hospital in Gaza City, including the outpatient's clinic area, to detain, interrogate, torture and otherwise ill-treat suspects. The evidence Amnesty adduced for the most incendiary of these asseverations, that is, Hamas systematically tortured suspects at al Shifa, underwhelmed. How, incidentally, did this torture chamber escape the notice of swarms of journalists, UN officials, 
and NGOs ensconced at Al Shifa until Amnesty's solitary field worker in Gaza came along to scoop all of them? Even Israel's official post mortem on Protective Edge, although replete with the most egregious propaganda and falsehoods, didn't go beyond alleging that Hamas used Al Shifa for security service interrogations. Was Amnesty bending over backward to the point of coming out from under itself to demonstrate its nonpartisanship? 3. Shohada Al Aqsa Israel shelled Shohada Al Aqsa Hospital killing at least four people and wounding dozens. Noting that Israel alleged it had targeted a cache of anti-tank missiles stored in the immediate vicinity of the hospital, Amnesty stated that it has not been able to confirm this incident and called for it to be independently investigated. Insofar as it obligingly reported Israel's pretext for this atrocity, Shouldn't Amnesty also have cited the eyewitness account of a nurse at her station? She testified that after four Palestinians were killed in vehicles parked outside, the hospital was then hit 15 times in quick succession by tank strikes. Whereas in Amnesty's assessment Hamas and Israel might have been equally culpable of violating international law, the medical fact-finding mission concluded. What is important here is that, Al-Aqsa, was attacked by the Israeli military while patients were admitted, health professionals were at work and civilians were seeking refuge from attacks in the surrounding area. Ambulances Fully 45 ambulances were either damaged or destroyed as a result of direct Israeli attacks or collateral damage, during protective edge. Amnesty reported that Israel released video footage which it claimed showed Palestinian fighters entering an ambulance. This 24-second video clip was the one and only piece of evidence Israel adduced to justify its repeated targeting of ambulances during protective edge. In fact, the evidentiary value of the video could be precisely calculated at zero. It captured a pair of unarmed Hamas militants on an unknown date at an unknown place entering an ambulance belonging to the emergency medical unit of Hamas's armed wing, al Qassam Brigades. For all anyone could tell from the clip, they were participating in a routine medical rescue mission. It merits parenthetical notice that the health ministry had instructed ambulance crews not to allow any weapons on board not even pistols. Since it referenced this vacuous video, why didn't Amnesty also note that Israel repeatedly targeted Palestinian ambulances in prior operations, that notwithstanding its high-tech surveillance technology, Israel adduced evidence justifying such a criminal attack on an ambulance in only one single incident way back in 2002? and that in this sole instance Amnesty itself found the evidence dubious? In fact, Amnesty, the medical fact-finding mission, and the FIDH delegation extensively documented premeditated and unprovoked attacks by Israel on Palestinian ambulances during Protective Edge. Schools Israel destroyed 22 schools and damaged 118 others during Protective Edge. The Israeli military has stated that rockets or mortars were launched from within several schools in the Gaza Strip during the hostilities, Amnesty reported, and that, at least 89 rockets and mortar shells were launched within 30 m of UN schools. After professing its inability to verify any of these specific claims, Amnesty recommended that they should be independently investigated. But why did unlawful and deadly cite only, and ad nauseum, Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Israel Defense Forces, IDF, press handouts? Surely it could have cross-checked the official Israeli alibis by consulting Palestinian human rights groups, UN officials, and relevant NGOs based in Gaza. The UN Board of Inquiry investigated seven Israeli attacks, many deadly on UN schools, all but one of which had been converted into emergency shelters. The board found no evidence to sustain, but copious evidence, 
including security guard and other witness testimony. To refute, boilerplate Israeli allegations that Hamas launched rockets from within or in the vicinity of those UN schools attacked by Israel. Mosques Israel destroyed 73 mosques and damaged 130 others during Protective Edge. Amnesty reported that according to Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, at least 83 rockets and mortars were launched from within 25M of mosques during the hostilities, in some cases from directly within the mosque compounds. No other source was cited by Amnesty. It was not the first time Israel targeted mosques in Gaza. It destroyed 30 mosques and damaged 15 more during cast lead. Back then, the UN Human Rights Council mission headed by Richard Goldstone investigated an intentional Israeli missile attack on a mosque that killed at least 15 people attending prayers. It found no evidence that this mosque was used for the storage of weapons or any military activity by Palestinian armed groups. If it quoted official Israeli justifications for the wholesale, indeed, Kristallnacht like, assault on Islamic houses of worship, shouldn't Amnesty at least have noted that in the past these justifications had proven to be spurious? Power plant Israel repeatedly attacked Gaza's only power plant during Protective Edge. The attacks exacerbated already severe electricity blackouts and devastated water, sanitation, and medical services. It was not the first time that Israel had attacked Gaza's only power plant. In 2006, Israel launched multiple missile strikes precisely targeting the plant's transformers. Selim, Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, deemed the 2006 attack a war crime. Amnesty stated that the attack on Gaza's power plant during Protective Edge could amount to a war crime, but then hastened to enter this qualification. An Israeli brigadier general denied that Israel had targeted the power plant intentionally but did not rule out the possibility that it was hit by mistake. If Amnesty quoted the Brigadier General's predictable denial, shouldn't it also have taken note that Israel had intentionally targeted the very same power plant in the past? The power plant's location was well known, the FIDH delegation visiting Gaza after Protective Edge noted. Repeated strikes, and the refusal, by Israel to guarantee the security of the plant do not support the assertion that these strikes were accidental. It is remarkable how out of step amnesty was with human rights delegations that did manage to enter Gaza. Amnesty's biased rules of evidence also tainted its report on Israeli aerial attacks targeting civilian residences during Protective Edge. The report, Families Under the Rubble did conclude that the eight attacks Amnesty investigated were on various grounds unlawful and possibly war crimes. In particular, it found that the loss of civilian lives, injury to civilians and damage to civilian objects appear disproportionate, that is, out of proportion to the likely military advantage of carrying out the attack. Israel itself made no statement about who or what was being targeted or even acknowledged that it carried out these particular attacks. But although Amnesty properly asserted that, the onus is on Israel to provide information concerning the attacks and their intended targets, bizarrely, it took upon itself the burden of ferreting out pretexts that could justify them. The result hovered between satire and scandal. First, Amnesty repeatedly speculated, often on the flimsiest of grounds, that Israel targeted a home because a Hamas militant might have been hiding inside. Second, it didn't ask the obvious question, how would Israel even have been privy to the militant's alleged presence if most neighbors appeared to be in the dark? Third, it detected in each and every attack a possible Gazan militant targeted by Israel. But even Israel's harshest critic would concede that one or another of the civilian homes might have been hit not intentionally, 
but due to an operational mishap. Amnesty was so determined to provide Israel with alibis that it ended up going overboard, as its apologetic preempted even the plausible excuse of human error. The thrust of Amnesty's report families under the rubble conveyed the impression that Israel overwhelmingly targeted Hamas militants in its attacks on civilian homes. It exonerated Israel of the charge that would most appall in the court of public opinion, that the IDF was deliberately targeting civilians and civilian objects. By supplying Israel with pretexts for atrocities that were among the most heinous it committed during Protective Edge, Amnesty conveniently eased the burdens of Israeli Hasbara. It is much easier to rebut the nebulous, subjective, and relative charge of a disproportionate attack than the charge of a deliberate attack on the civilian population. Indeed, the official Israeli post-mortem on Protective Edge repeatedly invoked the numberless caveats attached to the proportionality principle, which in effect demonstrated the near impossibility of nailing down a conviction based on it. But the bigger scandal is this, the impression left by families under the rubble was flat-out false, and amnesty must have known it. In a state of inflamed madness, but also in a sober calculation of its pedagogical value, Israel inflicted a grotesque form of collective punishment as it indiscriminately or intentionally leveled a staggering number of Gazan dwellings. It initially targeted the hearths of Hamas militants, then, as the ground invasion got underway, embarked on a wild wrecking spree, and then, in protective edges de Numa, pulverized four multi-story landmark edifices in Gaza. In its report, Nothing is Immune, Israel's Destruction of Landmark Buildings in Gaza, Amnesty acknowledged that the destruction of these landmark buildings was a form of collective punishment. But it also bracketed off Israel's climactic act as the exception to the rule, t. He attacks are of great significance because they are examples of what appears to have been deliberate destruction and targeting of civilian buildings and property on a large scale, carried out without military necessity. In fact, the vast preponderance of Israeli destruction throughout Protective Edge consisted of collective punishment on a lunatic scale and devoid of military purpose, let alone military necessity. If situated in the full scope of this systematic wreckage, Israel's specific targeting of Hamas militants occupying or deploying from civilian homes amounted at most to the equivalent of statistical error. Could Amnesty have possibly believed that a Hamas militant was secreted in all, or even most, of the 18,000 homes Israel destroyed in Gaza? The ghastly truth of what unfolded in Gaza was captured not in Amnesty's effective whitewash, but instead in the breaking the silence collection of testimonies of IDF soldiers who served in protective edge. In its introduction to families under the rubble, Amnesty exhorted Israel to learn the lessons of this and previous conflicts and change its military doctrine and tactics for fighting in densely populated areas such as Gaza so as to ensure strict compliance with international humanitarian law. But Israel had already learned the lessons of fighting in Gaza. Its military doctrine had already incorporated these lessons, and the IDF brilliantly executed them in this last operation. It required exceptional mental discipline not to notice that ensuring strict compliance with international law wasn't an Israeli consideration, let alone a priority. On the contrary, the whole point of protective edge was to leave families under the rubble. The pretense that not just Israel but Hamas as well committed massive, egregious violations of international law underpinned Amnesty's balanced indictment. Its accusation that Hamas was guilty of flagrant violations of international law, that is, war crimes, fell under two heads, one, Hamas's use of inherently indiscriminate weapons, and, two, 
its indiscriminate or deliberate targeting of Israeli civilians and civilian objects. In addition, Amnesty accused Hamas of violating the rule of international law that required it to take all feasible precautions in order to protect civilians in the combat zone. Each of these will be analyzed in turn. Indiscriminate weapons Amnesty asserted that all the rockets in Hamas's arsenal constituted unguided projectiles which cannot be accurately directed at specific targets. Furthermore, although acknowledging that Hamas did appear to have aimed some mortars at military objectives, Amnesty entered the critical caveat that mortars are still an imprecise weapon and must therefore never be used to target military objectives located amidst civilians or civilian objects. In a second iteration, the legal standard was set yet higher, even in the hands of a highly experienced and trained operator. A mortar round can never be accurate enough to hit a specific point target. Hence, when mortars are used with the intent of striking military targets located in the vicinity of civilian concentrations, but strike civilians or civilian objects, they constitute indiscriminate attacks. Except for handheld weapons, such as pistols, anti-tank missiles, and IEDs, Amnesty effectively declared illegal the whole of Hamas's mostly archaic military arsenal. Indeed, according to Amnesty, international humanitarian law prohibits the use of weapons that are by nature indiscriminate. Using prohibited weapons is a war crime, firing the rocket was a war crime. Thus, in Amnesty's bookkeeping, each time Hamas fired a rocket or mortar shell, it committed a war crime, regardless of whether the weapon struck a civilian or civilian object. Insofar as Hamas fired 7,000 rockets and mortar shells at Israel, it would have, on Amnesty's reckoning, committed perhaps as many as 7,000 war crimes, even if only six civilians in Israel were killed and only one Israeli house was destroyed. Such a calculation might appear to go some distance toward vindicating Amnesty's balanced indictment, but only at the price of turning international law, or at any rate Amnesty's construal and application of it, into an object deserving of derision. If Hamas's mere use of these weapons constituted war crimes, it's also cause for wonder why Amnesty took the trouble to investigate the ensuing civilian death and destruction. One might think that after a bill of indictment already tallying thousands of war crimes, supplementary documentation of war crimes would be redundant, akin to beating a dead horse. But there's another anomaly as well. Amnesty alluded in passing to the fact that Israeli violations of international law during Protective Edge included attacks using munitions such as artillery, which cannot be precisely targeted on very densely populated residential areas. In fact, had Amnesty bothered to pursue this line of inquiry, it would have discovered that Israel fired no less than 20,000 unguided high-explosive artillery shells into Gaza, an estimated 95% into or near populated civilian areas. The Israeli artillery shells were doubly indiscriminate, they couldn't be directed at and their blast and fragmentation effects couldn't be limited to a specific target. Thus, on the one hand, an attack with a 155mm Doer howitzer was technically reckoned a hit if the shell landed within 46 meters of the target, a far cry from Amnesty's specific point target threshold and, anyhow, as the breaking the silence testimonies confirmed, the artillery was frequently fired with abandon, while on the other hand, the expected casualty-producing radius of each 155mm artillery shell was about 300 meters. The official Israeli post-mortem on protective edge purported that, in the overwhelming majority of cases, Israel fired high-explosive artillery shells into open areas devoid of civilian presence. But it also stated that, 
rather than utilizing the less populated areas of the Gaza Strip where they operate during lulls in hostilities. Hamas had relocated its assets and operations to build up civilian areas in order to shield them from IDF attack. If this authoritative Israeli publication was to be believed, Israel must have deliberately fired the overwhelming majority of 20,000 high-explosive artillery shells into empty spaces devoid of military value. Meanwhile, to go by Amnesty's bookkeeping, wherein each use of an indiscriminate weapon constitutes a war crime, Israel committed nearly three times as many war crimes as Hamas just in its use of artillery shells, although one would never know it from Amnesty's reports. It was symptomatic of Amnesty's extreme bias that whereas it meticulously inventoried Hamas's military arsenal, the reader was left utterly clueless about the quantity and quality of firepower Israel visited on Gaza. How many bombs, and how much tonnage, did Israel drop? How many missile attacks did Israel launch? How many tank and artillery shells did it expend? One searched Amnesty's reports on Protective Edge in vain for answers to these basic questions, even though these data were publicly accessible. A juxtaposition of the arsenals each side deployed would have made a mockery of Amnesty's pretensions to balance. If war connotes an armed conflict between more or less evenly matched belligerents, then what unfolded during Protective Edge did not remotely rise to this threshold. Hamas's oh-so-criminal primitive projectiles vanished to negative invisibility beside Israel's ever-so-legal high-tech, killing machine. Indiscriminate and deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian objects amnesty did not criminally indict Hamas, just for deploying indiscriminate weapons. It also, and as a discreet line in its ledger, criminally indicted Hamas for deploying these indiscriminate weapons in order to launch indiscriminate attacks and attacks targeting civilians. Put otherwise, Hamas stood charged with deploying indiscriminate weapons and also for deploying these weapons in order to launch intentionally indiscriminate and targeted attacks on civilians and civilian objects. Article 51 of the Additional Protocols to the Geneva Conventions prohibits indiscriminate attacks. It defines such attacks, inter alia, as those which are not directed at a specific military objective, or those which employ a method or means of combat which cannot be directed at a specific military objective. Thus, both these prohibitions are subsumed under the single rubric, indiscriminate attacks. If an indiscriminate weapon is used, or if a weapon is fired indiscriminately, or if an indiscriminate weapon is fired indiscriminately, it constitutes one and the same war crime of an indiscriminate attack. Amnesty, however, clefted into separate and distinct crimes. It exhorted Hamas to end the use of inherently indiscriminate weapons such as unguided rockets, denounce attacks targeting civilians and indiscriminate attacks. The value of each Hamas projectile in Amnesty's bill of indictment accordingly doubled. Hamas committed a war crime each time it made use of an indiscriminate weapon and also each time it launched an attack, either indiscriminate or targeting civilians, with an indiscriminate weapon. That neat linguistic subtlety would have enabled Amnesty to boost its indictment of Hamas to as many as 14,000 war crimes, for those who were still counting, even if, still, only six civilians in Israel were killed and only one Israeli house was destroyed. Consider further Amnesty's criminal indictment of Hamas for targeting civilian areas. It reported that, in many cases, Hamas was, or declared it was, directing its projectiles towards Israeli civilians and civilian objects, that it directed them at specific Israeli communities. If Amnesty determined that Hamas breached the laws of war by deploying rockets that cannot be accurately targeted at specific targets, it's hard to make out how Amnesty could also charge Hamas with targeting 
civilian communities when it fired them, how does one target an inherently untargetable weapon? If Hamas publicly declared its intention to target a civilian community, it might be guilty of bluster, but not of a deliberate attack, it was, on Amnesty's own evidence, incapable of launching a deliberate attack. Still, it might be contended, weren't Hamas rockets sufficiently accurate to target a large civilian community, if not a specific object within it? But then it puzzles why so many Hamas rockets landed in vacant areas away from Israeli conurbations. Of the 5,000 Hamas rockets fired at Israel, well under 1,000 came within range of Iron Dome, which was deployed around Israel's major population centers. It's not very persuasive that Hamas was targeting empty space, if so many Hamas rockets landed in empty space, it's because they couldn't be targeted. What's more, Amnesty accused Hamas of deliberately targeting an Israeli civilian community not only when that was its declared intention, but also when its declared target was a military object located in or around the community, these, Hamas, statements most of which specified the time of each attack, the community, or in rarer cases, the military base, targeted, and the munition used indicate that these attacks were directed at civilians or civilian objects. If, according to Amnesty, a Hamas press release served as proof of intent, it perplexes how it proved intent to target civilians even when it manifestly eschewed such an intent. In one instance, Hamas verged on scoring a trifecta of war crimes as Amnesty indicted it for firing mortar shells at a kibbutz. The mortar was an imprecise weapon, and it was a direct attack on civilians or civilian objects, and, even if the attack had targeted IDF troops or equipment in the vicinity of the kibbutz, the attack would still have been indiscriminate. The most extravagant entry in Amnesty's charge sheet, however, zeroed in on a rocket misfire that killed 13 Gazan civilians. Hamas was saddled with a foursome of war crimes. It was an indiscriminate attack using a prohibited weapon which may well have been fired from a residential area within the Gaza Strip and may have been intended to strike civilians in Israel, emphases added. It would unduly tax the forbearance of the reader to parse the incongruities of this ejaculation. For one, indiscriminate attack, against whom? In any case, however many multipliers amnesty applied to Hamas's war crimes, the sum total would still pale beside the horror Israel inflicted. Failure to take all feasible precautions international humanitarian law obliges parties to a conflict to take all feasible precautions or precautions to the maximum feasible extent, in order to protect civilians and civilian objects under their control against the dangers resulting from military operations. One such precaution is to avoid locating military objectives within or near densely populated areas. The critical caveat, of course, is feasible. The inclusion of this adjectival qualifier in binding law reflected the concern of small and densely populated countries which would find it difficult to separate civilians and civilian objects from military objectives, these countries stressed the fact that the principle to avoid locating military objectives within or near densely populated areas was difficult to apply. The provision has generally been construed to mandate precautions which are practicable or practically possible taking into account all circumstances ruling at the time, including humanitarian and military considerations. Therefore, to plausibly indict Hamas for violating the precautions of provision, it was incumbent upon amnesty to demonstrate at a minimum one of two things either, one, in each specific combat situation, Hamas had a feasible alternative, taking into account all circumstances ruling at the time. But as Amnesty itself noted, Israeli authorities' denial of access to the Gaza Strip 
has made documenting and verifying specific violations by Hamas more difficult. Indeed, it would be difficult to assess from a remote venue whether, in the circumstances ruling at the time of each alleged breach of the precautions principle, Hamas did have another option, or, two, even if general circumstances ruling at the time rendered it difficult to apply the precautions principle. Gaza is among the most densely populated places on earth. Hamas still put civilians and civilian objects at gratuitous risk. How did Amnesty negotiate these evidentiary hurdles? It purported that oh, there is substantial evidence that some of the military operations and conduct by Hamas violated their obligation to take all feasible precautions to avoid and minimize harm. It did not, however, adduce such evidence. Instead, it simply discarded the critical feasibility caveat. It will be recalled that in one incident after another, Amnesty conscientiously searched out, often to the point of absurdity, an alibi that effectively exonerated Israel of the charge of targeting civilians and civilian dwellings. In the case of Hamas, however, it did precisely the reverse. Instead of investigating whether or not, in each alleged violation of the precautions principle, Hamas had a feasible alternative, Amnesty found prima facie evidence of a violation of the precautions principle whenever and wherever it could be shown, however tenuously, that Hamas was fighting in proximity to civilians. See Table 9. But such a proof in and of itself proved nothing. Fighting in proximity to civilians is not the standard of illegality set by international law. In each particular incident, one would have to determine whether other practicable or practically possible options for resisting existed and what were the circumstances ruling at the time. In its previous report on Operation Cast Lead, Amnesty did take into account these factors and, as a result, a nuanced, genuinely balanced picture emerged. But in its assessment of Hamas's military tactics during Protective Edge, Amnesty jettisoned its surgical kit in favor of a sledgehammer. It would be the wonder of wonders if Hamas wasn't resisting much of the time during Protective Edge in proximity. To the civilian population, it was Gaza, after all. And in fact, Amnesty was not indifferent to this dilemma. Yet the solution it proposed in unlawful and deadly cannot but bewilder. It should be noted that even though the overall population density in the Gaza Strip is very high, particularly in and around Gaza City, significant areas within the 365 square kilometers of territory are not residential, and conducting hostilities or launching munitions from these areas presents a lower risk of endangering Palestinian civilians. In laying out this, as it were, feasible alternative, amnesty omitted the critical factual and legal context. Open areas are relatively scarce in Gaza. Fighting in urban areas per se is not a violation of international humanitarian law. A party to the conflict cannot be expected to arrange its armed forces and installations in such a way as to make them conspicuous to the benefit of the adversary. But even setting aside these far from trivial considerations, Amnesty's feasible alternative would still invite ridicule. On the one hand, since 2005 Israel had maintained its occupation of Gaza largely by remote control. Modern technology now permits effective control from outside the occupied territory, and this is what Israel has established. Distinguished international jurist John Dugard observes. Before Israel's physical withdrawal from Gaza in 2005, Palestinian acts of violent resistance were directed at Israeli forces within the territory. This was during the Second Intifada. Since then, Palestinian militants have been obliged to take their resistance to the occupation and the illegal siege of Gaza to Israel itself. The alternative is to do nothing, a course no occupied people in history has ever taken. 
It is unusual for an occupied people to take its resistance outside the occupied territory. But it is also unusual for an occupying power to maintain a brutal occupation from outside the territory. On the other hand, Amnesty declared nearly all projectiles in Hamas's arsenal illegal. It follows that if Israel established its control of Gaza from afar, and if Hamas's projectiles were illegal, then Hamas couldn't be conducting hostilities or launching munitions to end the occupation and still pass legal muster. The long and short of Amnesty's counsel was this, in order to resist Israel's inhuman and illegal occupation, compounded by its illegal and inhuman blockade, and punctuated periodically by its large-scale massacres, Hamas militants should have gathered, en masse and unarmed, in an open field. Still, to facilitate and expedite matters, shouldn't they also have lined up like ducks? But there's more. Just as it applied a multiplier to indiscriminate attacks by Hamas, so Amnesty also verbally inflated Hamas's violations of the precautions a provision. What began in unlawful and deadly as a sum and a certain cases in which Hamas breached this provision, morphed into far from isolated and not infrequent violations, until in the report's conclusion, Hamas stood accused of routinely of violating the precautions a provision and a consistent failure to abide by it. Meanwhile, it was no less instructive what Amnesty elected to pass over in silence. In Ashkelon, Steret, Beer Sheva and other cities in the south of Israel, as well as elsewhere in the country, military bases and other installations are located in or around residential areas, including kibbutzim and villages, Amnesty breezily reported. During Operation Protective Edge, there were more Israeli military positions and activities than usual close to civilian areas in the south of Israel, and Israeli forces launched daily artillery and other attacks into Gaza from these areas along Gaza's perimeter. But according to the precautions of provision, governments should endeavor to find places away from densely populated areas to site fixed military objectives such as military bases, and, as regards mobile objectives, care should be taken in particular during the conflict to avoid placing troops, equipment, or transports in densely populated areas. Israel was far from lacking in empty spaces, it could also choose from a dazzling spectrum of weapons, which could be launched from virtually any terrain, altitude, and distance. Didn't Israel, then, flagrantly violate the precautions of provision? Apparently not, according to Amnesty, which uttered not a word of criticism. The point at issue is not whether Hamas breached international law during Protective Edge. Some fighters probably did seek out the protection of civilian objects, such as dwellings and mosques, in Gaza. Although by the time Israel blasted the 10,000th civilian edifice, it must have been brought home that they provided no deterrence. On the contrary, Israel would have relished the prospect of, so to speak, targeting two birds with one stone, a Hamas fighter and a civilian object. The pertinent question, however, is whether Hamas's violations were remotely on the same scale as the violations by Israel. The subtext of Amnesty's presentation, which carefully balanced the death and destruction inflicted as well as the criminal culpability of both parties, conveyed that it was. But the pretense that the pitiable spree of bottle rockets directed at Israel compared to the hecatomb visited on Gaza is materially ludicrous and morally a travesty. The question then becomes, how did Amnesty manage to prove the unprovable? It did so by acting less as a neutral arbiter and more as the defense counsel for Israel. It made the best case for Israel by obscuring factual evidence that incriminated it, adducing speculative evidence that exonerated it, 
and applying a lax legal standard that gave Israel the benefit of a doubt when it didn't deserve it. It made the worst case for Hamas by obscuring factual evidence that vindicated it, adducing speculative evidence that incriminated it, and applying an over-the-top legal standard that inflated its criminal culpability and left it no other military option, if it wanted to stay within the law, save to lie down and die. If Amnesty sustained its case for a, a balanced a verdict, that's because the case was rigged in advance. After the UN Human Rights Council issued its report on Operation Protective Edge, Amnesty International released another report of its own, Black Friday, carnage in Rafah during 2014 Israel-Gaza conflict. Its belated publication precluded it from having an impact on the critical UN report. Still, this fifth and final Amnesty installment was unusually ambitious, and on this ground alone merits close inspection. Black Friday, homed in on Israel's resort to massive violence against the civilian population of Rafah between the 1st and the 4th of August, 2014. The assault occurred after an Israeli officer, Lt. Hadar Golden, was reportedly captured alive by Hamas fighters. In conjunction with Forensic Architecture, a research team based at the University of London, Amnesty made use of sundry cutting-edge technologies to reconstruct with striking visual effect the sequence of events on the ground. Th's analysis, however, will focus only on Amnesty's written text. The packaging of Black Friday set it off from Amnesty's prior quartet of reports on Protective Edge. For the record, before it issued Black Friday, Amnesty had already read this author's analysis of its earlier publications. It is not known if and how this critique influenced Amnesty's presentation in its last report. Amnesty no longer pretended to an elusive balance. In the a background is section of this report, the death and destruction in Gaza during Protective Edge fills five times as much space as the death and destruction in Israel. A pair of incendiary subtitles, Carnage in Rafah during 2014 Israel-Gaza conflict, on the cover page, and Israel's mass killing of civilians in Rafah during 2014 Gaza conflict, on the table of contents page, likewise registered a palpable shift in tone. Moreover, Black Friday repeatedly gestured to the input of Gaza's major human rights organizations, naming in particular and conspicuously the Palestinian Center for Human Rights and Al Mezen Center for Human Rights. Nonetheless, the core of Black Friday comprising a factual presentation and legal assessment of Israel's violations of international law, carried over the apologetic analytical framework of Amnesty's prior reports. If the offense graded more deeply this time around, it was because of the density of the crimes committed in Rafa. All the same, it should be noted straightaway that whereas Amnesty conveyed the impression, not least by the extraordinary investment it made in chronicling what happened, that the bloodbath in Rafa marked a sharp departure from protective edge as a whole, in fact, as the breaking the silence testimonies confirmed, although the wanton destruction there might have been quantitatively worse, it did not differ in kind from what unfolded elsewhere in Gaza. The Israeli bombardment of Rafah commenced after a firefight in which Hamas apparently captured a live Lieutenant Hadar Golden. Israeli political culture does not abide its combatants being held in captivity, but it also recoils at prisoner exchanges, which invariably entail the release of many Palestinians held in Israeli jails. To reconcile these conflicting impulses, Israel codified a macabre military doctrine, dubbed the Hannibal Directive, that effectively sanctioned the killing of its own combatants if they fell into enemy hands and could not be rescued, on the tacit principle that the death of captured soldiers is preferable to them being taken alive. 
It could hardly be doubted that the IDF intended not to rescue Golden but to kill him. It didn't launch a pinpoint commando raid, instead, it turned the area which it believed to be the location of Lieutenant Golden into an inferno. As an aside, it's hard to fathom the ethos of a nation that goes into deep mourning when one of its soldiers is held in captivity, yet prefers that he be killed rather than captured alive. In any event, when Golden was taken prisoner by Hamas on the morning of August 1 and his whereabouts could not be tracked, Israel unleashed maximum firepower in Rafah's densely populated civilian areas in order to kill him. Even after it became clear from forensic evidence that Golden was dead, however, the murderous assault continued, although at a somewhat diminished intensity, as an act of revenge and to administer a lesson. The assault on Rafa unfolded in the near absence of armed resistance. Hardly any return fire was reported, amnesty found, and the IDF suffered no casualties, as Ujets, drones, helicopters, and artillery, were, raining fire at pedestrians and vehicles at the intersections, indiscriminately hitting cars, ambulances, motorbikes, and pedestrians, while, civilians attempting to flee the inferno were hit by missiles and artillery. More than 2,000 bombs, including one-ton bombs, missiles, and artillery shells were fired on the first day. 1,000 shells within three hours of Golden's capture. By the end of the attack on August 4, at least 200 civilians had been killed and 2,600 homes completely or partially destroyed. In the lucid idiom of law, Israel committed a crime against humanity in Rafah, except that whereas the factual record just recapitulated was culled directly from Black Friday. Amnesty's legal assessment veered in an altogether different direction. It indicted Israel for, one, indiscriminate attacks, that is, for recklessly hitting civilians or civilian objects as it targeted military objectives, two, disproportionate attacks, that is, for causing excessive collateral damage to civilians or civilian objects as it targeted military objectives, and, three, a failure to take all feasible precautions in order to minimize incidental harm to the civilian population, in the course of military operations. It was only in the rarest of instances that Amnesty indicted Israel, if gingerly, for targeting civilians and civilian objects, even as its own evidence attested that the murderous assault on Rafa unfolded in the near-total absence of a legitimate military objective. But, it might be contended, whereas Hamas returned hardly any fire, still, in the initial phase of the Rafah assault, liquidating Golden constituted a legitimate military objective. Couldn't that goal justify a portion, if not the full magnitude, of the firepower Israel unleashed? For an objective to qualify as legitimate, however, its achievement must confer a concrete and direct military advantage. It would be a most bizarre linguistic usage to construe Israel's calculated killing of its own soldier, as conferring on it a military advantage. The UN Human Rights Council report on Protective Edge dispatched the notion that, abstract political and long-term strategic considerations, such as a potential prisoner swap in the future, could legitimately be factored into the calculus of military advantage, the advantage, it underscored, must be concrete and direct. It follows that the inferno Israel created in Rafa in order to kill Golden could not be legally comprehended, in the ambit of an indiscriminate attack, a disproportionate attack, or a failure to take all feasible precautions each of which presupposes the existence of a legitimate military target. Inasmuch as Rafa's densely populated civilian neighborhoods were the object of saturation bombardment during the manhunt phase, and inasmuch as this bombardment occurred amid only scattered return fire, which wasn't even the object of the bombardment, the dispositive legal principle was the deliberate targeting of civilians and civilian objects. 
Still, it might also be contended, Israel's intention was to kill Golden, not to inflict death and destruction on Rafa's civilian population. But in law, the doer of an act must be taken to have intended its natural and foreseeable consequences. The natural and foreseeable consequences of bombarding Rafa's civilian neighborhoods were massive death of civilians and massive destruction of civilian objects. Even if Israel's avowed goal was to kill Golden, the bombardment still constituted, as a matter of law, an intentional attack on civilians and civilian objects. Categorizing the Rafa massacre as a disproportionate attack, an indiscriminate attack, or a failure to take all feasible precautions, on account of Israel's intent to kill Golden, amounted to legitimizing the wholly illegitimate goal of launching an armed attack on a civilian population, in order to preempt a future prisoner swap. It is true that to depict the Rafa Inferno as an intentional attack on a civilian population, although correct as a matter of law, does not yet encapsulate the full reality of the manhunt phase. The correct formulation would then go something like, an intentional, targeted attack on a civilian population in pursuit of an illegitimate military objective. If the phrasing is ungainly, that's because the reality it endeavors to capture is so deviant. It's not every day that a state carries out a massacre in order to kill its own soldier in order to preempt a future prisoner exchange. But what difference does it make how Amnesty categorized and depicted the Rafa massacre if it's still found that Israel committed war crimes? The answer is this. Distilled to its essence, Protective Edge was designed, as the Goldstone Report put it in the context of Operation Cast Lead. 2008-9, to punish, humiliate and terrorize a civilian population. The other major atrocities during Protective Edge, Kuzae, Shujaia, manifestly lacked a military rationale. The Rafa massacre appeared to be different, as it purportedly traced back to a military objective. The fact that Amnesty's most ambitious report focused on the Israeli intention to kill Golden and its concomitant, the Hannibal Directive that triggered the bloody manhunt, conveyed the distinct impression that Protective Edge was a military operation gone awry, wrong, even criminal, but still, understandable, in military terms. But in fact, not even the initial manhunt phase of the Rafa massacre, properly understood, could be regarded as a military operation. Even as Golden's death was confirmed, probably by the end of the third hour of the first day, the Israeli military continued its attacks in Rafa, not in pursuit of a so-called military objective but to show them, settle accounts, and extract, sick, a price, amnesty, quoting Israeli soldiers. If, as Israeli officers maintain, there were no serious firefights, Amnesty ultra-cautiously speculated. The question arises as to whether the army's use of massive firepower was in fact intended to take revenge on Rafa. In other words, the Rafa assault emerged after the manhunt phase as a straight-up massacre. The premeditated carnage in Rafa and mass killing of civilians in Rafa comprised in its parts, including the initial manhunt phase, and as a totality, an incontrovertible war crime, as Israel targeted civilians and civilian objects in the absence of a legitimate military objective, apart from desultory return fire, and also a crime against humanity, as it launched, a widespread or systematic attack directed against, a, civilian population, Rome Statute, Article 7. But instead of stating the obvious, Amnesty chose to systematically occlude the terroristic essence of the Rafa massacre by churning out one Israeli alibi after another. It stated that after Golden was officially pronounced dead, the Israeli army continued the destruction of greenhouses and homes, apparently as part of the search for Lieutenant Golden or his remains. It did not adduce a smidgen of evidence in support of this speculation. 
while the report itself documented that Israel sought via its wanton destruction to exact revenge and administer a lesson. Indeed, did it forget that these IDF tactics constituted standard operating procedure across Gaza throughout Protective Edge, independent of Golden's fate? Amnesty then went on to observe, the military did not manage to retrieve the remains of Lt. Golden's body. Heavy bombing of tunnel areas reduced the likelihood of finding him. But if heavy bombing reduced the likelihood of finding Golden's remains, then maybe retrieving his remains wasn't the bombing's objective, while taking revenge was. What's more, Amnesty parsed the Hannibal Directive, which underpinned the four-day assault, under the subhead, shift in proportionality. But inasmuch as killing Golden wasn't a legitimate military objective, and neither revenge nor deter future capture attempts, Amnesty's phrases, could be construed as a legitimate military objective. Of what possible relevance was the proportionality principle, which presupposes such an objective? Black Friday, further noted in this, shift in proportionality, section. Post-conflict briefings to soldiers and public statements of Israeli officers suggest that the high death toll and massive destruction were not seen as regrettable side effects but achievements or accomplishments that would keep Gaza quiet for five years. An intelligence corps soldier quoted senior army officers saying, 2,000 dead and 11,000 wounded, half a million refugees, decades worth of destruction harm to lots of senior Hamas members and to their homes, to their families. These were stated as accomplishments so that no one would doubt that what we did during this period was meaningful. Another Israeli soldier told Breaking the Silence that the aim in bombings was to deter them, scare them, wear them down psychologically. These statements indicate an intention to generate material damage as deterrent. If the professed purpose of the assault on Rafa was to achieve a high death toll and massive destruction, in order to shatter the will of Gaza to resist, it wasn't a disproportionate attack but unambiguously a terror assault on the civilian population. Black Friday assembled 15 case studies in which civilians were killed during the four-day assault on Rafa. These case studies, far from shedding light on Amnesty's perverse conclusions, bewilder and appall in their resort to legalistic gymnastics that evade and obscure the obvious. However tedious it might appear, in order to expose Amnesty's disingenuousness each case study must be individually examined. The Israeli massacre in Rafah constituted in its parts and as a totality an intentional attack on a civilian population. In order to achieve a dual objective, one, to kill a captured Israeli soldier so as to preempt a future prisoner swap, which wasn't a legitimate military objective, and, two, a desire for revenge, to teach a lesson to, or to punish the population of Rafa for the capture of Lt. Golden, Black Friday, conclusion, which, a fortiori, wasn't a legitimate military objective. Yet, Amnesty found that Israel directly targeted civilians and civilian objects in only two of the 15 cases it investigated. In the report's comprehensive factual conclusion, the maximum Amnesty would allow was that, in some cases, there are indications that, Israeli military forces, directly fired at and killed civilians, including some who were fleeing. In some cases they warned civilians to stay in their homes which were then bombarded. In the other 13 incidents, Amnesty neither reported return fire nor adduced creditable evidence of a legitimate military target. Instead, it conjured wildly speculative scenarios that enabled it to invoke legal principles, distinction, between civilians and combatants, proportionality, precautions, presupposing a military objective, or it invoked legal principles presupposing a military objective without even bothering to speculate on the objective. 
It might be argued that Amnesty entertained so many of Israel's premises, or premises favorable to Israel, in order to show that even if one were to accept those premises, Israel would still be legally culpable. The upshot, however, of such a preemptive strategy, if preemptive strategy it was, was that it winded up misrepresenting what happened and letting Israel off the hook on the more serious legal charges. The ghastly, heartrending stories assembled in Amnesty's case studies leave little room for doubt that far from being a military operation, the inferno Israel created in Rafa was a terror assault on a defenseless people. And yet, in its report's comprehensive legal conclusion, the maximum amnesty would allow was that, to the extent that some of the violations committed by the Israeli army in Rafah may have been carried out as part of a widespread or systematic attack on the civilian population, in furtherance of a state policy, they may also constitute a crime against humanity. However, the evidence collected in Black Friday points ineluctably to the conclusion that not just as some instances a may, but the whole of this murderous assault did constitute a crime against humanity. Although it invested considerable resources in Black Friday, Amnesty ultimately, and to its eternal shame, recoiled from its own factual findings and delivered up a legal whitewash. It cannot be seriously doubted that Amnesty International's reports on Operation Protective Edge lacked objectivity and professionalism. They betrayed a systematic bias against Hamas and in favor of Israel. They also registered a steep regression from the exacting standard amnesty set in its reports spanning the past two decades, on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Amnesty might be tempted to respond, if an acknowledged supporter of Palestinian human rights, such as this writer, criticizes its pro-Israel bias while Israel criticizes its pro-Palestinian bias, then it must be doing something right. But that's as if to say, if one gets attacked by the flat earthers at one extreme and the round earthers at the other, then it proves the oblong earthers must be telling the truth. The only valid criterion is what the facts themselves show, the imputed bias of the bearer of those facts is beside the point. Judging by this standard, and the mass of evidence assembled in this chapter of its dereliction of duty, Amnesty would have been hard-pressed to defend its performance after Protective Edge. When it did accept the challenge, what most impressed was the feebleness of Amnesty's reply. There is a separate but still critical question, what happened? In the absence of a smoking gun, one can only speculate on the springs of Amnesty's abrupt change of course. It can probably better be understood if located in a broader political context. In recent years, Israel has been slowly but steadily losing the battle for public opinion in the West. The proactive and principled stance of credible human rights organizations in exposing Israeli violations of Palestinian human rights has played a catalytic role in this historic shift. The high water mark was set after Operation Cast Lead, when scores of human rights reports meticulously documented Israeli crimes during the assault, and it appeared as if, finally, Israel might be held legally accountable for its crimes. Confronted by this grave, palpable threat, Israel and its powerful international lobby set out to reverse the tide by combating what was dubbed lawfare, that is, isolating Israel through the language of human rights. A furious and ruthless campaign was mounted, replete with smears, slanders, and strong-arm tactics, targeting critics of Israel's human rights record. The most notorious casualty of this juggernaut was Richard Goldstone. A Jewish Zionist judge with impeccable professional credentials was forced to deliver a humiliating highly public mea culpa that damaged his career and tarnished his reputation for life. Goldstone's fate served as a cautionary tale for the human rights community, none of Israel's critics was beyond its reach, none was safe from its retribution. In short order, 
respected jurists Christian Tamuschat and William Shabas were devoured by the Israeli maw. If any doubts lingered after Goldstone's fall from grace, the handwriting was now on the wall. If you, or someone close to you, had skeletons in the closet, the prudent move was not to go too hard on Israel or, wiser still, to cross Israel off your agenda. Undeniably, other factors came into play. The human rights reports on caste lead ultimately died a slow death in the UN bureaucracy as the United States, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority colluded to kill them. It appeared pointless to churn out more human rights reports if they too would be consigned to oblivion, not least by the victims themselves, or at any rate by their official representatives. By the time Israel launched Protective Edge, public opinion had also grown inured to Israel's periodic massacres. Minutely documenting the carnage seemed less urgent, as fewer people any longer harbored doubt that Israel was capable of such brutality. In the meantime, as the Arab Spring metamorphosed into the Arab Winter, the ensuing regional upheaval and attendant human rights catastrophe dwarfed and marginalized the Palestine question. But the intimidation factor was almost certainly the overriding one in Amnesty's volte face. Indeed, Israel lobby groups, such as NGO Monitor, had openly set their crosshairs on Amnesty. Besides the flawed reports it issued on Protective Edge, a vote on anti-Semitism by Amnesty's UK branch registered the heat it was feeling. All the available evidence pointed to the conclusion that anti-Semitism was at most a marginal phenomenon in British life. According to survey results, well under 10% of the population held a negative opinion of Jews, whereas 60% held a negative opinion of Roma slash Gypsies and 40% a negative opinion of Muslims. The manifest purpose of the periodic campaigns bewailing a new anti-Semitism has been to stifle criticism of Israel's atrocious human rights record. Yet Amnesty's UK board signed on to, while the membership narrowly defeated, 468 to 461, a 2015 resolution calling for an Amnesty UK campaign against resurgent anti-Semitism. If amnesty capitulated to political blackmail, it also reflected the fact that for the first time, it was forced to fend for itself in the jungle of Israel-Palestine politics. Up until Protective Edge, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, HRW, typically issued corroborative or complementary reports slash position papers on potentially explosive issues. Each had the back of the other, each could count on the other for moral political support. Both organizations issued reports documenting Israel's pervasive practice of torture during the First Intifada. Both issued statements supporting the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes in Israel. Both documented Israeli war crimes during Operation Defensive Shield, 2002. Both issued damning reports on caste lead. But HRW basically sat on the sidelines after Protective Edge. It was missing in action. If Amnesty hadn't published five reports on Protective Edge, this chapter couldn't have documented its multitudinous transgressions. If this chapter was silent on HRW, that's because HRW was effectively silent on Protective Edge. It will be left to moralists to decide which was worse. Amnesty's sin of commission or HRW's sin of omission. It would be hard to exaggerate the damage wreaked by Amnesty's reversal. Supporters of Palestinian human rights and a just and lasting peace have come to depend on Amnesty as a credible corrective to Israeli Hasbara and pro Israel media bias. The abdication of its professional mandate could not but dismay and dishearten. Amnesty's worst sin, however, ran much deeper. Its abandonment of a forsaken people suffering under an illegal and inhuman blockade punctuated by recurrent, ever-escalating massacres, 
its open invitation to Israel to commit new and worse massacres, in the sure knowledge that human rights organizations have been cowed into reticence. If only for the sake of the people of Gaza, one hopes that amnesty, as well as HRW, will yet find its way. Once Israel successfully browbeat the international human rights community into submission, the only remaining chink in its armor was domestic human rights organizations. Of these, breaking the silence most aroused Israel's wrath. The soldier eyewitness testimonies it had compiled after each of Israel's massacres in Gaza were as unimpeachable as they were devastating. Israel consequently set out in a very public way to destroy breaking the silence. I and the United States. The slander campaign was spearheaded by former Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz, who accused the group of doing tremendous damage to Israel because they are not telling the truth. 126 Should it neutralize breaking the silence, Israel will have cleared the last obstacle on its path to committing future massacres in Gaza. Henceforth, no one will be around to compellingly document its crimes for a Western audience. However reputable and reliable Palestinian human rights organizations might be, unfortunately and unfairly, they lack credibility among the broad public in the West. In the operations to come, Israel will be able to carry on as it pleases, emboldened in the knowledge that it can do so with guaranteed impunity. It's a new sequence of catastrophes waiting to happen. It wasn't just reputable human rights organizations that failed Gaza. The statements issued by UNICEF during Protective Edge by and large disingenuously balanced the operation's impact on Gazan and Israeli children, the escalating violence in Gaza and Israel threatens devastating harm for children on all sides. Children are bearing the brunt of the worsening violence in Gaza and Israel. The violence in Gaza claims even more young lives and its toll on children on both sides deepens. Another school in Gaza has come under fire. Children in Israel have lived with the threat of indiscriminate attacks. The deaths of children on all sides constitute further tragic evidence of the terrible impact the conflict is having on children, and their families on all sides. Then, despite the pleas of Save the Children, War Child, and even UNICEF, as well as a dozen Palestinian human rights organizations and Selim, Israel was crossed off a 2015 UN list of grave violators of children's rights after top UN officials buckled under political pressure, from Israel. One by one, a phalanx of humanitarian institutions melted like butter after Protective Edge as Israel turned up the heat. In the midst of Protective Edge, venerable British medical journal The Lancet had published an open letter, signed by a score of medical professionals that decried Israel's aggression and massacre in Gaza. The letter provoked a firestorm of protest, charge, and countercharge that was played out in the journal's pages over the next four months. Although he had to endure a barrage of ad hominems, editor in chief Richard Horton initially stood his ground as the journal ran an editorial describing Gaza as a prison, cataloging the carnage that attended Israel's assault, and defending the decision to publish the letter. But as Israel's far-flung network of operatics escalated the smear campaign and threatened a boycott, Horton succumbed. What ensued was a strange echo of Paul on the road to Damascus combined with Mao's cultural revolution. In a Goldstone-style ritual of self-abasement, Horton embarked on a trip to Israel that was a turning point for me, a revelatory experience. He reached the epiphany that he had been badly misinformed, the Israeli reality as he now experienced it was an inspiring model of partnership between Jews and Arabs, a vision for a peaceful and productive future between peoples, and then delivered a public self-criticism pledging inter alia that he would never publish a letter like that again. He apparently uttered not a single word critical of Israel during his stay, or afterward. 
but he did additionally find time to attend a lecture by and personally converse with Israeli philosopher Asa Kasher, who wrote Israel's Code of Military Ethics and had earlier been deeply impressed with the courage of Israeli soldiers in caste lead. Horton proceeded to express immense respect for the point of view that Israeli combatants took extreme precautions to prevent civilian casualties and put themselves at personal risk to this end during Israel's latest operation. He went on to ponder, in that situation how would I behave? It's very easy from an armchair in London to be critical, and much more difficult when you're in a combat zone to live out your ideals. Isn't that every war criminal's defense? It's hard to decide whether this cringeworthy profile in pusillanimity disgusts more in its unctuousness or its banality. Shortly thereafter, Jacques de Mayo, International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, representative in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, gave a speech in Jerusalem on humanitarian law. He not only didn't criticize Protective Edge but instead singled out Israel for praise, h. Humanitarian access in Israel and the O-T, occupied territories, is, in a comparative sense, outstandingly good. In fact, I can think of no other context where the ICRC operates, where the access for humanitarian organizations is as good as it is here. De Mayo sang this groveling paean to his host even as Israel repeatedly blocked access by humanitarian organizations, including the Red Cross, even as it mercilessly targeted first responders on rescue missions, and even as the Red Cross had itself firmly condemned, ed. This extremely alarming series of attacks against humanitarian workers, ambulances, and hospitals, during Israel's latest operation. It would not be the last time de Mayo plumbed the depths of moral depravity as he whitewashed Israeli crimes. Meanwhile, former International Criminal Court Chief Prosecutor Luis Moreno Ocampo has in recent years reinvented himself as Israel's chief counsel. On his periodic trafficking to Israel, he heaped praise on its respect for the rule of law purported that the legal status of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories was a completely new and open question, even as the 15 judges on the International Court of Justice unanimously declared them illegal more than a decade ago, and alleged that as a matter of law, protective edge was highly complicated. It's unclear exactly where the complication lay. Was it when Israel dropped more than 101 ton bombs on Shujaaya, or when it indiscriminately fired 20,000 high explosive artillery shells in densely populated civilian areas? Was it when Israel methodically razed to the ground thousands of civilian homes, or when it fired on civilians carrying white flags? Was it when Israel targeted clearly marked ambulances or when it targeted clearly marked civilian shelters, even after explicitly promising not to target them? His Israeli audiences no doubt warmed up to Moreno Ocampo's soothing words, whereas the informed reader cannot but shudder in revulsion at these wanton acts of criminal prostitution. Lancet, Red Cross, International Criminal Court, the capitulation was as pervasive as it was pathetic. In yet another abject spectacle of professional dereliction, even the UN Human Rights Council betrayed Gaza after protective edge. The critique of Black Friday in this chapter was submitted to Amnesty International for comment. TH's addendum includes a slightly edited version of Amnesty's response which is reprinted with its gracious consent, and this. Author's Rejoinder see page 310 on Book Rejoinder to Amnesty's Response. The crux of this chapter's argument with Amnesty International boils down to a single question. Did Israel primarily set out to target Gaza's civilian population or legitimate military objectives during Operation Protective Edge? Whereas Amnesty's factual evidence overwhelmingly affirmed the former, 
its legal analysis of this evidence consistently presumed the latter. In other words, its legal analysis repeatedly contradicted its own evidentiary findings and effectively exonerated Israel of the most explosive charge leveled against it. Amnesty's multiple reports on Protective Edge analyzed the assault at three discrete levels, individual incidents, example, a single home, major attacks, example, Rafa, and the operation as a whole. At each of these levels, Amnesty's legal analysis reached a similar conclusion. Israel might have committed war crimes in the course of pursuing legitimate military objectives, but it almost never intentionally targeted civilians. For example, in Families Under the Rubble, which analyzed Gazan homes targeted by Israel that resulted in large numbers of civilian deaths, Amnesty divined a possible military objective in each and every attack. In Black Friday, which investigated Israel's assault on Rafah, when its insane and crazy use of firepower peaked, Amnesty still divined a possible military objective in all but two of the 15 separate incidents it analyzed. Black Friday accordingly concluded that Israel may have targeted civilians and committed crimes against humanity in at most at some instances. But the evidence assembled by Amnesty in Black Friday pointed ineluctably to a very different conclusion. At the micro and macro levels, the assault on Rafa was a premeditated and deliberate attack on a civilian population. It constituted a crime against humanity. Instead of engaging this chapter's specific criticisms of Black Friday, Amnesty's response for the most part lapses into broad and often at best tangential, generalities. It is consequently inadequate to the task at hand, the devil is in the details, and by evading the details, the response cannot convince. This brief rejoinder will focus on the few substantive arguments Amnesty does endeavor to make. The italicized text is culled from its response, 1. Presuming that a particular attack was premeditated or that an entire lengthy military operation such as Israel's Operation Protective Edge was designed to punish, humiliate and terrorize a civilian population, is not an option for judges or juries in courts that adhere to international standards. Amnesty appears to invert the criticism leveled at it. A juxtaposition of the factual evidence Amnesty gathered in Black Friday against the legal analysis it rendered demonstrates that in incident after incident amnesty itself kept presuming that the Israeli attack did not premeditatedly target civilians, notwithstanding its own factual evidence clearly showing that it did. Amnesty itself was a presuming against its own evidence and in favor of Israel. For a typical example, see table, adapted from table above. The legal analysis Amnesty presented was premised on a hypothetical scenario, divorced from the actual facts, that shielded Israel from the politically explosive charge of targeting civilians. It is instructive to compare Amnesty's chain of deductions in another of its regional reports issued contemporaneously. In Bombs Fall from the Sky Day and Night Civilians Under Fire in Northern Yemen 2015, Amnesty stated, the evidence from attacks on military objectives, infrastructure, government buildings, moving vehicles, and other area weapons, and since Palestinian fighters and military installations were present in at least some parts of Rafa during the hostilities, we have to entertain the possibility that each Israeli attack had a legitimate military target. The most we can say is that after various types of research, we have not been able to discover a legitimate military target for a particular attack. This does not mean we necessarily believe there was one. The essence of this statement is, whenever Israel uses precision weapons, amnesty, cannot necessarily assume that there was no legitimate military target, indeed, it must entertain the possibility 
that there was one, even if all the available evidence points to the conclusion that Israel was targeting civilians. This acknowledgement intrigues on multiple counts. First, whereas it earlier argued against a presuming that Israel targeted civilians, here Amnesty itself argues in favor of presuming that Israel targeted a military objective whenever it used precision weapons and even if all the available evidence demonstrates otherwise. Second, Amnesty reverses the intuitive presumption that if precision weapons are used in an attack that results in civilian deaths, and no evidence exists of a military objective, then, precisely because precision weapons were used, the attack on civilians must have been deliberate. Instead, Amnesty declares that if precision weapons were used, the presumption must be that Israel did not target civilians, even as all the evidence points to the conclusion that it did. Amnesty provides no basis for its poignant presumption that Israel would not use precision weapons to target civilians, although voluminous evidence exists that Israel has repeatedly and brazenly targeted civilians, including children, and civilian objects, much of it collected by Amnesty itself. Third, if it is incumbent upon Amnesty to entertain the possibility that Israel's objective was a legitimate military target when it used precision weapons, then Amnesty by definition cannot find that Israel targeted civilians when it used precision weapons, unless Israel itself confesses, because the possibility will always exist that its objective was a legitimate military target. In other words, if Amnesty did not find that Israel was targeting civilians, it was not for a deficit of evidence. Indeed, it was despite overwhelming evidence, much of it emanating from Israelis themselves, but because it was an epistemological impossibility, on the one hand, its working presumption was that Israel did not target civilians when it used precision weapons while, on the other hand, the logic of its reasoning was such that no amount of evidence could persuade it otherwise. It's worth pausing for a moment to ponder Amnesty's astonishing assertions. A typical human rights report includes a section on international law that cites the relevant provisions of international humanitarian and human rights law. For example, the legal chapter of Black Friday includes these subheadings. Prohibition on direct attacks on civilians and civilian objects, the principle of distinction, prohibition on indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks, precautions in attack, precautions in defense, collective punishment, investigation, and international human rights law. All these sections cite from standard sources, such as the 1949 Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocols 1 and 2 adopted in 1977. But unbeknownst to its readers, Amnesty interposes between its factual findings and legal analysis a phantom special presumption for Israel, let's call it SP4I, according to which, whenever Israel deploys precision weapons, the operative presumption must be that it is targeting a military objective and, even if all the available evidence demonstrates otherwise, the possibility must still be entertained that a military objective was targeted. If nothing else comes of this exchange, it's surely worthwhile that SP4I, hitherto invisible in Amnesty's legal analysis, has now been dredged to the surface. 3. Legally, there is no hierarchy among different types of war crimes or between war crimes and crimes against humanity. All are considered the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, which must not go unpunished. In terms of war crimes, legally speaking, intentionally launching an attack in the knowledge that the attack will cause civilian casualties or damage to civilian objects, that would clearly be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated i.e. a disproportionate attack, is just as criminal as intentionally launching a direct attack on civilians or civilian objects, 
or an attack which strikes military objectives and civilians or civilian objects without distinction, or which treats as a single military objective a number of distinct military objectives located in a civilian city or town. All are prohibited by IHL and all are war crimes. If a hierarchy does not exist among war crimes, it is cause for wonder why Amnesty is so cautious not to accuse Israel of intentionally targeting civilians, and why it starts from the presumption that Israel was not targeting civilians, and why it persists in this presumption even if all the evidence it gathered showed that Israel was targeting them, and why, a contrario, in a press release for the Amnesty report deploring lack of accountability two years after Protective Edge, it chose to highlight several attacks that clearly targeted civilians in violation of international humanitarian law. But, of course, a hierarchy does exist, if not in a strictly legal sense then as a political matter. The public's threshold of tolerance is much higher for civilian deaths in an operation that targets legitimate military objectives, than for civilian deaths in an operation calculated to punish, humiliate and terrorize the civilian population. A 2016 International Committee of the Red Cross survey found that only half of public opinion, among the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, and Switzerland, believed it was wrong to target enemy combatants in populated areas, knowing that many civilians would be killed, whereas fully 80% believed it was wrong to target hospitals, ambulances and healthcare workers in order to weaken the enemy. What's more, if civilians are killed in the absence of a military objective, it's a straightforward grave breach of international law akin to rape or the coercive use of human shields. However, the killing of civilians in the context of a military objective, which is what indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks presuppose, diminishes the probability of a conviction, as it introduces an element of murkiness and opens up wide latitude for judgment. The International Court of Justice couldn't even reach consensus that the use of nuclear weapons was disproportionate or indiscriminate, in all circumstances, or, put otherwise, the categories proportionate and discriminate are so elastic that they can even accommodate the use of nuclear weapons. Amnesty accuses Israel of committing disproportionate and indiscriminate attacks during its assault on Rafa while it scrupulously avoids accusing Israel of premeditated attacks on the civilian population despite overwhelming evidence. This was clearly a political decision. Amnesty calibrated its legal findings so as not to incur the full force of Israel's wrath. The political decision, however, came at a heavy price. It shielded Israel from the full force of justified public outrage by whitewashing the ugliest truth about the Rafa Inferno. It resulted not from the excesses of a legitimate military operation gone awry, but from an operation that a Benicio intentionally targeted the civilian population. The remainder of Amnesty's irresponse consists of self-congratulatory bromides or unargued counterclaims. Chapter 13. Betrayal 2. Unhuman Rights Council. In August 2014, the UN Human Rights Council appointed a fact-finding mission to investigate purported violations of international humanitarian and human rights law during Operation Protective Edge, 2014. William Shabas, a respected international jurist, was named chair of the mission. Israel immediately started efforts to remove him because he had previously made controversial statements such as, why are we going after the president of Sudan, at the International Criminal Court, for Darfur and not the president of Israel for Gaza? Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman oddly compared Shabaz's recruitment to appointing Cain to investigate who killed Abel. Unable to withstand the pressure, Shabaz eventually resigned, and he was replaced as chair by a U.S. judge, Mary McGowan Davis, 
who hailed from New York State. The outcome at this point was as predictable as when UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon appointed Alvaro Uribe vice chair of the panel of inquiry after Israel's assault on the Mavai Marmara. The betrayal had begun. In June 2015, the UN Human Rights Council, UNHRC, mission released its report. It predictably accused Hamas of having committed war crimes. But a close reading of the UN report could not have pleased Israel either. In its discrete analyses of numerous incidents during the assault, the report's factual findings repeatedly suggested that Israel might also have committed war crimes. A reader unfamiliar with the facts would perhaps be impressed at the report's even-handed presentation whereas a reader familiar with them would probably recoil in outrage at this spurious balance. The odd thing about the report was that it did chronicle, often in harrowing detail, the horrors that Israel inflicted on Gaza. However, it then proceeded to render legal analyses that methodically and, in many instances, comically buffered the gravity of Israel's crimes. In other words, it precisely replicated the apologetic modus operandi of the Amnesty International reports on protective edge. The upshot was that the UN report conveyed a wholly misleading, distorted picture of what happened in Gaza. Whereas it suggested that protective edge was a legitimate military campaign lamentably marred by sundry excesses, in fact, the assault was a terror campaign designed, if not to break, than at any rate to temper Gaza's will to resist. In order to convincingly demonstrate the report's bias, there's no alternative except to sift through its findings piecemeal fashion. It is to be hoped that by the time readers complete this chapter, they will be persuaded that if this writer has reached a harsh conclusion, it springs neither from malice nor prejudice but was arrived at only after scrupulously parsing the evidence albeit also amid his mounting feelings of despair commingled with indignation that even at this late date, when a seemingly endless river of blood has passed under the bridge in the course of Israel's numberless operations, targeting the martyred people of Gaza, a document bearing the imprimatur of the Human Rights Council should still so want in courage and integrity. The UN report on Protective Edge did not lack in redemptive features. It confirmed previous authoritative statements of law on a number of critical points. Thus, it reiterated that the occupied Palestinian territory is comprised of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. It also concluded, after painstaking analysis, that despite its Ballyhooed 2005 redeployment, Israel has maintained effective control of the Gaza Strip. Gaza continues to be occupied by Israel. The report went on to state that the blockade of Gaza by Israel has been strangling the economy in Gaza, that the dire situation in Gaza since the end of Protective Edge cannot be assessed separately from the blockade imposed by Israel and that current international relief efforts are not a substitute for lifting the blockade. The most resonant pronouncement in the whole of the report called on Israel to lift, immediately and unconditionally, the blockade on Gaza. On another charged legal point, the report rejected Israel's contention that if it could avert the capture of one of its soldiers, resort to otherwise disproportionate force would be legitimate, the proportionality test, Israel had argued, must take into account the strategic consideration of denying the armed groups the leverage they could obtain over Israel in negotiations for the release of the captured soldier. The report persuasively rejoined that this line of reasoning constituted an erroneous interpretation of international humanitarian law. The leverage that armed groups may obtain in negotiations does not depend solely on the capture of a soldier, but on how the government of Israel decides to react to the capture in the aftermath. 
the strategic military or political advantage sought is therefore not a concrete and direct military advantage, as required by international humanitarian law. Indeed, the proposed interpretation of the anticipated military advantage, which would allow for abstract political and long-term strategic considerations in carrying out the proportionality analysis, would have the consequence of emptying the proportionality principle of any protective element. Still, these various legal determinations contained in the report, although to be welcomed, did not remotely vindicate its numerous problematic, and at times outrageous, findings. The UN report's mandate formally covered only just in bello, rules governing the conduct of armed conflict, and not just ad bellum, rules governing the resort to armed conflict. However, its pronouncements on the triggers of protective edge effectively justified the Israeli offensive. It neutrally began. The hostilities of 2014 erupted in the context of the protracted occupation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, and of the increasing number of rocket attacks on Israel. But then, crossing into the juridical terrain of Jus Ad Bellum, the report cited without caveat Israel's public rationales for launching the initial air assault and subsequent ground invasion. On July 7, 2014, the Israel Defense Forces commenced Operation Protective Edge in the Gaza Strip, with the stated objective of stopping the rocket attacks by Hamas and destroying its capabilities to conduct operations against Israel. Oh, and July 17, 2014, the IDF launched a ground operation into Gaza. Official Israeli sources indicated that they did so to degrade terror organizations' military infrastructure and neutralize their network of cross-border assault tunnels. But as a matter of law, Israel couldn't resort to armed self-defense unless it had exhausted non-violent options and, hence, was driven by a necessity to launch an attack. In the event, Israel did have at hand an effective nonviolent remedy. Even egregious Israeli propagandists acknowledged that Hamas's objective from the inception of hostilities was to reopen Gaza's borders. The World Bank reported at the time that access to Gaza remains highly controlled, while Amnesty had deemed the siege a form of collective punishment, and the UN report itself called on Israel to lift immediately and unconditionally, the blockade on Gaza. It follows that if the cessation of Hamas rocket attacks was Israel's objective, then it only had to terminate its suffocating siege of Gaza, which would have put Israel on the right side of the law and preempted its necessity of armed self-defense, while sparing Gazans a murderous assault and allowing them, finally, to breathe. But what about Hamas's cross-border assault tunnels? For argument's sake, let's say that they posed a lethal threat. What prevented Israel from sealing the tunnels from its side of the border, as Egypt did to block cross-border tunnel traffic and raids between Gaza and the Sinai? Indeed, in mid-2016, Israel declared plans to build a concrete wall tens of meters deep underground and above ground to counter the threat of Hamas attack tunnels. Earlier in the year, the Defense Ministry announced that a solution for the tunnels would cost several hundred million dollars, but that such funding has not been earmarked in the defense budget for the coming years, which would seem to indicate that Israeli leaders didn't attach special urgency to the danger posed. It speaks to the report's deep-seated bias that it didn't even ponder Israel's options short of armed force, but instead blithely repeated Israeli Hasbara propaganda. The UN report perfectly balanced its overall verdicts on protective edge, t. He high incidence of loss of human life and injury during the 2014 hostilities is heartbreaking. Palestinians and Israelis were profoundly shaken by the events of the summer of 2014. The 2014 hostilities have had an enormous impact on the lives of Palestinians and Israelis. 
the scale of the devastation was unprecedented, and the death toll and suffering from injuries and trauma speak volumes. The Commission was deeply moved by the immense suffering of Palestinian and Israeli victims, who have been subjected to repeated rounds of violence. In general, balance is an admirable quality, it connotes nonpartisanship and objectivity. But balancing out a wildly imbalanced balance sheet amounts to a partisan act of misrepresentation. The findings of UN-appointed commissions in other situations do take note of grossly lopsided balance sheets. To be sure, the report's space allocations were not quite so evenly distributed. The ratio of paragraphs devoted to breaches of international law by Israel versus Hamas came to 4 to 1, while the ratio of paragraphs in the chapter devoted to the human and material toll on Gaza versus Israel stood at 4 to 3. Still, although favorable to Gaza, these ratios didn't remotely approach the relative magnitudes of death and destruction during protective edge. Indeed, as the report itself documented, Israel killed as many Palestinian children in the West Bank, which wasn't even a theater of war, as the total number of Israelis killed during Protective Edge, and Israel destroyed more Palestinian homes in the West Bank than the total number of Israeli homes destroyed. Whichever metric one zeroes in on, the colossal imbalance emerges in full view. The gross inequity registered in these ratios was barely perceptible in the report. For example, whereas raw data, such as total casualty figures, typically occupy a salient place in human rights documents, and accordingly, the number of Israeli fatalities showed up early in the report, the figure for Palestinian casualties was buried deep inside its pages. However much it played with these data, to credibly preserve its pretense to balance, the report nevertheless had to pour substantive content into its many paragraphs devoted to Israel's a heartbreaking loss of life, devastation, and immense suffering. But callous as it might sound, the fact is there just wasn't all that much to say. How many lines could the report invest in the death of one Israeli child and the destruction of one Israeli home? It resolved this dilemma by effectively upgrading into a breach of the laws of war, even a quasi-war crime, Hamas's infliction of psychological-slash-emotional distress on Israelis. Psychological-slash-emotional distress on Israelis. In armed conflicts, human rights investigations properly focus on violations of the laws of war, in particular, intentional, indiscriminate, and disproportionate attacks on civilians and civilian objects. Thus, the Gaza section of the UN report's impact chapter overwhelmingly chronicled the massive death and destruction inflicted by Israel on Gaza's civilian population. Just three paragraphs at the tail end gestured to pervasive trauma and to hopelessness in the Strip. However, the impact chapter's Israel section reversed these proportions. It prudently passed over in silence total Israeli civilian casualties and consigned the economic damage Hamas reeked to three concluding paragraphs. To exemplify this damage, it spotlighted a kibbutz member whose photography business in Beersheba stopped during the war as she was too afraid to take public transport which made her run into debt together with many other members of the kibbutz. Instead, the report opened the Israel section with a profile of protective edges, psychological impact, and then proceeded to describe these effects with mind-numbing repetition, piling one anecdote of distress upon another of anxiety, as if even after contriving this unorthodox rubric to balance out the Gaza section, it's still strained to fill space. See table. International law forbids acts or threats of violence the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian population. However, the laws of war do not prohibit acts of violence that might induce some degree of terror among civilians, 
which is an unavoidable accompaniment and consequence of any substantial resort to armed force. Otherwise, the laws of war would effectively outlaw major armed conflict, their purpose, however, is not to eliminate war, a utopian goal, at any rate, at this juncture in time, but rather to minimize its destructiveness. The various anxieties, stresses, fears, and traumas experienced by Israeli civilians during Protective Edge appeared to fall into this category of states of being that, unpleasant and disorienting as they might be, normally and inevitably attend armed conflict. To tacitly put civilian stress and trauma on a par with civilian death and destruction undercuts the critical legal distinction between those acts of war that humanity has resolved to abolish, or contain, and those that to date it hasn't so resolved. If an Israeli civil defense siren set off by a rocket attack from Gaza caused anxiety among Israelis, it doesn't follow that Hamas breached the laws of war. In effect, the report overreached its legal mandate by stretching and, consequently, mangling the laws of armed conflict. Moreover, by equating conditions of suffering that these laws have endeavored to differentiate, it has homogenized situations that by common consent and as a point of law qualitatively differ. If Israelis experience the distress of not being able to leave their homes, Palestinians experience the distress of no longer having a home to which they could return. The report likewise failed to distinguish between situations so radically different in degree as to make them qualitatively incomparable. If Israelis experienced fear and incurred injuries en route to a shelter, then Gazans experienced fear of having nowhere to run in the midst of an inferno and then coming under deliberate attack or, if fortunate enough to find refuge in that rare shelter, of being slaughtered by Israeli precision weapons targeting it. If Israelis had to endure the concussive effects of bottle rockets, then Gazans had to endure the concussive effects of one-ton bombs. It cannot be doubted that the drafters of the report were cognizant of these elementary distinctions. They elected, however, to collapse them, not because of a high-minded sensitivity to the full gamut of human suffering, or an enlightened refusal to rank human suffering, but almost certainly because otherwise the report's pretense to balance could not be sustained. If the report had properly fulfilled its essential mandate to investigate violations of the laws of war during Protective Edge, the whole of the Israel section in the Impact chapter could have been reduced to one sentence. Six civilians were killed and one house was destroyed. The UN reports elevation of fear inducement into a breach of the laws of war similarly marred its treatment of the Hamas tunnel network. It did acknowledge that the tunnels were only used to conduct attacks directed at IDF, Israel Defense Forces, positions in Israel in the vicinity of the Green Line, which are legitimate military targets. But still, it harped on the sense of insecurity and a panic attacks, trauma and persistent fear, great anxiety, and so on that the tunnels engendered among Israelis. It then proceeded to imply that the fear induced by these tunnels amounted to a violation of the laws of war. In its concluding observations, the report bracketed together these serious concerns regarding Hamas. The inherently indiscriminate nature of most of the projectiles directed towards Israel, and the targeting of Israeli civilians, which violate international humanitarian law and may amount to a war crime. The increased level of fear among Israeli civilians resulting from the use of tunnels was palpable. Its final recommendations, correlatively called upon Hamas, t. O respect the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution, including by ending all attacks on Israeli civilians and civilian objects, and stopping all rocket attacks and other actions that may spread terror among the civilian population in Israel, emphasis added. 
The only other actions chronicled in the report were Hamas tunnel excavations slash infiltrations. But if Hamas must desist from these below-ground excavations slash infiltrations, which target only combatants, because they induce fear among Israelis, shouldn't Israel have to desist from above-ground attacks with bombs, missiles, and shells, which overwhelmingly target civilians, because they induce fear among Gazans? In addition, international law does not debar a people fighting for self-determination from resorting to arms, whereas it does prohibit a state suppressing such a struggle from deploying violent force. Israel has deprived the people of Gaza of their right to self-determination via an externally imposed occupation. Surely, then, Hamas has the right to target via tunnels Israeli combatants enforcing this occupation from without, however much anxiety these tunnel attacks might induce among the civilian population. Or are Palestinians permitted to use armed force only if it doesn't rattle Israelis? However ingenious the rhetorical strategies deployed by the UN report to even out Hamas's and Israel's breaches of international law, see table for another illustration, they still couldn't bridge the chasm separating the devastation inflicted, respectively, by each party. It is of course possible that even if it caused less death and destruction, Hamas might have committed as many war crimes as Israel. But it's also true that once the proportion reached an order of magnitude of, say, 550,1, children killed by Israel versus Hamas, or 18,000,1, homes destroyed by Israel versus Hamas, such a claim not only lacks plausibility but also appears positively ridiculous. How, then, did the report resolve this dilemma? It in part misrepresented the relevant facts, but, more significantly, it mangled the relevant law by repeatedly invoking irrelevant law. This disingenuousness permeated the report's treatment of Hamas and Israeli war crimes. Hamas war crimes The UN report set the stage for its indictment of Hamas by citing directly or indirectly official Israeli sources depicting a formidable Hamas weapons arsenal. But the battlefield performance of these weapons strongly suggested that the bulk of them consisted of little more than enhanced fireworks. The report also dutifully regurgitated Israeli claims regarding the dazzling performance of the Iron Dome anti-missile defense system, even though recognized experts and the facts on the ground refuted them. In an unusual acknowledgement, the report did observe that according to security experts, Hamas's declared official policy during Protective Edge was to focus on military or semi-military targets and to avoid other targets, especially civilians. It went on to document instances in which Hamas appeared to be targeting Israeli combatants and military objects while Israel itself acknowledged that Hamas mortar shells killed 10 IDF combatants positioned on the Israeli side of the border. The report also observed that Hamas attempted, in a few instances, to warn Israeli civilians of impending attacks and, in fact, these Hamas alerts were more effective than those issued by Israel, because, unlike in Gaza, residents could flee to other areas of Israel less exposed to threats. However, the report found that the vast majority of Hamas projectiles targeted population centers in Israel. It devoted fully 15 paragraphs to depicting in graphic detail the effects of these Hamas attacks, even though only six civilians in Israel were killed and property damage was negligible. It is often suggested, although not by the report, that if so few civilians died it was only on account of Iron Dome, and a proper calculation would reckon the probable number of civilian deaths in its absence. The argument is factually false, Iron Dome probably didn't save many and perhaps not any lives, and even were it true, irrelevant, if additional civilians would have been killed absent Israel's civil defense slash shelter system and structurally sound edifices, 
Should the casualty count then tally how many Israelis would have died if they lived in substandard, Gazalite conditions? If a calculation were to be based on all things being equal, it abstracts from the root injustice that Israel and Palestine are not equal. The UN report found that Hamas's projectile attacks may have constituted war crimes, Hamas rocket attacks. Rockets cannot be directed at a specific military objective and therefore strikes employing these weapons. Constitute indiscriminate attacks, statements, indicate intent to direct those attacks against civilians. Hamas mortar attacks, statements, indicate in some cases, intent to target civilian communities. If they were used to target civilians or civilian objects, this would be a violation of the principle of distinction. I. End the cases in which attacks were directed at military objectives located amidst or in close vicinity to civilians, or civilian objects, mortars are not the most appropriate weapons. The imprecise nature of mortars makes it difficult for an attacking party using this weapon in an area in which there is a concentration of civilians to distinguish between civilians and civilian objects and the military objective of the attack. In its defense, Hamas pleaded that Palestinian rockets are primitive and not very technologically advanced, but nevertheless the factions attempted to direct their rockets at military targets in Israel. The report curtly and coldly rejoined. The military capacity of the parties to a conflict is irrelevant to their obligation to respect the prohibition against indiscriminate attacks. The humanitarian rationale behind prohibiting use of indiscriminate weapons is self-evident. But, in, discriminateness is a relative notion. It varies according to the most sophisticated guidance system currently available for a particular line of weaponry. So it is equally self-evident that the prohibition against indiscriminate weapons discriminates against poor states, or non-state actors that cannot afford cutting-edge technology. In the instant case, the report effectively criminalized nearly the whole of Hamas's primitive arsenal. And thereby it denied Gaza the inherent right, anchored in the UN Charter, of armed self-defense, and the right effectively sanctioned by international law, of armed resistance in its self-determination struggle. Even if it is admitted that notwithstanding its discriminatory effects, cogent reasons might be adduced to preserve intact the prohibition, still it hardly befits a human rights document to peremptorily dismiss as irrelevant a wholly reasonable, if debatable, objection. It also warrants attention how much more sensitive the report was to Israeli concerns. For example, the report recognizes the dilemma that Israel faces in releasing information that would disclose in detail the targets of military strikes, given that such information may be classified and jeopardize intelligence sources. Although it still placed the onus on Israel to provide sufficient details on its targeting decisions to allow an independent assessment of the legality of the attacks. The report not only evinced a sensitivity absent in its high-handed dismissal of Hamas, but it also credited the Israeli alibi that information was withheld out of security concerns, and not because its release might undercut official lies. The report proceeded to infer a sinister motive lurking behind Hamas rocket attacks. If these projectiles couldn't accurately target military objectives, then the report cannot exclude the possibility that the indiscriminate rocket attacks may constitute acts of violence whose primary purpose is to spread terror amongst the civilian population. Spreading terror might have been Hamas's motive, but other possible motives also leap to mind. The rocket attacks could have been belligerent reprisals, which international law does not forbid, to compel Israel to cease and desist from its terroristic assault on Gazan society. The report itself noted that Hamas issued a statement confirming its intention to target Israeli civilians in response to Israel's 
targeting of Palestinian civilians in their homes and shelters. Or consider the motive professed by Hamas leader Khalid Mishal during Operation Cast Lead, 2008-9, are modest. Homemade rockets are our cry of protest to the world. One wonders why the report did not entertain these more benign possibilities. International law requires all parties to a conflict to take all feasible precautions in the choice of means and methods of attack with a view to avoiding injury to civilians and damage to civilian objects. The UN report alleged that despite substantial impediments to its investigation, it was able to divine patterns of behavior by Hamas that breached this legal obligation. It cited a quartet of incidents where Hamas fired rockets in close proximity to civilians. As it happens, Amnesty pointed to the identical four incidents in its indictment of Hamas. The duplication suggests a paucity of corroborative evidence. The report also cited a handful of instances where Hamas conducted military operations within or in close proximity to sites benefiting from special protection under international law. In particular, the environs of two to three schools and a church. These incidents were also cited in earlier investigations. The report further noted that official Israeli sources repeatedly accused Hamas of violating the feasible precautions obligation, but it was not able to independently verify these allegations. The report acknowledged that the feasible precautions obligation is not absolute, that even if there are areas that are not residential, Gaza's small size and its population density makes it particularly difficult for armed groups always to comply with the obligation, and that several signatories to the relevant international instrument stipulated that, for densely populated countries, the requirement to avoid locating military objectives within densely populated areas would be difficult to apply. Still, the report concluded that in light of the number of cases in which Hamas carried out military operations within or in the immediate vicinity of civilian objects and specifically protected objects, it does not appear that this behavior was simply a consequence of the normal course of military operations, and, therefore, the law was not always complied with. Although this was a cautious and qualified finding, the question must nonetheless be posed, did the report substantiate it? It would have to show that the instances it documented gave proof of a deliberate Hamas choice not to avoid civilian and protected objects, and were not just random events consequent on or the normal course of military operations in a densely populated civilian terrain. But the handful of incidents recycled by the report during a 51-day armed conflict in which Hamas fired 7,000 projectiles and engaged an invading army, with unprecedented combat losses on both sides, does not appear to reach the evidentiary threshold of a pattern. The report not only failed to substantiate its qualified assertion but also indulged in groundless speculation. For example, it stated that, if it is confirmed that in using locations to conduct military operations, armed groups did so with the intent to use the presence of civilians or persons or to combat to prevent their military assets from being attacked, this would constitute a violation of the customary law prohibition to use human shields and would amount to a war crime. But the report didn't provide a scintilla of evidence demonstrating such intent. What was the point of such baseless conjecture, of which this is just one example, except to plant a false image in the reader's mind, or to appease Israel, which repeatedly accused Hamas of human shielding, or both? In its most audacious, or outrageous, speculation, the report verged on criminalizing nonviolent civil resistance as it posited that Hamas might wrongly exploit it. In one case of the bombing of a residential building examined by the Commission, 
information gathered indicates that following a specific warning by the IDF that the house was to be targeted, several people went to the roof of the house in order to protect the house. Should they have been directed to do so by members of Palestinian armed groups, this would amount to the use of the presence of civilians in an attempt to shield a military objective from attack, in violation of the customary law prohibition to use human shields. With regard to this incident, the Commission is disturbed by the reported call by the spokesperson of Hamas to the people in Gaza to adopt the practice of shielding their homes from attack by going up on their roofs. Although the call is directed to residents of Gaza, it can be seen and understood as an encouragement to Palestinian armed groups to use human shields. Instead of showing compassion for Gazans as they risked life and limb to protect their, and their neighbors, family homes, the report zeroed in on Hamas in order to deny it, on purely conjectural grounds, one of the few means of non-violent resistance available to it in the midst of an annihilative attack, even going so far as to brand the Islamic movement's encouragement of such self-willed, heartrending acts, whose spiritual lineage traces back to Gandhi, an embryonic war crime. It is also cause for sheer bewilderment why the report designated an unambiguously civilian dwelling as a military objective, did it automatically lose its protected status once Israel decided to target it, or did the report start from the premise that everyone and everything in Gaza was, if not aligned, then alloyed with terrorism? Finally, the UN report indicted Hamas for its extrajudicial executions of suspected collaborators during Protective Edge. The fact that the majority of the victims had been arrested and detained before the conflict, it observed, prompts concerns that they were executed in order to increase pressure on Gaza's population, with a view to preventing others from spying. Most executions occurred a day after three, Hamas, commanders were killed by the IDF. The report also noted that because of the stigma attached to collaboration, these executions had devastating effects on family members, who had to cope with indelible stains on their reputation and honor. Inasmuch as the report expressed sympathy for an alleged Israeli quandary on releasing classified information, it might have paused to contemplate Hamas's quandary of resisting a brutal invasion while plagued by internal collaborators directly or indirectly on the payroll of the enemy. The Russian revolutionist Leon Trotsky cogently argued that in the midst of a foreign invasion, the threat of incarceration will not deter potential collaborators, because the very premise of aligning with the enemy is that its victory impends, t. Hay cannot be terrorized by the threat of imprisonment, as, they do, not believe in its duration. It is just this simple but decisive fact that explains the widespread recourse to shooting. It is in no way to extenuate Hamas executions to pose the inescapable question, how else was Hamas supposed to deter collaborators? The prohibition on executing collaborators would appear to fall into the same category as the prohibition on indiscriminate weapons, an insoluble dilemma. It might be recalled that a leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising expressed as our great guilt that, immediately, from the first day, we didn't kill, the Jewish collaborators. If a few of them had been killed, others would have been afraid to join the police. They should have been hanged on lamp poles, to threaten them. I'm sure that whenever there is internal treason, war must begin by destroying it. The report determined that these Hamas executions, not a may but unquestionably did, amount to a war crime and it exhorted, whoever is responsible for the killings, must be brought to justice. Nowhere in its indictment of Israel did the report use such unequivocal and emphatic language. It also called upon Hamas to combat the stigma faced by families of alleged collaborators. 
although it acknowledged that Hamas had already undertaken to support the families of persons accused of collaboration. The report concluded that the far-reaching effects of stigma call for a stronger response. Was Hamas legally required to organize a collaborator pride parade? Israeli war crimes The UN report divided allegations of Israeli war crimes into multiple, somewhat arbitrary, and frequently overlapping categories. If it had let the evidence speak for itself, the report would have compiled a devastating dossier on Israel's prosecution of protective edge. But it didn't. Instead, between its factual findings, on the one hand, and its conclusions, on the other, it interpolated contorted legal analyses. The report asserted that, t. he factual conclusions formed the basis for the legal analysis of the individual incidents. In reality, its legal analyses watered down the ghastly reality. The upshot of its intercession as interpreter and arbiter of the law was a dossier that, although it might not have satisfied Israel, except for a full-throated apologia, what would failed to meet the most exiguous standards of justice. In its parts and as a totality, the report was, simply put, a cover-up. In order to bring home this truth, there's no alternative except to juxtapose the facts presented in each incident, or group of incidents, with the report's tendentious legal interpretation of them. Airstrikes The UN report observed that as a result of Israeli airstrikes targeting residential and other buildings, at least, 142 Palestinian families had three or more members killed in the same incident for a total of 742 fatalities. Two survivors of such attacks recalled, respectively, these scenes. I found the decapitated bodies of my uncle and daughter. My cousin was alive but died on the way to the hospital. Another cousin's body was found sliced in two. We had ten corpses in the first ambulances. No other survivors were found. After having removed the cement I identified my cousin Dina's body. What I witnessed was horrible. She was nine months pregnant and she had come from her home to her parents' house to have her baby. We could not imagine that she had passed away. Her stomach was ripped open and the unborn baby was lying there with the skull shattered. We kept searching for other corpses and found my uncle's wife. We had great difficulty removing all the pieces of cement from her body. I had a close look at the bodies. Only the upper part of my nine-year-old daughter's body was left. My son Mohammed had his intestines coming out. My sixteen-year-old cousin had lost his two legs. My son Mustafa, who was five meters away from me, had received shrapnel that almost completely severed his neck. My sixteen-year-old nephew lost both his legs and arms. He asked for my help. I just really wanted him to die quickly. I didn't want him to go through so much suffering. There was also my one-year-old daughter who was in her mother's arms. We found her body on a tree. I myself lost my left arm. The report was unable to find a possible military target in six of the fifteen air assaults it investigated. In one such lethal attack absent a military objective, a precision-guided 500-pound bomb targeted children on a roof, who had gone there to feed the birds, killing three of them and injuring two others. The report's tabulation, which pointed to a possibly legitimate military target in 60 percent, nine-fifteenths, of the incidents, cast the Israeli attacks in a more favorable light than the established facts warranted. Consider the evidentiary basis of its calculations. The semi-official Israeli intelligence and terrorism information center, ITIC, posted the name, date, location, and combatant, terrorist. 
operative, slash civilian, non-involved, status of Gazans killed during protective. Edge. If this Hezbara outfit listed a person killed during one of the Israeli air strikes on a residential home as a terrorist operative, the report automatically denoted him a possible military target. But setting aside its dubious determination of a victim's status, where and how did it get this information? Idik never asserted that the building was targeted because of the terrorist operative's presence or, for that matter, that Israel was even aware of his presence when it attacked the building. In addition, the report itself observed that the presence of a Hamas member did not in itself transform the residence into a military object, the mere fact of being a member of the political wing of Hamas or any other organization in Gaza, or working for the authorities, is not sufficient in and of itself to render a person a legitimate military target. Taking all these factors into account, it's possible that the Israeli air strikes investigated by the report targeted combatants or military objects in only a small minority of cases. The UN report documented that in many of the incidents it chronicled, Israel launched the airstrike at a time of day when a large number of civilians was likely to be present. For example, the family was preparing for the Iftar meal, the breaking of the fast at sunset, it was only a few minutes after they got up to have suhar, the last meal of the day during Ramadan until the breaking of the fast in the evening, all twelve members of the family were at home, preparing to break the Ramadan fast, the family had just finished a long meal in honor of the second day of the Eid, and most of the family members were taking a nap, they were gathered for Iftar. The report also found that Israel did not give warnings in at least 11 of the 15 incidents, while among some of the warnings that Israel did give, only a few minutes between 3 and 5, elapsed, between them and the actual attack. Point 81 The report additionally found that Israel used precision-guided missiles or precision guided 500 2000 pound bombs in all 15 incidents. Here's how weapons. Experts described the impact of the GBU-31, which Israel used in several of the airstrikes investigated by the report. The explosion creates a shock wave exerting thousands of pounds of pressure per square inch, psi. By comparison, a shock wave of 12 PS I will knock a person down, and the injury threshold is 15 pounds psi. The pressure from the explosion of a device such as the Mark 84 JDAM-82 can rupture lungs, burst sinus cavities and tear off limbs hundreds of feet from the blast site, according to trauma physicians. When it hits, the JDAM generates an 8,500-degree fireball, gouges a 20-foot crater as it displaces 10,000 pounds of dirt and rock, and generates enough wind to knock down walls blocks away and hurl metal fragments a mile or more. TH air is a very great concussive effect. Damage to any human beings in the vicinity would be pretty nasty. Point 83. In regard to Israel's use of inter alia, the GBU-31 slash MK-84 2000 pound bomb. The report concluded, regardless how precise the bomb is, it remains extremely questionable whether a weapon with such a wide impact area allows its operators to adequately distinguish between civilians and civilian objects. And the military objective of the attack, when used in densely populated areas, 84 on this last point, recall that the report denoted Hamas's deployment of primitive rockets carrying 10 to 20 pounds of explosives 
inherently indiscriminate attacks because they cannot be directed at a specific military objective. It perplexes, then, why it's not also an inherently indiscriminate attack when Israel unloads in a precision strike in the heart of a densely populated civilian neighborhood, a 2,000-pound bomb that generates an 8,500-degree Fahrenheit fireball gouges a 20-foot crater as it displaces 10,000 pounds of dirt and rock and generates enough wind to knock down walls blocks away and hurl metal fragments a mile or more. Instead, the Report deemed Israel's use of such a weapon in such circumstances extremely questionable. Pray tell, what questions remained? The bigger point, however, is this. The UN report failed to adduce credible evidence that Israel mostly targeted military objectives in these airstrikes on civilian buildings. Even if in a handful of incidents Hamas militants were present, still, judging by the timing of the attacks, i.e., as large numbers of civilians predictably assembled, the paucity and inefficacy of the warnings issued, the use of high-explosive precision weapons in densely populated civilian areas, and the wholesale destruction of civilian buildings that had already been abandoned, judging by the accumulation and compounding of these factors, the Israeli air strikes constituted neither disproportionate attacks nor even indiscriminate attacks but, on the contrary, targeted attacks on Gaza's civilian population and infrastructure, in which the occasional presence of a Hamas militant was less a target than a pretext, the objective of these air strikes almost certainly being, beyond the exaction of crude revenge, to terrorize the people of Gaza into submission by causing sufficient death and destruction as to break their will or turn them against Hamas. The report, however, did not reach this conclusion. It did find that the six targeted Israeli airstrikes where a military objective wasn't discernible, as well as in most cases, reported by non-governmental organizations, may constitute a direct attack against civilian objects or civilians, a war crime, while the other nine incidents, where a possible military objective was discernible, could be disproportionate, and therefore amount to a war crime. But although it did not recoil from speculating that Hamas fired rockets to spread terror, the report fell silent, despite an abundance of circumstantial evidence on the possibility that Israel's overarching purpose in these airstrikes might have been to spread terror. It acknowledged that the attacks were carried out when it could be expected that most family members would be at home, in the evening or at dawn when families gathered for Iftar and Suhor, the Ramadan meals, or during the night when people were asleep, and that large weapons apparently meant to raise buildings were used. But it scrupulously avoided posing the question, why did Israel choose these times of day and these types of weapons? The report acknowledged that in the handful of instances where Israel did provide a few minutes' notice of an impending airstrike, by giving a warning, the IDF accepted that the attack did not require the element of surprise, accordingly. There appears to be no reason why more time was not granted to the residents of the house to evacuate. But it did not pose the obvious next question, why did Israel leave the occupants so little time to vacate their homes? The report acknowledged that, regarding the destruction of high-rise buildings, during the last week of Protective Edge, a statement by an IDF general seems to suggest that the objective of these strikes was to exercise pressure on the social elite of Gaza by destroying the high-rises. But if it sought to exert political pressure on civilians via targeted airstrikes on civilian objects, wasn't Israel's goal to spread terror? The report acknowledged that an airstrike using precision weapons which indicates that specific objectives were targeted, 92 killed children playing on a roof. It then went on to suggest that Israel 
may have breached its obligations to take all feasible measures to avoid or at least to minimize incidental harm to civilians. But wasn't the relevant point of law that Israel took all feasible measures to maximize harm to civilians, including children, that is, that it targeted these children with precision weapons? The report observed that, the massive scale of destruction and the number of homes and civilian buildings attacked raise concerns that Israel's interpretation of what constitutes a military objective is broader than the definition provided by international humanitarian law, and also raises concerns that these strikes may have constituted military tactics reflective of a broader policy. That prioritized the perceived military objective over other considerations, disregarding the obligation to minimize effects on civilians. 93 It strenuously circumvented concerns that massive devastation was Israel's military objective, in order to maximize effects on civilians by terrorizing them, that its military tactics were reflective of this a broader policy and that its premeditated, preplanned, military tactics, and, military objective, were not merely, broader than the definition provided by, but conceived in shocking willful breach of, international humanitarian law. Ground Operations The section of the UN report devoted to Israeli ground operations focused on IDF atrocities in Shujaia, 19-20 July, Kuzay, 20 July 1st August, Rafa, 1 to 3 August, and Shujaia Market, July 30th. It stated that the combined impact of these ground operations has had a devastating impact on the population of Gaza, both in terms of human suffering as well as in terms of damage to the infrastructure. At least 150 civilians were killed and more than 2,000 homes were completely destroyed. 94 The report scrutinized these operations individually and then presented a synoptic analysis of them. A. Shujaia. Located near the Green Line, Shujaia is among the most densely populated neighborhoods in Gaza. Although Israel issued warnings before the ground operation, most residents elected to stay put. On July 20, 13 IDF soldiers in Shujaia were killed by Hamas militants in firefights. Israel then intensified its bombardment, ostensibly to rescue injured soldiers, at which point about half the residents fled. 95 The Union report noted that Israel fired 600 artillery shells into Shujaia in less than an hour on July 20 the shelling continued for more than six hours, and dropped, over 101-ton bombs in a short period of time. An IDF eyewitness testimony cited by the report recalled, the artillery corps and the air force really cleaned that place up, while another testimony recalled, one of the most senior officials in the IDF, just marked off houses on an aerial photo of Shujaia, to be taken down. By the operation's end, Shujaia was a raised area, and likely leveled as a result of focused IDF demolitions efforts. Fully 1,300 buildings were completely destroyed or seriously damaged, and many civilians were killed or injured. 96 The report's legal analysis found that the methods and means employed by the IDF in Shujaia raise questions and raise serious concerns as to its respect for the laws of war, distinction. The overwhelming firepower could not, in such a small and densely populated area, be directed at a specific military target, and also, violated the prohibition of treating several distinct individual military objectives in a densely populated area, as one single military objective. Therefore, Strong indications exist that the operation was conducted in violation of the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks and may amount to a war crime, feasible precautions. It is questionable whether the use of such immense firepower in such a short period would have allowed the IDF 
to respect its obligation to do everything feasible to verify that the targets were military objectives, while the fact that the IDF persisted in this intensive shelling long after it must have known of the dire impact on civilians and civilian objects evidences the commander's failure to comply with his obligation to do everything feasible to suspend an attack. If it becomes apparent that it does not conform to the principle of proportionality, and proportionality, the objective of the shelling and heavy bombardment appears mainly to have been force protection. G. Ivan the means and methods used by the IDF in Shujaia. It is possible to conclude that a reasonable commander would be aware of the potential for such an intense attack to result in the death of a high number of civilians. As such, it is highly likely that a reasonable commander would therefore conclude that the expected incidental loss to civilian life and damage and destruction of civilian objects would be excessive in relation to the anticipated military advantage of this attack. 97 Before assessing the report's legal findings, it's useful to take a step back. After enduring an unusual number of IDF casualties, Israel fired probably thousands of high-explosive artillery shells and dropped scores of one-ton bombs on Shujaia. Israel alleged that it deployed such massive firepower in order to rescue injured combatants. 98 The report didn't even try to demonstrate a logical nexus between such massive indiscriminate force, on the one hand, and a rescue operation, on the other. Instead, it faithfully echoed Israeli Hasbara. The objective of the shelling and heavy bombardment appears mainly to have been force protection. How on earth does one rescue injured soldiers by firing with abandoned thousands of indiscriminate artillery shells, and dropping scores of one-ton bombs in a densely populated civilian neighborhood? How does one rescue injured soldiers by methodically demolishing hundreds upon hundreds of civilian homes? The report noted that, Hamas accused the IDF of taking revenge on the civilian population for its military defeat in the battleground. 99 But it brushed aside this explanation although, prima facie, it's surely the more plausible one. Indeed, IDF testimonies themselves recalled the targeting of random civilian homes in revenge after a soldier's death. The report stated that the IDF may have committed indiscriminate attacks. But in dropping one-ton bombs on, and firing high-explosive artillery shells into a densely populated civilian neighborhood absent a credible military objective, didn't the IDF conduct discriminate attacks on civilians? Was the essence of Israel's crime that it treated several distinct individual military objectives? as one single military objective, or that it treated the entire civilian population and infrastructure as its military objective? The report faulted Israel for not doing everything feasible to verify that the targets were military objectives, and persisting in the operation long after it must have been aware of its dire impact on civilians. But wasn't the manifest purpose of the operation to target not military objectives, but civilians and civilian objects? Didn't Israel persist not despite but because of the operation's dire impact on the civilian population? The report stated that Israel didn't properly balance incidental loss of civilian life and destruction of civilian objects against military advantage. But what military advantage? Could Israel possibly have reaped by deploying such massive firepower in a densely populated civilian neighborhood? How could the devastation have been incidental to the operation when it was its very essence? The report observed that, in spite of the significant destruction and credible allegations of civilian casualties in Shujaia, there wasn't any ongoing investigation into the events by Israel. But if the operation's objective was to inflict significant civilian death and destruction, 
wouldn't such an investigation be superfluous? Instead of illuminating, via the idiom of law, the nature of Israel's crimes in Shuja'aya, the report occluded them. The crux of its legal analysis, that is, that Israel was pursuing a military objective, and was seeking a military advantage, was a whitewash and a sham. It also cannot but bewilder that whereas the report expressed certainty that Hamas's executions of alleged collaborators amount to a war crime, Israel's saturation bombing of a densely populated civilian neighborhood may amount to a war crime. B. Kuzae. On July 21, the village of Kuzae, located near the Israeli border, came under Israeli air assault, and on July 22 the IDF physically isolated it from the outside world, fragmented it internally, cut off the electricity, and shot up the water supply. The village then came under intense fire from the air and the ground. The report stated that Kuzae became a zone of active fighting and everything in it was turned into a target. But it's unclear why the report used the phrase zone of active fighting. Neither it nor other sources documented any firefights or IDF casualties. By the operation's end, some 70 Gazans, including at least 14 civilians, were dead and 740 buildings were damaged or destroyed. The report homed in on several incidents during the assault on Kuzae, among them, civilians holding a white flag and attempting to leave Kuzae were confronted by a group of IDF soldiers who opened fire on them. Eleven people were seriously injured, Kuzae's only clinic was struck by repeated Israeli airstrikes, an ambulance found a six-year-old boy who was critically injured. He was taken to an IDF checkpoint in order to be transferred to the closest ambulance. The ambulance was kept waiting for at least 20 minutes in spite of the evident seriousness of the victim's injuries, and his being a child. The boy died, a family fled in a state of complete panic, leaving behind one of the family members, a woman aged about 70, in a wheelchair. When a family member returned home, a few days later, he found, her, dead body. She had a bullet mark in her head and blood on her face. The doctor who later examined the body, stated, that she had been shot from close range, from a distance of about two meters. S. Om days or weeks later, an Israeli soldier posted on Twitter a picture of another IDF soldier offering water to, her. The UN report's legal analysis found that the intensity of the shelling, which decimated Kuzae's civilian infrastructure, and the bulldozing of buildings throughout the ground operation, raise concerns that the IDF shelling and airstrikes were not exclusively directed at military objectives, that, it appears highly unlikely that the 740 buildings either destroyed or damaged all made an effective contribution to military action. And that, the complete raising of some areas of Kuzae indicates that the IDF may have treated several distinct individual military objectives in a densely populated area as one single military objective, and also, indicates that the IDF carried out destructions that were not required by military necessity. The report concluded that, strong indications, exist that these elements of the IDF assault on Kuzae, may qualify as direct attacks against civilians or civilian objects and may thus amount to a war crime. It went on to find that by, refusing to allow civilians to flee, despite the, intense shelling and aerial bombardment, and, full knowledge of their presence, the IDF very likely committed indiscriminate or disproportional attacks, and it also raises concern that not all feasible precautions to minimize danger to civilians were taken by the IDF in its attack against the town of Kuzae. It additionally observed, the extent of the destruction combined with the statements made during the operation by the commander of the brigade responsible for the Kuzae operation to the effect that Palestinians have to understand that this does not pay off, 
are indicative of a punitive intent and may constitute collective punishment. The report's legal analysis was as revealing in what it did not say as in what it did say. It registered concern that Israel's massive shelling and airstrikes, which leveled Kuzaya's civilian infrastructure, were not exclusively directed at military objectives. But although it didn't identify a single firefight or IDF casualty, and although it didn't identify a single military objective, the report never broached the possibility that Israel's firepower overwhelmingly targeted civilians and civilian objects. The report deemed it highly unlikely that Israel's systematic demolition of civilian buildings made an effective contribution to military action. But even as it concluded that the devastation may qualify as direct attacks against civilians and civilian objects, it steered clear of the possibility that if Israel was engaged in a military action, its military objective was to destroy civilian buildings. It posited the scenario that by effacing parts of Kuzae from the map, the IDF may have treated several distinct individual military objectives in a densely populated area as one single military objective, and may have carried out destructions that were not required by military necessity. But it didn't consider the possibility that Israel's objective was not military but wholly civilian, while military necessity didn't even figure as an element in its calculation. How could it in the absence of a military objective? And that, the complete raising of some areas of Kuzae indicates that the IDF may have treated several distinct individual military objectives in a densely populated area as one single military objective, and also, indicates that the IDF carried out destructions that were not required by military necessity. The report concluded that strong indications exist that these elements of the IDF assault on Kuzae may qualify as direct attacks against civilians or civilian objects and may thus amount to a war crime. It went on to find that by refusing to allow civilians to flee, despite the intense shelling and aerial bombardment, and full knowledge of their presence, the IDF very likely committed indiscriminate or disproportional attacks, and it also raises concern that not all feasible precautions to minimize danger to civilians were taken by the IDF in its attack against the town of Kuzae. It additionally observed, the extent of the destruction combined with the statements made during the operation by the commander of the brigade responsible for the Kuzae operation to the effect that Palestinians have to understand that this does not pay off, are indicative of a punitive intent and may constitute collective punishment. The report's legal analysis was as revealing in what it did not say as in what it did say. It registered concern that Israel's massive shelling and airstrikes, which leveled Kuzae's civilian infrastructure, were not exclusively directed at military objectives. But although it didn't identify a single firefight or IDF casualty, and although it didn't identify a single military objective, the report never broached the possibility that Israel's firepower overwhelmingly targeted civilians and civilian objects. The report deemed it highly unlikely that Israel's systematic demolition of civilian buildings made an effective contribution to military action. But even as it concluded that the devastation may qualify as direct attacks against civilians and civilian objects, it steered clear of the possibility that if Israel was engaged in a military action, its military objective was to destroy civilian buildings. It posited the scenario that by effacing parts of Kuzae from the map, the IDF may have treated several distinct individual military objectives in a densely populated area as one single military objective, and may have carried out destructions that were not required by military necessity. But it didn't consider the possibility that Israel's objective was not military but wholly civilian, while 
military necessity, didn't even figure as an element in its calculation. How could it in the absence of a military objective? The report reckoned it, very likely, that trapping civilians in a village and then bombarding it constitutes an indiscriminate and disproportionate attack. It would appear to be even more likely that it constituted a targeted attack on civilians, especially as the report didn't identify any fighting, military objective, IDF casualties, or military value against which to weigh the loss of civilian life. The report did acknowledge, in a single paragraph, that the impetus behind the operation may also have included a punitive element and therefore constituted a collective punishment. But the death and destruction Israel visited on Kuzae were not merely incidental to, or a subordinate component of, an otherwise military operation, they were the natural and foreseeable result, that is, the intention, of an operation that primarily targeted, and was primarily designed to punish and terrorize, the civilian population. See Rafa. After Hamas killed two IDF combatants in Rafa and apparently captured a third soldier alive, Israel launched a major military operation, Black Friday, on August 1. The report stated that the IDF sealed off Rafa, fired over 1,000 shells against Rafa within three hours, and dropped at least 40 bombs, launched intense attacks against inhabitants in their homes and in the streets, fired on ambulances and private vehicles trying to evacuate civilians, and demolished dozens of homes. The ferocity of Black Friday a traced back to Israel's dread of a replay of the Galad Shalit affair, in which Hamas's capture of an IDF soldier eventually led to the release of more than 1,000 Palestinian detainees in a prisoner exchange. The report focused on several egregious incidents, for example, a hospital that was struck by two missiles and dozens of shells. It quoted leaked audio recordings of IDF radio communications, indicating Israel's unrestrained use of firepower, and concluded that virtually every person or building in Rafa became a potential military target. The report's legal analysis stated that information of attacks on all vehicles in the area, including ambulances, as well as incidents in which groups of civilians appear to have been targeted by tank fire, raises serious concerns as to the respect by the IDF of the principle of distinction. This amounts to a deliberate attack against civilians and civilian objects and may amount to a war crime. It went on to state that in light of the massive, unrestrained use of firepower, in a densely populated and built-up area over the period of a few hours, the assault, appears to have violated the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks. Of the massacres profiled in the report, Rafa was the only instance in which Israel appeared to have an identifiable quasi-military objective, that is, to kill the captured Israeli soldier so as to preempt a future prisoner exchange, although as the report made clear, this objective could not legitimize what ensued. The report stated unequivocally that Israel's attacks on all vehicles, and its targeting of groups of citizens, amount to a deliberate attack against civilians and civilian objects. But it then inserted the caveat, and may amount to a war crime, emphasis added. Even as the report dared utter the unutterable, that Israel targeted civilians, it recoiled at the legal compliment. How can a deliberate attack against civilians and civilian objects not be a war crime? D. Shujaia Market On July 30, Israel announced a four-hour unilateral truce, but it qualified that the ceasefire would not apply to the areas in which IDF soldiers are currently operating. The report homed in on a bloody sequence of incidents in a Shujaia neighborhood. The roof of a home was hit by high-explosive mortar shells that killed eight family members, including seven children aged between three and nine, who were playing there, and their grandfather aged 70. 
Israel purported that the attack was in response to an anti-tank missile and a, a burst of mortar fired from the neighborhood that injured one soldier. The IDF then fired another round of shells a 10 minutes later, just as three ambulances and the paramedics arrived at the scene, which also hit many of the people who had gathered around the family house to try and help survivors. The report cited a journalist eyewitness who was stunned by the apparent targeting of ambulances and journalists who had rushed to provide assistance to the injured and cover the incident. It further noted that eyewitness accounts are corroborated by two video recordings, one of which showed a dying cameraman continuing to film, and the ambulances being hit by a rocket. The report found, as a result of the second round of shelling, 23 persons were killed, including three journalists, one paramedic, and two firemen. In addition, 178 others were injured, among them 33 children, 14 women, one journalist, and one paramedic. Four are reported to have died as a result of the injuries they sustained in this attack. Although Israel subsequently alleged that it did not have real-time surveillance of the lethal assault, the report didn't buy this alibi. The commission finds it hard to believe that the IDF had no knowledge of the presence of ambulances in the area in the aftermath of the initial strike, especially when the rescue crews, a fire truck, and three ambulances arrived at the scene with sirens blazing loudly. The report's legal analysis faulted Israel for using indiscriminate mortars in a built-up, densely populated area. It consequently found that the attack may have violated the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks and the obligation to take all feasible precautions to choose means to spare civilians. Try as one may, it is most difficult to make sense of this legal analysis. For argument's sake, let it be granted that the seven children playing on the rooftop and their 70 year old grandfather were killed in an indiscriminate attack although as the report itself and previous human rights reports documented, this wouldn't have been the first time that Israel targeted children playing on a roof. But what about the second attack ten minutes later? The assault began just as neighbors, ambulances, rescue crews, and a fire truck arrived at the family's home. A journalist testified to the targeting of ambulances and journalists, emphasis added while a video recording captured ambulances being hit by a rocket. The report itself dismissed the possibility that Israel was unaware of the bloodbath, especially when the rescue crews, a fire truck, and three ambulances arrived at the scene with sirens blazing loudly. To classify this focused artillery and rocket barrage on a civilian medical rescue operation, absent any discernible military objective, as an indiscriminate attack in which Israel didn't take sufficient precautions to protect civilians, with the afterthought that it may qualify as a direct attack against civilians, and not as a clear-cut targeted attack directed at civilians, makes mockery of language, law, and human suffering. The UN report also undertook a synoptic analysis of protective edges ground operations under several heads, 1. Protection of Civilians, Force Protection The report found that Israel prioritized the safety of its combatants over humanitarian concern for Gaza's civilian population. The protection of IDF soldiers was a major consideration for the IDF, overruling and, at times eliminating, any concern for the impact of its conduct on civilians. When soldiers' lives were at stake or there was a risk of capture, the IDF disregarded basic principles of the laws of war, Two, warning and the continued protected status of civilians. The report found that Israeli warnings yielded equivocal results. The IDF sought to warn the population in advance by means of leaflets, loudspeaker announcements, telephone and text messages and radio broadcasts, which led to the successful evacuation of some areas. 
while these general warnings appear to have saved the lives of many people who heeded them, in other cases, inhabitants did not leave home for a number of reasons. On the last point, the report observed that Gaza lacked secure places of refuge where civilians could flee, 44%. Is either a no-go area or has been the object of evacuation warnings, that all areas in Gaza, including those towards which the population was directed, had been or were likely to be hit by air strikes, and that, the generalized and often unspecific warnings sometimes resulted in panic and mass displacement. Indeed, the spokesperson for the major refugee relief organization in Gaza, Chris Gunness of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, painfully reflected in the midst of the Israeli assault. Gaza is a conflict with a fence around it. It is unique in the annals of contemporary warfare. There's nowhere safe to run, and now there's nowhere safe to hide. The report further observed that, on the one hand, the effective rules of engagement treated civilians who stayed put as enemy combatants, even though the IDF, should have been well aware that civilians had remained behind, and that, on the other hand, the prior alerts, could be construed as an attempt to use warnings to justify attacks against individual civilians, who didn't flee. 3. Use of artillery and other explosive weapons in built-up areas. The report found that Israel made Significant use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in densely populated areas, which resulted in a large number of civilian casualties and widespread destruction of civilian objects. It further noted that Israel persisted in its use of such indiscriminate weapons in densely populated civilian areas, even after they resulted in significant civilian casualties. 4 destruction. The report found that the firepower used in Shujaia, Rafa, and Kuzae resulted in significant destruction. Some areas were virtually erased, completely obliterated. It also quoted Israeli soldiers testifying that every house we passed on our way, into the Gaza Strip, got hit by a shell, and houses farther away too. It was methodical, and, the damage to Palestinian property was not a consideration when determining the scope and force of fire. The report went on to say that, the vast scale of destruction may have been adopted as tactics of war, that, the IDF followed a pre-calculated pattern of widespread raising of neighborhoods in certain areas, and that this, raising of entire areas, may not have been strictly required by military necessity. 5. Targeting of Civilians In a brief treatment, just one paragraph, the report noted a number of cases in which civilians, who were clearly not participating in the hostilities, appear to have been attacked in the street. It pointed to a couple of incidents in which civilians, including children, allegedly carrying white flags were fired upon by soldiers, and a third incident, in which a wounded man, lying on the ground was shot again two times and killed. The report found that Israel deliberately killed just two civilians during the whole of the ground operation. In essence, the picture presented by the UN report looked something like this. Israel launched Protective Edge in order to achieve a pair of unimpeachable military objectives, end Hamas's projectile attacks, dismantle Hamas's tunnel network, in the course of the assault, it resorted to indiscriminate and disproportionate force primarily because it attached a higher priority to the lives of its own combatants than to Gaza's civilian population. Still, on the one hand, Israel did issue warnings that although not always effective, saved the lives of many people. The report didn't provide a basis for this calculation, and, on the other hand, Although many civilians were injured and killed, Israel intentionally targeted only a handful of them. Put simply, Protective Edge was a legitimate military operation that, alas, 
often went awry but only exceptionally crossed the red line of targeting Gaza's civilian infrastructure, and next to never crossed the red line of targeting its civilian population. The report's overarching conceit could not, however, accommodate many of its findings and conclusions. If the warnings were designed to save lives, why were so few issued, why was so little advance notice given when they were issued, and why were so many of them, such as the roof knock, ineffective by the report's own account? If the areas toward which Israel directed the civilian population were likely to be hit by airstrikes, then those fleeing after an alert found safe haven more as a result of serendipity than anything else. In fact, Israel almost certainly issued these warnings in order to embroider its Hasbara campaign and to provide itself with legal cover, in the event of post-war prosecutions, or in the report's own words, to justify attacks against individual civilians, who didn't flee after the alerts. They also served to foment panic and mass displacement, which the report depicted as collateral effects, but which, to judge by prior Israeli operations, were a premeditated objective. The denouement of protective edge provided the most compelling proof that, overwhelmingly, Israeli warnings were contrived, not to save lives but with these other goals in mind. Although it had been forced to terminate the ground invasion in early August after international outrage peaked, Israel still sought to gain leverage in the ongoing negotiations by launching airstrikes in late August on four high-rise buildings, occupied by Gaza's social elite. However, fearful of evoking renewed condemnation, Israel was at pains not to kill civilians, particularly influential civilians, so it issued effective warnings that enabled all the building's residents to evacuate safely. The fact that no Gazans died in these airstrikes pointed out that if Israel were so inclined, it could have issued truly effective warnings. The report praised these late August warnings as a good practice, through which Israel attempted to minimize civilian casualties. Wasn't it a tad unseemly to congratulate Israel on its good practice to minimize civilian casualties? last scene of the last act of a terror assault on a defenseless civilian population that had already left, more than a thousand civilians dead and tens of thousands homeless, Israel proceeded to level yet more homes, in particular as this good practice was proof positive that except when it was politically advantageous, Israel issued warnings only to grease its PR machine and so panic, not to save lives while Israel's primordial objective, made manifest by its use of one-ton bombs in densely populated civilian neighborhoods, was, so far as diplomatic constraints would allow it, to maximize civilian casualties? If as the report inferred, the principal impetus behind Israel's resort to indiscriminate and disproportionate force was to protect its combatants. That might explain why it adopted a criminal shoot-to-kill-anything-that-moves policy in areas where ground troops were operating. But why did Israel indiscriminately fire from afar tens of thousands of indiscriminate high-explosive artillery shells into densely populated civilian neighborhoods, which resulted in a large number of civilian casualties and widespread destruction of civilian objects? And why did it persist in its use of such indiscriminate, high-explosive weapons in densely populated civilian areas even after it was clear that they resulted in significant civilian casualties? Why did it drop hundreds of one-ton bombs over densely populated civilian neighborhoods? Why did it raise to the ground and obliterate entire civilian neighborhoods, in the total absence? as IDF eyewitness accounts repeatedly attested, of military activity? The report did acknowledge that Israel perhaps inflicted this pre-calculated devastation as e-tactics of war, that weren't strictly required by military necessity. It was, to be sure, an odd way to describe a destruction process in which, overwhelmingly, 
neither military necessity nor, for that matter, military considerations of any kind figured as even a factor. The report didn't pose, let alone answer, the question begging to be asked, if not from military necessity, then why did Israel, in a pre-calculated fashion, adopt a tactics of war, that wreaked massive death and destruction in Gaza? In fact, if safeguarding the lives of Israeli combatants at any cost was the modus operandi of protective edge, then punishing and terrorizing the civilian population into submission was its overarching objective. The report itself copiously documented that Israel fired tens of thousands of high-explosive artillery shells into, and dropped hundreds of one-ton bombs over, densely populated civilian neighborhoods, targeted hospitals, ambulances, rescue teams, civilian vehicles, and groups of citizens, and pursued a shoot-to-kill-anything-that-moves policy in pacified areas that still contain civilians. But nonetheless, it was the finding of this cynical, craven document that of the 1,600 Gazan civilians killed by Israel during the 51-day terror onslaught, only two were killed deliberately. The UN report included a miscellany section that analyzed Israeli attacks on, 1, civilian shelters, 2, Gaza's only power plant, and, 3, ambulances. 1, civilian shelters. The UN report noted that Israel attacked multiple civilian shelters, and it investigated the attacks on three of them, Beit Hanown Coeducational A and D School, Beit Hanown School, Jabalia Elementary Girls A and B School, Jabalia School, and Rafa Preparatory Boys A School, Rafa School, that resulted in the deaths of some 45 persons, including 14 children, Beit Hanown School. The report stated that UNRWA was in regular contact with Israeli officials, had given them the school's coordinates on 12 occasions and had informed them that the school was being used as a designated emergency shelter. It further stated that Beit Hanown was witness at the time of the incident to heavy fighting, including daily shelling in the vicinity of the school. As the fighting intensified, the shelter's occupants were persuaded to leave, and a time slot for their evacuation was synchronized between the IDF and UNRWA. An IDF commander subsequently conveyed his intention to target other schools in the area, allegedly because a Hamas arsenal was hidden among them, but he had reconfirmed at least twice that the designated emergency shelter would not be targeted. However, as families gathered their belongings and assembled in the school courtyard on July 24 to await bus transportation, the building was suddenly attacked by at least two 120 mm high explosive, he, mortar projectiles, one hitting the middle of the schoolyard and a second the steps in front of the school's entrance. Israel variously alleged that Hamas prevented the shelter's occupants from leaving at the assigned time, that the attacks had been caused by Hamas rockets misfiring, and that Soldiers returned fire at locations from which Palestinian missiles had been fired at them. The report found no evidence supporting these official Israeli alibis. On the contrary, it noted that witnesses consistently affirmed that there had been no rocket fire from the school, nor militants operating in its vicinity, nor any suspicious activity. The report concluded. The fact that the attack occurred before implementation of an evacuation agreement indicates that the advance warning, communicated to UNRWA by the IDF was not effective. 2. Jabalia School The report stated that, p. reared to July 30, Israeli agencies were notified 28 times in 14 days about the site's use as an UNRWA shelter and that Israel had confirmed receipt of this information. In addition, UNRWA was in steady contact with the relevant Israeli agencies by email and telephone. But on July 30, without advance warning, 
The school was hit by a barrage of four 155 mm high explosive, he, projectiles, and artillery indirect fire weapon. Eighteen people were killed, including three children. The IDF alleged that Hamas had fired at Israeli armed forces from the vicinity of the school. The report, however, found no evidence corroborating the Israeli allegation. 3. Rafa School The report stated that on August 3, a precision-guided missile hit the street in front of the school, killing 15 people, including at least seven children. Israel alleged that the IDF had fired an aerial-launched missile at a motorcycle, which had been carrying three militants from Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The report didn't adduce evidence either supporting or belying the official Israeli version of what happened. A subsequent investigation by the al mezin Center for Human Rights found that two, not three, Gazans were riding the motorcycle, and both were civilians. The UN report's legal analysis of the first two incidents, Beit Hanoun and Jabalia, stated that Israel must have been aware that by deploying relatively indiscriminate weapons, such as artillery or mortars, to strike a target located in a densely populated area and adjacent to UNRWA schools used as a shelter, it might also hit civilian objects. It went on to express serious concerns that Israel's choice of means for the attack did not take into account the requirement to avoid incidental loss of civilian life, did not take all feasible precautions to choose means with a view to avoiding casualties. Hence, these assaults are highly likely to constitute an indiscriminate attack, and may amount to a war crime. The explicit premise underlying the report's legal analysis was that Israel targeted military objects in these attacks. But the report didn't adduce a jot of evidence to sustain this premise. On the contrary, the mass of evidence assembled by it dictated the conclusion that Israel intentionally targeted civilians taking shelter. The report's own factual summary, in the Beit Hanoun incident, pinpointed that the attack occurred, not during an exchange of fire but before implementation of an evacuation agreement. How else is one to interpret this contextualization except that the assault was timed with, or geared to, the scheduled evacuation, and that the object of the attack was the shelter grounds? The undisputed facts that an agreement had been reached with the IDF for a peaceful, orderly exodus, and that the IDF commander twice expressly promised not to target this particular shelter, compounded the crime as an appalling act of perfidy. The report's contention that these incidents constituted indiscriminate attacks flew in the face of its own factual findings, while its depiction of the ensuing civilian deaths as incidental begs the question, incidental to what? The report didn't point to a military objective in either incident while, as it itself documented. Israel's official story kept shifting as each of its successive alibis kept unraveling. The report reckoned it a critical finding of fact that Israel's advance warning was not effective, even though the warning proved to be a most effective instrument of criminal perfidy, while the report reckoned it a critical finding of law that Israel did not take all feasible precautions to protect civilians, even though it did take all feasible precautions to set them up for a bloodbath. It was as if the report were playing a Victorian parlor game. Who can contrive the most absurd factual or legal description of a manifestly criminal act? In another contrived iteration, the report stated that whereas Israel relied on its civilian agencies to facilitate communication between international organizations and the Israeli military, and there seem to have been attempts to notify UNRWA about possible attacks in the case of Beit Hanoun. The incident suggests that communication between UNRWA and the IDF was not effective. 
but the report itself documented that even though the IDF coordinated the evacuation with UNRWA, and even though the IDF commander made repeated, explicit promises not to target the shelter, the IDF launched an attack on the shelter grounds just before the agreed-upon a time slot a while. Families started gathering their belongings in the courtyard so as to be ready when the buses arrived. The upshot was not a communications breakdown but criminal bad faith. Indeed, not even Israel in its various official justifications blamed the attack on a lapse in communications. The report created this alibi out of whole cloth. The report's legal analysis additionally observed, even though the attack against the UNRWA schools may not have been deliberate, the IDF is bound by the obligation of precautionary measures and verification of targets, to avoid attacks directed by negligence at civilians or civilian objects. The choice of phraseology, even though the attack, may not have been deliberate, was twice over peculiar. On the one hand, the report's legal findings never even hinted that the attacks were deliberate, to the contrary. It studiously avoided this conclusion, while, on the other hand, the factual evidence assembled in the report left little doubt that they in fact were deliberate. The report also considered it a relevant legal point that Israel didn't take sufficient precautions to avoid attacks directed by negligence at civilians or civilian objects, whereas it was hard not to conclude from the report's own rehearsal of the factual record that Israel, far from being negligent, took every precaution and acted with full premeditation to target civilians and civilian objects. Even ever-cautious UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon finally blurted out after the Israeli attack on Rafa school, the seventh civilian shelter to be targeted, that it was a moral outrage and criminal act. Gaza's only power plant The UN report noted that Israel's repeated shelling of the only power plant in Gaza at the end of July caused severe damage. The last shelling on July 29 caused one of the plant's fuel tanks to explode, which, eventually destroyed almost an entire section of the plant and damaged other parts. It also noted that, a, s a result of that attack, and of damage to the electricity infrastructure more generally. Gaza experienced power outages of 22 hours a day during the hostilities, which, forced hospitals to operate at limited capacity, led to a drastic reduction in the pumping of water to households, and affected desalination plants and sewage treatment. A year later, Israel purported that its shells had, unfortunately missed their intended target. Although the report pleaded agnosticism, the commission is unable to verify this account. It also observed that Israel had already hit the power plant back in 2006 as well as during Operation Cast Lead, that at the inception of Protective Edge, a senior Israeli official had called on the government, immediately to cut off fuel and electricity supplies to the Gaza Strip, and also exhorted the government to use all of the levers of pressure at its disposal in order to coerce Hamas to accept a ceasefire and that the plant had been hit three times in the days just prior to the climactic July 29th strike. The report's legal analysis reiterated that, oh, wing to the limited evidence available, it is unable to determine whether the power plant suffered incidental damage from an attack directed elsewhere, or whether it was the object of a deliberate attack. Still, it went on to speculate, if the strike against the power plant was accidental, as Israel claims, there remain nonetheless questions as to whether all appropriate precautions were taken by the IDF to avoid damage to a civilian object. Noticeably, it didn't ponder the possibility that the attack was deliberate, and the attendant legal consequences if it was. But the larger point is this. The report's avowed legal mandate was not to reach a definitive determination but instead to use a less stringent, reasonable ground, standard in its assessment of incidents investigated and patterns found to have occurred, 
that is, what a reasonable and ordinarily prudent person would have reason to believe happened. It appears a safe bet that a reasonable and ordinarily prudent person would have concluded something along these lines. In light of the pattern of targeted Israeli attacks on the power plant in previous years and multiple shellings of the plant in the days preceding the July 29 attack, and in light of the minatory statements by a senior Israeli official before the attack, and in light of the fact that the only counter-evidence consisted of boilerplate Israeli denial that has rarely withstood scrutiny in the past, in light of this compelling and cumulative circumstantial evidence, the attack on Gaza's only power plant, which exacerbated its already dire shortage of electricity, was most likely deliberate and amounted to a war crime. If the report didn't reach this conclusion, that's because it construed the better part of prudence to be pusillanimity. Ambulances The UN report noted that protective edge resulted in damage to 16 ambulances, and the death of 23 health personnel. It focused on a trio of incidents that it had already dissected, in Shujaia, Shujaia Market, and Rafa, and on a pair of cognate incidents in Al Karara village and Beit Hanoun, in which ambulances came under Israeli attack and 35 medical personnel and other civilians were killed and many more injured. It presented a condensed version of the first three incidents and a more detailed account of the two others. Shujaia, a military medical aid ambulance was directly hit twice while attempting to provide first aid to victims. Shujaia Market, in a context of intense fire, a shell struck the ground close to three ambulances in the proximity of a house that had been attacked. Rafa, eight people burned to death in an ambulance that was hit. Al Karara, Mohammed Hassan Al Abadla, an ambulance driver, came under fire while evacuating an injured person. When Al Abadla's ambulance arrived at the location, the IDF instructed the crew to exit the vehicle and continue on foot. Mohammed Hassan Al Abadla and one of two volunteers got out of the ambulance and approached the patient with a flashlight on, as directed. They had walked about 12 meters when they came under fire and Mohammed Hassan al Abadla was hit in the chest and thigh. Two ambulance teams that arrived a little later to rescue their wounded colleague also came under fire, despite earlier ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, information that the IDF had approved their entry to the area. A third team was finally allowed to take Al Abadla to Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus, where he died shortly upon arrival. The ambulance's movements were at all times coordinated with the IDF through the ICRC. Bait Hanoun, a missile appears to have hit the back of a PRCS, Palestine Red Crescent Society, ambulance during a rescue operation in Bait Hanoun. As a result, an ambulance volunteer was killed and two other rescuers inside the ambulance were injured. When another ambulance team was dispatched to respond, a missile hit the rear part of this vehicle, which caught fire. The ambulance had its siren and flashing red light on and, at the time of the strike, the street was deserted. The report did not discover in any of the five incidents any information or receive any allegations indicating that the ambulances involved were used for a purpose other than their humanitarian function. It went on to observe that, reports of repeated strikes on ambulances that came to the rescue of injured staff suggest that the ambulances and personnel may have been specifically targeted, that, many, if not most, of the reported strikes on ambulances appear to have occurred without there having been any obvious threat or military activity in the area, and that ambulances were marked with emblems, health workers wore uniforms, and the IDF had been notified repeatedly of their movements. The report's legal analysis found that some of the incidents constitute a violation by the IDF of the prohibition of attacks on medical transports and medical personnel, and may amount to war crimes, 
In particular, if the vehicles or personnel attacked used the distinctive emblems of the Geneva Conventions. Although they appear reasonable, at any rate by the dismally low standards set by the report, one can still quarrel at points with this factual presentation and legal finding. It stated that ambulances in Shujaia market came under attack, in a context of intense fire. But if none of the witnesses reported return fire by Palestinians, shouldn't it have said, in a context of intense fire by Israel? It stated that, some of the incidents violated the laws of war. Which of the five shocking incidents, it might be wondered, didn't? If the report unequivocally found that Hamas's executions of alleged collaborators amount to a war crime, it might also be wondered why, even though the report compiled a mass as well as a pattern of damning evidence, it could find only that Israel's repeated targeting of clearly marked ambulances in the absence of any military justification may amount to a war crime. If the report could exhort that, whoever is responsible, for the executions of alleged collaborators in Gaza, must be brought to justice, it might also be wondered why it wasn't equally emphatic that whoever was responsible for the targeting of medical personnel, and rescue crews must be brought to justice. The report's legal finding stated that Israel may have committed a war crime because it violated the prohibition against attacks on medical transports and personnel. But wouldn't it also be a war crime if they weren't medics but simply civilians? This prompts the most perplexing and serious question of all. The report found convincing evidence that Israel specifically targeted these medical personnel slash civilians absent any military rationale and in the full knowledge of their non-combatant status. It tallied 35 deaths as a result of the five ambulance attacks it investigated. But why then did the report calculate under its rubric targeting of civilians that Israel had committed only two targeted killings of civilians during protective edge? Indeed, Israel's targeting of ambulances, medical personnel, and rescue crews absent a discernible military objective itself did not deviate from but merely shone a brighter light on, the actual strategic goal of protective edge, to punish, humiliate, and terrorize Gaza's civilian population, part and parcel of which was the infliction of massive civilian casualties. Finally, a glaring omission in the UN report's inventory of Israeli war crimes warrants notice. Israel destroyed 70 mosques and damaged 130 more during Protective Edge. It is a war crime under international law to target places of worship which constitute the cultural or spiritual heritage of people. The report made precisely four passing allusions to attacks on Gaza's mosques, of which three repeat Israeli Hasbara that Hamas hid weapons inside or fired from them and one is a sentence fragment that a mosque had been hit. The report devoted many paragraphs to the psychic distress Israelis suffered during Protective Edge, but it had not a single word to say about the psychic impact in a deeply religious society of Israel's assault on Gaza's mosques. If Hamas had destroyed scores of Israeli synagogues, is it conceivable that the report would have ignored it? The issue isn't whether or not Israel deliberately targeted Gaza's mosques without military justification, although the available evidence overwhelmingly suggests that it did. The telling point is this, the report didn't deem the mass destruction of mosques worthy of attention, let alone investigation. The UN report's penultimate chapter analyzed steps taken by each party to hold accountable violators of the laws of war, during protective edge. The section on Palestine, consisting of nine paragraphs, essentially pleaded that little information was available, and then concluded that Palestinian authorities have consistently failed to ensure that perpetrators of violations of the laws of war are brought to justice. The heart of this chapter, running to fully 45 paragraphs, 
parsed Israel's judicial response. The sheer amount of space devoted by the report to this undertaking conveyed the impression that Israel's system of legal accountability was a worthy object of investigation. The facts, however, reveal that this system is a farce. The UN report observed that Israel has in the past failed to hold accountable those responsible for alleged grave violations of the laws of war. For example, during cast lead, 1,400 Gazans were killed, up to 1,200 of them civilians, while much of Gaza's civilian infrastructure was laid waste. But only four Israelis were convicted of wrongdoing, and only three of them were sentenced to jail. The maximum sentence was seven and a half months for the theft of a Palestinian's credit card. The report further noted that Israel hadn't launched a single criminal investigation regarding Operation Pillar of Defense, 2012. It concluded that the track record of Israel's judicial system raises serious questions regarding the effectiveness of the current mechanisms to hold accountable those responsible for the most serious alleged crimes. It then went on to observe that, the picture is equally bleak when reviewing other data, whether they pertain to the many killings of Palestinians in the West Bank, only, two indictments and one conviction, or the many allegations of torture and ill-treatment of Palestinians, not a single criminal investigation was opened. Still, the report espied a silver lining in the cloud. It purported that Israel has in recent years significantly upgraded its system of legal accountability. In 2010, Israeli commandos launched an assault on the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, killing nine passengers aboard the flagship Mavai Marmara. The international outrage after these deaths compelled Israel to appoint an investigative commission, chaired by former Supreme Court Justice Jacob Turkel. The findings of the Turkle Commission comprised two volumes, published separately. The first volume, 2011, which pretended to examine the circumstances surrounding the commando raid on the flotilla, although replete with scholarly footnotes and erudite references, proved on close inspection to be a whitewash. The second volume, 2013, was mandated to assess whether Israel's mechanism for prosecuting violators of the laws of war met international standards. Unsurprisingly, the Turkle Commission found that the Israeli mechanism generally passed muster, but it also recommended several improvements. The UN report heaped praise on the Turkle Commission's recommendations, as they lent momentum to the noteworthy forward slash is significant forward slash welcome reforms that Israel subsequently instituted. The UN report also delineated the remaining procedural, structural, and substantive flaws already adumbrated by the Turkle Commission and kept repeating, mantra style, that if Israel remedied them, its judicial system would come close to ensuring full legal accountability. A typical passage melding the bleak past with the roseate future went like this. The UN report is concerned that impunity prevails across the board for violations of international humanitarian and human rights law, allegedly committed by Israeli forces, whether it be in the context of active hostilities in Gaza or killings, torture, and ill treatment in the West Bank. Israel must break with its recent lamentable track record in holding wrongdoers accountable. Those responsible for suspected violations of international law at all levels of the political and military establishments must be brought to justice. An important factor in enabling such a process will be the implementation of the Turkle Commission's recommendations. The UN report's analysis zeroed in on Israel's legal mechanism as the critical locus in need of repair. Just a mite more tweaking, it anticipated, and everything would be hunky-dory. But the rational basis of its Pollyanna-ish optimism perplexes. Consider this chronology. 
The report highlighted that Israel had already implemented several of the Turkle Commission's proposed reforms before Protective Edge, and it praised these as noteworthy a forward slash a significant a forward slash welcome initiatives. But it also noted that after Protective Edge, and notwithstanding these touted reforms, Selim, Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, and Yesh Din, the premier guardians of Palestinian human rights in Israel, refused to cooperate with official Israeli inquiries into the operation. The existing investigation mechanism, they jointly declared, precluded serious investigations and is marred by severe structural flaws that render it incapable of conducting professional investigations. It would appear that these Israel-based human rights organizations were rather less sanguine than the report about the alleged Israeli reforms. Furthermore, if these indeed constituted noteworthy forward slash a significant a forward slash welcome improvements, how did it come to pass that the material results of Israeli investigations into protective edge? read like a carbon copy of Operation Cast Lead. As of 2015, the report noted, Israel had issued three indictments. Two soldiers were accused of looting NIS 2420, over 600 US dollars, from a Palestinian home in Shujaia, Gaza City. A third soldier was accused of assisting them. Unless the report was of the opinion that an indictment for stealing cash instead of stealing a credit card registered a civilizational leap, a wide chasm separated the report's brimming enthusiasms from these measurable outcomes. A year after the publication of the UN report, Selim issued a report of its own, the Occupation's Fig Leaf, Israel's military law enforcement system as a whitewash mechanism. It announced that henceforth it would cease cooperating with Israel's military law enforcement system. Inter alia, it commented on the Turkel Commission, which so impressed the UN report, the Commission, recommended a number of improvements to the military law enforcement system. The implementation of these recommendations, which has already begun, may improve appearances of the current system but it will not remedy the substantive flaws. The Bselem report concluded. T. He semblance of a functioning justice system allows Israeli officials to deny claims made both in Israel and abroad that Israel does not enforce the law on soldiers who harm Palestinians. THSA appearances also help grant legitimacy to the continuation of the occupation. It makes it easier to reject criticism about the injustices of the occupation, thanks to the military's outward pretense that even it considers some acts unacceptable, and backs up the claim by saying that it is already investigating these actions. Selim's cooperation with the military investigation and enforcement system has not achieved justice, instead lending legitimacy to the occupation regime and aiding to whitewash it. T. Here is no longer any point in pursuing justice and defending human rights by working with a system whose real function is measured by its ability to continue to successfully cover up unlawful acts and protect perpetrators. The purpose of Israeli pseudo-investigations undertaken after Protective Edge, Selim further observed in a complementary publication, Whitewash Protocol. The so-called investigation of Operation Protective Edge was e to prevent the International Criminal Court ICC, in The Hague from addressing the issue itself. If only the UN report had summoned up such courage, candor, and principle, instead, it lent its good offices to the whitewash as it waxed the occupation's fig leaf. The UN report's assessment of Israel's accountability mechanism included a case study of four Palestinian children, killed by Israeli missiles. The children were playing hide-and-seek around a small, dilapidated fisherman's hut, which was in plain sight of nearby hotels housing international journalists, 
none of whom described seeing militants in the area at the time of the attack, British Guardian. The report noted that, the boys were aged between 9 and 11 years, and were therefore small in stature in comparison to the size of an average adult, while Amnesty noted that, video footage quickly emerged in which individuals targeted were clearly visible as children. But the official Israeli investigation concluded that the children had been mistaken for militants, and that, the attack process, accorded with Israeli domestic law and international law requirements. If the report's legal assessment differed from Israel's, it was only on the narrowest of grounds. It found strong indications that the IDF failed in its obligations to take all feasible measures to avoid or at least minimize incidental harm to civilians. It is unclear why the report ruled out the possibility that the Israeli missile strikes intentionally targeted the children. It's not as if the IDF had never before targeted Palestinian children or, for that matter, tortured them and used them as human shields, or that Israeli settlers, many of whom at some point passed through the IDF, hadn't committed the most heinous atrocities against Palestinian children, such as burning them to death. The report just barely, and only indirectly, paused to reflect on the plausibility of the claim that the IDF confused four children, small in stature in comparison to the size of an average adult, with Hamas militants. Thus, in keeping with its all feasible precautions line of analysis, the report criticized the IDF as it could have more exhaustively verified whether those being targeted were taking a direct part in the hostilities. What e hostilities? The report itself stated, there were no IDF soldiers in the area, as the ground operations had not commenced, nor were there any other persons in imminent danger. Wasn't the report's tacit premise, that the IDF believed the children were, taking a direct part in the hostilities? a leap of bad faith, unargued, unsubstantiated, and, in light of a gory Israeli track record of killing and torturing Palestinian children, wholly unwarranted. The report continued, T. He compound was located in the center of a city of almost 550,000 residents, between a public beach and an area regularly used by fishermen. It could therefore not be ruled out that civilians, including children, might be present. These factual elements suggest that by assuming that the individuals were members of armed groups, merely on the basis of their presence in a particular location, the IDF reversed the presumption of civilian status. This passage puzzles on several counts. First, the report took for granted that the target of the Israeli missile strike was a Hamas compound even though journalist eyewitnesses attested that it was a beaten shack. Second, it itself acknowledged that the targeted area was a densely populated civilian locale. Third, it was most improbable that children, small of stature, would be confused with Hamas militants. Why then did the report infer that the IDF had been assuming that the individuals were members of armed groups? On the basis of the circumstantial evidence, which the report itself assembled, it would seem much more probable that the IDF deliberately targeted innocent children, indeed, except for pro forma Israeli denials, no basis existed for inferring otherwise. By starting from the assumption that the children were militants, not civilians, instead of the reverse, the report concluded. Israel appears to have validated an incorrect application of international humanitarian law. The irony, entirely lost on this wretched document, was that by starting from the highly dubious premise that the IDF had been assuming the dilapidated shack was a Hamas compound and the diminutive children were an armed group. The report itself validated an incorrect application of international humanitarian law. The applicable legal principle was not all feasible precautions but, plainly, the deliberate targeting of civilians. 
The UN report's analysis of Israeli legal accountability was embedded in, and went awry because of, a chain of false, if anodyne and convenient premises, to wit, Israel has periodically launched military operations in Gaza with legitimate, conventional military objectives and targets. In the course of these operations, the IDF has, alas, committed excesses, which army hasn't, sometimes spilling over into war crimes. If Israel has been remiss in prosecuting these breaches of the laws of war, it's on account of a still flawed legal administrative mechanism. But fortunately, it requires just a little tinkering. If Israel would only implement a couple more Turkle Commission recommendations to eliminate the glitches and enable the wheels of justice to turn smoothly. The picture looks radically different, however, if Protective Edge is viewed through the optic of the Goldstone Report, issued by the UN Human Rights Council after cast lead. The Goldstone Report found that the death and destruction Israel visited on Gaza's civilian population were not incidental or the result of a failure to take all feasible precautions but, on the contrary, calculated and deliberate, designed to punish, humiliate and terrorize a civilian population. The military doctrine driving protective edge was carried over from cast lead, it was a repeat performance, but writ larger. The factual evidence collected in the UN report left little space for doubt that Israel was deliberately targeting Gaza's civilian population and infrastructure during Protective Edge. If the report's legal analysis concluded otherwise, it was due not to a deficit of material evidence but to a deficit of moral integrity. The report deployed the idiom of law, not to shed light on the criminal nature of Israel's undertaking but to sanitize it. True, the report at multiple junctures raises concerns that Israel may have committed war crimes. But it willfully, repeatedly, and unforgivably ignored dispositive evidence that these Israeli crimes, far from being collateral to or springing from tactical excesses in the pursuit of a bona fide military objective, were integral to and inherent in a criminal strategy targeting Gaza's civilian population. Whether it traced back to careerism, cowardice, or cynicism, the bottom line was that the report transparently and shamelessly fled from the damning conclusions that flowed, inexorably, from its own factual findings. Did it not border on the absurd, indeed, was it not squarely in absurdist terrain? when the report indicted Israel for not taking all feasible precautions to avoid incidental harm to civilians after Israeli missiles targeted and killed four children playing hide-and-seek in an open civilian area, absent any military activity, in broad daylight, in the presence of numerous credible eyewitnesses who contradicted Israel's pro forma denials on each and every point? In two places, the report pondered whether Israel's massive and destructive force was approved at least tacitly by decision-makers at the highest levels of the government, and gingerly touched on the role of senior officials who set military policy, individual soldiers may have been following agreed military policy. It also posed the tantalizing question, why did the political and military leadership not revise their policies or change their course of action, despite considerable information regarding massive death and destruction in Gaza? It further noted that the relevant Israeli bodies had not initiated judicial proceedings against the military and civilian leadership. But still, the report chased after the will-o'-the-wisp that if the Turkle Commission recommendations were fully implemented, Israel's judicial system would hold to account individuals who may have played a role in wrongdoing, regardless of their position in the hierarchy. In reality, if senior Israeli officials willfully persisted in a course of action causing murder and mayhem in Gaza, and if none of them was subsequently indicted, let alone convicted, it was no mystery at all as to why the operation unfolded according to plan 
and the plan enjoyed near universal support. If the report's authors didn't see this, that's because they didn't want to see it, and didn't want anyone who read their findings and conclusions to see it. The report was a monument to sophistry, obfuscation, and deflection. It conjured up the absurd panacea of comprehensive and effective accountability mechanisms, when in fact nearly the whole of Jewish, Israeli society, from top to bottom and across the board, was united in the dual conviction, on full display in the breaking the silence testimonies, that Arab life was worthless and Jewish life worth its weight in gold. That, too, the report pretended not to see, and didn't want others to see. For were this sordid reality to be acknowledged, its fateful implication would have to be confronted, that the obstacle to achieving justice was not localized but systemic. Israel will not reform itself because it cannot reform itself. It is contaminated at every level, not least the judiciary, by a virulent brew of racism and arrogance freely circulating in a body politic whose immune system has collapsed. By fostering the illusion that if Israel incorporated a handful of internal administrative reforms it would heal itself, the report conveyed and validated the utterly counterfeit image that Israel was essentially a healthy society. But a state that every couple of years launches, with overwhelming popular support and without a hint of remorse, yet another high-tech blitzkrieg against a defenseless, trapped civilian population is profoundly sick. If another protective edge is to be avoided and the people of Gaza are to be spared another massacre, it requires pressure to be exerted from without, not meaningless, irrelevant tinkering from within. The betrayal of Gaza by human rights organizations, chronicled in these pages, constitutes a harsh truth. Still, it must be brought to light. The beginning of wisdom, Confucius said, is to call things by their proper name.